Hey guys, welcome back to the channel. This is a story about what if Naruto joins fairy tale Konoha bashing. Before I start, please support for more amazing content and do consider subscribing to my channel and share this video with your friends. This is written the rage of fire and link in the description and support rider. Let's start the video. Naruto chuckled weakly as he laid next to the unconscious form of Sasuke. He did it. He really did it. He was able to keep his promise to Sakura. Slowly, he arose and limped over to his best friend, leaning down next to him, gasping in pain as he clutched the hole in his chest. Hit, be gentle. Naruto jumped, frantically looking around for the voice dripping with demonic essence. Wow. You really are dim, aren't you kid? I've only been in you for, what, your whole fucking life. Naruto's eyes widened. Kayubi. Correct, kid. When you used me to help bombard sense into that traitor of a false bloodline, the seal weakened somewhat. We can now speak. False bloodline? Really? That's what you ask now? Hurry, bring the Achiha back to Kanoha. He needs medical attention. I'm healing you as fast as I can. Why are you helping me, Kaiubi? Don't you hate me? For the love of Kami, are you really that stupid? That's a question I should ask you. I've made your life a living hell. Now, if it was anyone else I couldn't care less about those weak fleshwalkers and their horrid ways and short lives, but you've grown on me, kid. First human to ever do so. Naruto smiled. I don't hate you, Kaiubi. Without you, Sasuke wouldn't be able to return home now. Thank you, Furball. Ayubi felt the side of his fox lips twitch in slight amusement and annoyance. He shook his head and sent the boy a playful glare. Whatever, Kit, whatever. Naruto chuckled again as he slowly lifted Sasuke onto his back. Naruto groaned in pain and started limping towards the forest. He had a goal and a promise to finish, he couldn't sit around and talk to the Furball all day. Bakashi clutched his hands into fists in the shadows, eyes glaring at his student. The demon really did it. He beat Sasuke even with the curse mark. Only a true demon could do so, he was right all along. Why Jiraiya went and trained the demon instead of the Achiha was beyond him. Bakashi then noticed Naruto struggling, and his eyes wandered to the gaping hole in his gut. He smiled behind his mask as he started making hand signs. Naruto, being exhausted both physically and mentally, didn't hear the buzzing sound until it went straight through his stomach for him to see a Jidori. He dropped Sasuke and coughed out blood. Hit. Naruto fell onto his back when the hand removed itself and struggled to see who his attacker was. His heart nearly stopped himself when he saw Kakashi-sensei holding Sasuke over his shoulder gently. Hey Kakashi-sensei. Naruto's heart sank when he saw Kakashi's scorn. No. No. Kakashi couldn't be like them, he can't. He always smiled at him, treated him to Raymond, spoke kind words. I am not your sensei, demon. Be but. Silence. If you're wondering, I never liked you. Acting is supposed to be a shinobi's finest point, yes. Now, I leave you to die, tell the village and Sasuke that he killed you, unlocking the ultimate form of the Sharingan. Naruto felt tears fall down his eyes, slowly shaking his head. This couldn't be true, it can't. This had to be a dream. Yes. He passed out while fighting Sasuke. This isn't real. Damn human. Just wait. When I'm out, I'll rip you to shreds. The Kashi smirked at Naruto's face of pure dread and terror. It made him feel good. And I'll be considered a hero, he continued. For killing the demon who killed my sensei. Any time now. Wake up. Wake up. Bakashi slowly walked towards Naruto and looked down at him. He raised his foot high behind him, aiming for his head. Come on. Wake up. Kit. I'm not going to wake up a Maikai Ubi. Naruto trailed off his in thoughts. Kit. Hold on. Bakashi brought his foot down, slamming it onto Naruto's head. Naruto screamed loudly before blacking out, blood flowing from his head now as well. Kakashi nodded at his work before turning around and heading towards the forest. Hey Kit. Kit. Wake up. Ami, Yami otherwise known as the Shinigami and Tozi watched with distant as the history unfolded itself. They couldn't believe it. What had Minato seen in these people of Konoha? Naruto's own sensei. I've had enough. Declared Yami. When she sealed Kaiubi inside baby Naruto, she herself had heard the man's request. It pained her how no one besides few actually listened. This is dreadful. That village shouldn't exist. Spoke Tozi, shaking her head. Ami growled and stood up from her throne. Sisters. Let us go. The other two nodded before they disappeared. They reappeared before the barely alive Naruto. Kami leaned down, slowly pulled him up, then kissed him. Shortly after, his wound started to heal enough for him to regain consciousness. When he saw what was happening, he screamed, jumped back, then howled in pain as he clutched his still open wound. The three most beautiful women he'd ever seen smiled at him, clearly amused at his antics. This caused him to blush, much to his displeasure. Kit. Kaiubi sighed in relief. I'm glad. W who are you? 
Then he blinked. Wait. I am alive. How? Because we made it so, young one. Spoke the most beautiful of them all, Kami. We are the three goddesses. Naruto did a double take. The three goddesses. Kami, Yami, and Tozi. Realizing who he stood before, Naruto embraced the pain, stood up, and bowed as low as he could go. What do I owe this honor? He felt a hand on his shoulder and looked up to see Tozi smiling down at him. There'll be no need for that. She spoke kindly. We've been watching you. Why you have? He asked, sitting down to ease the pain. Why? Because of Minato. Not to mention, you're one of the purest souls alive. And from what we've seen, we're absolutely disgusted at Kanoha. We wish for its downfall. Will you assist us, Naruto Uzumaki Namikas? And Namikas. Your father was Minato Namikas. Naruto felt lightheaded at this. What'll it be, hot stuff? Spoke Yami. We can help you in the downfall, but for a price. When you're strong enough, you'll be ours. Yes, in that way. We'll grant you immortality and we don't mind if you're with other women. Naruto blushed again before thinking. Kanoha did nothing but hurt him, call him a demon, and now betrayed him. They deserved long put back judgment. He made a decision. Only the pure and the kind shall be spared, and he already knew who they were. He looked up at the goddesses before bowing his head. I accept the price. Help me bring that dreaded hellhole to the ground. The three goddesses smiled in pride before Kami stepped forward. I shall give you the gift of life. You may heal any injury, even death. You're now immortal. When you turn 18, your aging process will stop permanently. She said kissing his forehead causing him to glow blue before stepping back. Yami stepped forward. I give you the gift of death. By touching someone, you may cause them to die however you wish. She said, kissing his cheek causing him to glow a blackish purple. Tozi was last. I give you the gift of nature. You may control it all, however you wish. It is at your disposal. And, with it, you will no longer need hand signs to perform jutsu. She kissed his other cheek and he glowed green. Suddenly, the three glows returned and he clutched his eyes in slight pain. When he removed his hands, they were black and swirling with purple, green, and blue floating around. His eyes were slits with four tomos like a full-fledged Sharingan circling it with rings like the Rinnegan. He blinked and he returned to normal. Wow. That was infinity. A special type of jutsu eye that had a combination of three eye techniques. Sharingan, Ayakigan, and the Rinnegan. Plus, it has some of its own features as well. You now know every single jutsu known to man and animal. Naruto stayed silent before bowing his head once more. You have been kind giving me so much. Oh, we're not done yet. Exclaimed the ever-enthusiastic Yami. We're bringing you to meet a friend of ours in a different dimension. While you're training with him for three years, Kami will take care of informing that dastardly village of your living, I'll destroy the Akatsuki and Madara, and Tozi will take care of that damn snake. Naruto's eyes watered. W.Y. He gasped out. And no one's ever de done something so nice for me be before. The three held him. It's because of your pure soul. Now, sleep. When you wake up, you'll be with the Dragon King. Naruto nodded, dozing off in the women's arms. Ahmed, the Dragon King, looked over his kingdom. His dragons have just hidden from their children like ordered. Good. Suddenly, his ears perked up. He turned around to see Kami, goddess of life before him holding a small child. Out of respect, which the Dragon King held for almost no one, he bowed. My ladyship, what do I owe this honor? The goddess held out the child in her arms, covered in dry blood. Bahamut raised an eyebrow while Kami laid him down. We, the three goddesses, would like you to train him as your son who you'll never abandon. What? The dragon asked in shock. You wish for me, the dragon king who's never trained anyone, to do so to a child and adopt him? Are you crazy, my ladyship? The woman shook her head. Look into his memories, Bahamut you won't find a finer man. This is but a child. Trust me, he's greater than a man. Ahmed sighed. He couldn't say no to this goddess. He brought his tail around and touched the boy's bloody forehead, and the two started to glow. He shut his eyes. He awoke in the chamber to low growling that might have sent shivers down more weaker dragons. He turned to see an iron-tailed fox as big as him. His eyes widened before he scowled. Ayubi. He spoke with venom. Ayubi just simply stared at him with pitless red eyes that showed sadness through the bars. Bahamut it's been long. What are you doing in my host's mindscape? Why are you locked behind a cage? If you're here to search his memories, you know. Just be careful to not go behind the taped-off door. I sealed those myself. Why? They're a hundred times worse than what you're about to see. This kid is strong, but if I didn't do what I did well, just brace yourself. Ahmed did and wandered throughout the memories of the child. He was disgusted. All the beatings, horrible words, and he could still smile even if it was mostly a mask. All that blood and memories it's a miracle he had emotions at all. He growled at one of the memories, horrified. 
He was even crucified when he was a child. Merely eight. This boy had earned something Behemoth never gave. Respect. He then saw something that made his blood boil as hot as Igneal's fire. Naruto's own sensei tried to murder him, just for a traitor. A traitor. Bahamut agreed with Kami. Kanoha must be damned. He pulled out from the boy, burning with anger. He turned to the goddess. I will adopt and train him. He shall be the greatest dragon slayer and ninja in three years. The dragon prince. The goddess smiled in relief. I have elsewhere that requires me. I thank you dragon king. She said with a slight bow of her head, surprising Behemoth, before disappearing. The Kashi walked into Kanoha, doing his best to look sad when he was actually ecstatic. He killed the demon. Too bad if he said anything Tsunade would murder him to a millennia. Once he stepped in, he was surrounded by ninja and civilians alike. Tsunade walked up to him and looked around frantically. Where's Naruto? It sickened him that the Hokage could feel so much for a demon. He took up acting, looking as sad as he could, and closed his eyes. Tsunade felt her heart break. She jumped forwards and grabbed Kakashi by the shirt. Kakashi had it. Where's Naruto? Sasuke and Naruto fought hard. In the end, the Rasengan and Chidori hit. Naruto didn't survive. Tsunade started shaking, her eyes in shock. Naruto's friends were as well. The citizens, on the other hand, started cheering and congratulating. Kakashi looked to the side to see Gara with a slightly shocked look on his face before the Redeed growled. Naruto wouldn't die from that. Kakashi narrowed his eyes. What are you talking about? I only speak honorably to powerful warriors. Naruto wouldn't die from that. Ara, don't you think the Achiha, who defeated you, would come out victorious? Asked a councilwoman. Ara growled, making the woman shrink. Who told you it was Sasuke? It wasn't him. He was easily defeated. Naruto was the one who beat me. Said Gara, remembering the hardest head, but he'd ever felt from the blonde. Ara, don't. You think I wouldn't know? I was there. The Achiha fainted after a few minuets without even putting a scratch on me. I'm sorry Gara. Naruto's dead. Gara felt the one tail shift uneasily. He didn't. What's the matter, Ichibi? Smell the bastard scent. Even I don't want the blood of such a man. Smell him. Gara's blood ran cold before he started growling, giving Kakashi a glare that almost made him faint. You said you saw Naruto die, correct? Kakashi nodded, causing Tsunade to wail and Hinata to instantly clutch her father, crying. That's strange, because I smell something that shouldn't be there if that's indeed the truth. Kakashi narrowed his eyes. What are you talking about? Tell me, why do you smell of Naruto's blood? He demanded, looking more feral than ever. Tamari gasped and Kankuro looked shocked. You didn't the puppet master spoke. Many of the clan heads released their killing intent towards the one-eyed Jounin. That wasn't what Kakashi was afraid of though, no, it was the look on Tsunade's face. It looked like she was about to go on a massacre. What? Did. You. Do. I. Stabbed the poor boy in the heart with a Chidori he did. The village turned to look at a gorgeous woman with her hands on her hips and a stern look. She was glaring at Kakashi which made him weak in the knees. It was even worse than an Achiha glare. Who are you? Demanded a villager. Who are you to demand my name? The civilian council. The woman scoffed. I am not under your council's authority. Tsunade, still shaking in rage and promising Kakashi pain, turned to the woman. I am Tsunade, fifth Hokage of Kanahagakur. You are. That's more like it. The woman spoke, flaunting her breasts that were larger than Tsunade which made the men drool. I am Kami, goddess of life and light. Asks radiated throughout Kanoha, and an overweight man walked up to her with lust-filled eyes. Are you here to congratulate us for finally killing the demon? Or, are you going to thank us? He asked with eyes that devoured her. How dare you? She snapped her fingers and the man lit up in fire. Calling a child a demon. He was merely the container. Honestly, I don't understand what Minato saw in you heathens. How dare you? Screeched Lily Haruno. I dare just fine, woman. I am a goddess. Kakashi Haddock. Said Cyclops stood at the ready as if he planned on being praised, but that hope was dashed when he saw the look on her face. For doing the unacceptable, you have fallen from my favor as well as Yami's and Tozi's. I hope you find yourself proud of your decision now, Haddock. Said man looked pale. Anyway, I come bearing a message. The boy lives. Tsunade's face lit up and the civilians growled. He is in our favor. We blessed him. He is being trained and when he returns in three years, he shall be the strongest being you've ever met. Why do you favor a demon? Yeah. Bless the Achiha instead. He needs power. How dare you demand something from me. There's a strict difference between want and need. This village will go up in flames in three years. This village is finished. It shall fall by the hands of Naruto Uzumaki Namikas. Mumbling started about his last name. But, Naruto loves this village more than anything. Tsunade spoke, shocked. 
That was true, until the Haddock's betrayal. Honestly. If he was a demon he'd do what he'll do in three years, years ago. Goodbye Kanoha. Only the pure souls that are in Naruto's favor shall live. Good riddance. She huffed, disappearing. Then there was chaos. Ara, who had been appointed to Kazakiage, stood and walked towards the gates. Lord Kazakiage. Where are you going? Asked Hamara. We need you in the upcoming battle with the demon. Ara scowled. This place has fallen from my favor as well. I shall spread what has happened here to all your allies. Kami-sama was right. This place deserves to fall. Seriously, Naruto was the only decent being in this village. Kankuro spat. Damari sent them all a glare before following her brothers. Itachi didn't understand what happened. Only seconds ago was he sleeping in his bed, only seconds ago was he awoken by screams, and only a second ago did he walk into the Akatsuki's entrance, did he only see a beautiful woman standing before all the tailed beasts they collected. Before her and them were the Akatsuki. Dead, even Madaracha. Only Hyde and Kissam and Dadara were alive, bloodied, and cowering in a corner. Ah. Itachi Ichiha. Wonderful to see you. Itachi did his best to look calm, after all, and Ichiha never showed fear. Never. It was hard, though, to be standing before a woman who likely defeated all of the Akatsuki single-handedly with the tailed beasts as backup. The woman's ruby lips molted into a smile as if she could sense his fear. He didn't doubt it, after all, this woman was the embodiment of poison. Yes, she was the meaning of the word beautiful, but it was a deadly beautiful. Her long black hair flowing in waves down her back with red curling at the base and tips, her pale pearl skin made even in a Chiha look tan, and her eyes were a deadly combination of black, red, and purple. She was tall, had a perfect body, and had a proud aura of power around her. Yes, Itachi admitted it he was terrified just by her appearance. Let's not forget her voice. It was beautiful, yet dead. You are? He asked, somehow able to keep his monotone voice. I'm so glad you asked, Itachi. These fools didn't think of asking until Pain and Madara were dead. Oh, I guess you call him Toby, but whatever. She said, nodding towards the cowering s rank missing Nin who flinched when she motioned to them. I am Yami, goddess of darkness and death. Many people even call me the Shinigami. Yep. Terrifying. Itachi had never been so scared his entire life. Ida-chan he didn't like that nickname, but when it comes from Yami, he couldn't do anything. I, being a goddess and all, know that you weren't the one to kill your clan. Itachi was shocked, but forced himself not to show it. So, like these wise buffoons, I hope you'll take up my offer. Depends. You know Kakashi, Naruto-kun sensei, yes? Itachi nodded. Naruto's father's student. Don't say that. That man has no right to be such. He tried to murder Naruto. If you'd say Itachi was shocked, you'd be right. Kakashi was a better actor than he thought. He truly believed that one-eyed man liked the Kaiubi container, yet he betrayed him. Yami-sama was right, he had no right to be called the Yandame student if he tried to kill, said man's only son. We have blessed Naruto. Granted him great powers and gave him the Dragon King as his new teacher in a different dimension. I want you, along with these men, to teach him how to use his new jutsu. True, he knows them all now, but he still needs practice. Serve him. He is now the Dragon Prince. Serve him and help him bring down Konoha from their crimes. That place has fallen from our grace. It would have long ago, but Naruto kept us back. Help him complete that goal while devoting your whole lives to him. I let you live if you do so. Did he really even have a choice? No. Be a servant or die. I accept, Yami-sama. Wonderful. I'll give you all a year to prepare. Yes, a year. Get lessons or whatever shit you think of together and meet me at the Valley of the End in, I repeat, one year from today. Don't even try to run away for I'll hunt you down and kill you. Do I make myself clear? The remaining Akatsuki members nodded. She smiled. Good. Bye, guardians of the dragon. Arachimaru was terrified. This unearthly beauty before him was glaring at him with her eyes greener than emeralds. She had slaughtered her way in here and came in without a single drop of blood on her. He couldn't hear, sense the chakra of, or feel anyone else in this entire base. Not even Kabuto. She had completed a massacre. He narrowed his eyes at her. Who are you? He hissed. Show some respect, snake. She spat back. I am Tozi, goddess of nature. I will not tolerate such words against me. Goddess of nature. Was she here to kill him like his base? If she was, there was one thing certain. He was screwed. My lady, what can I do for you? My sisters and I have turned a blind eye long enough, Arachimaru. We cannot, will not stand for this any longer. Your slaughter count could rival that of some demons, and the blood staining you makes you smell like one. Before more things come about, it's time to end it. Yep. Screwed. Even Arachimaru knew he couldn't fight a goddess, let alone win. My lady, he began, trying to pry his way out like always. Let me serve you then. 
I'll become a great asset to you. The goddess growled at him. Fool. She hissed, causing Orochimaru to flinch, her blonde hair starting to glow a ghostly green. You think I don't know you? I know your betraying nature, your desire for power, your inclination for blood. It's like your own constitution. Orochimaru gasped when roots wrapped around him. And they weren't ordinary, he knew right away they were impossible to break. This time, he didn't bother to hide his fear. It showed and came off of him in waves towards the wrathful goddess. I planned on fighting you to the death, give you a warrior's death of honor, but I changed my mind. You don't deserve such a privilege. You deserve to die like the dog you are. Know your place, Orochimaru. My sister, Yami, has the perfect punishment waiting for you in hell, and I don't think she likes to be kept waiting. She held out her hand and a vine scythe formed in it. She started walking towards the panicking man. W wait. I won't betray you. Wait. Silence, Orochimaru. Take your death with honor. She spoke, now standing before him. I'm immortal. I can't die. I have so many things I must do. Please. Those he scoffed, holding the blade high. You sicken me. No. He screamed, but it was of no use. The scythe came down. And it did its job. Those he let the scythe sink into the ground and the roots retracted, showing no sign that they were even there. You don't deserve a burial. Now, I must return to my sisters. She said, vanishing in a green light. Naruto smiled as he walked through the village's streets, getting smiles from everyone he saw. It was a great change from the glares from Kanoha. Besides him was Bahamut in his human form. His hair was long, braided and golden like his scales. His eyes were a deep red and golden rimmed, and he held his head high in pride. Like Naruto, his skin was tan but not sun-kissed like the spiky blonde. Naruto, over the years, grew much taller now that he wasn't malnourished. He was the size of a normal 18-year-old, though he was only 15. He'd lost all baby fat, grew some muscles, and almost looked like an exact replica of his father, the Yondame. His hairstyle was nearly the same as well with the bangs only being slightly shorter and kept its unbleached color. Naruto's scars on his cheeks grew a little darker from being able to now use the Kyubi's power however he wished, and his pupils were slits like the fox's, but retained their glowing crystalline color. He liked to wear shinobi-styled clothes with a crossover of mage cloths. He wore black and silver pants much like Natsu's and Grey's, with a golden Asian-style dragon swirling around the legs. He wore a fishnet underneath a black ninja undershirt with bandages on his hands and wrists. He had ninja-styled footwear that many ninja students had already started to wear. And, above all, he had a coat much like the one the Yandame used to wear. Kaiubi had put up a tantrum about this, rambling about bastard blonde hokages that deserved to fall into the deepest depths of hell the moment the boy put it on. All in all, Naruto had turned into a heartthrob. He looked around the village which was as large as Konoha, but more welcoming. This village was the Dragon Village or Ryugakur as he liked to call it. A year after he became an apprentice to Bahamut and his adopted son, much to his pleasure and excitement at being raised by an actual dragon, he came across this village being seized by bloodthirsty bandits, along with four dark guilds, which subdued the resident guild, Fairy Tail. When he slaughtered them all to save the village, the people begged him to be his leader and teach them his ways, and his magic Naruto, after some convincing from his dragon father, agreed. He changed the name from Magnolia to Ryugakur, a ninja and magic village. He had become a cage, not the Hokage, but the Ryukage. The Magic Council was thrilled to have a ninja village and put in a lot of money for ninja weapons and the likes. The resident guild, Fairy Tail, became his personal self-proclaimed magical guards as a side job to taking requests, and the remaining Akatsuki members were his ninja guards that were mostly with him. These guards were the guardians of the dragon when combined though still known as the Akatsuki and Fairy Tail separately. During this time, he met Urza. It was love at first sight. True, Urza could be a little out there, she could be as oblivious as him and had a violent nature, but she was a wonderful, strong woman. The whole village knows of his pact with the goddesses and his goal, and they just cheered him on, and Urza said that was what she'd expect from the Ryukage. He even told her that he'd have to have a few other wives to rebuild his clan. After all, the Akatsuki was kind enough to steal and bring him the Namikas and Uzumaki scrolls. Though, he did suspect Yami had something to do with this due to the fact that the unmovable Akatsuki members started to sweat like pigs about to be slaughtered whenever she looked at them when she and her sisters visited. Urza only smiled again, said she understood, and only allowed it on one condition. He loved that woman. Naruto agreed. After that, Fairy Tail went wild about the news. Urza was now his first wife. They had married in the Fairy Tail Guild only a few months ago, and the mages were still drinking themselves unconscious in celebration and habit. It was a month ago did they discover that his wife was pregnant. Overjoyed as he was, Urza and the guild were the most excited. They didn't think Urza would ever get married, let alone have a child she beat them up after that. 
luckily, it was a memorable time since he just so happened to have a camera with him. He really enjoyed fairy tale, they were a great change from his life before. He sighed when he remembered Laxus, Makarov's son. The man tried to take over the guild, saying that the guardians of the dragon should only have strong people, saying the Ryukage and fairy tale only deserved the best and strong. Before Naruto could step in, Natsu and Gajil had defeated him. Laxus, by order of Makarov, was banished before Naruto, once again, could step in. Naruto did, however, send a message to Laxus by Hawk, saying that if Ryugakur ever needed help, he'd call. He remembered the two words Laxus wrote back. They were sincere and had a few dried wet spots on the paper, indicating thankful tears. Thank you. After that, Laxus became a spy and reported through letters on what was happening in the world around them. While the Akatsuki taught at a new ninja school for children, some of the mages from Fairy Tales started teaching magic as well. It was almost hard to believe a magic and ninja village if compared, Ryugakur would be the strongest of the ninja villages by far which Naruto took great pride in. Naruto. Urza shouted out, running towards them. She quickly engulfed him in a hug, slamming him against her stone armor, causing him to wince. How are you? She asked, not noticing the pain she had just caused to her husband's cheek. Naruto smiled. No matter how much she hurt him, be it on purpose or not, he loved this woman so much. Fine, Urza love, fine. I'm just heading back to the Namika's estate. Would you like to accompany me? I would. I still need to clean the living room before we leave later today to take down that god-awful village. Urza had never been good at cleaning which caused her great distress. Marahin had been kind enough to assist her. After hours of explanation and demonstration, Urza could finally do an adequate job at it. Naruto smiled and nodded, taking a hold of her hip and started walking along. Urza blushed. Bahamut smirked and wandered off seeing something very shiny and interesting, leaving the two alone. They walked up to the Namika's compound. Toma just couldn't have him build his own house, no, she had to have brought the original compound from Kanoha. Not that he complained. It was much bigger than his one-room department. Still, she didn't have to bring the whole thing. It was a mansion of over 30 rooms and over 10 bathrooms. It had a fountain in the front, a giant pond, a swimming pool, a few training grounds he could go on forever. And, Kami forbid, some of the master cooks of Ryugakur just had to insist on making his meals, so they came by every day to cook dinner for free. After a while, it didn't feel right to Naruto, so he started paying them in secret, knowing they would refuse if he paid them directly. Marahin and Lucy had seen the dying garden and became his personal florists. Urza couldn't take care of a plant and keep it alive, even if her own life depended on it. Everything she touched died, so she was banished from the garden by the two. Thank Kami that only the Akatsuki and Fairy Tail could get in, or he'd be bombarded with shiver fangirls daily. He thanked his future heavenly wife again that one could only get in with a blood rider permission from the owner. Fangirls were animals, wolves out for blood and pain a lot of pain. Those creatures don't have fingernails, they have claws. Those claws only have one goal in mind. The elimination of his cloths. He felt bad for Sasuke team for a while, then let it go. The bastard deserved it. He, on the other hand, still hadn't gotten used to the attention. After he told the village of his past in Kaiubi, he was surprised with the outcome. He'd expected them to distant themselves from him. But no, it only made them more determined. Especially, bless his soul, Natsu. Though, Natsu was definitely another story. After hearing his past, he was literally burning with rage and started a chanting of down with Kanoha throughout the village at the time. Natsu had personally come up to him and asked him for training. He said if Naruto can be a ninja and dragon slayer, then so could he. Naruto had given him a devious smile and put him through hell. Soon after, Grey joined. Gajil started as well, saying he couldn't lose to Natsu. After a month or two, he gave them scrolls for them to study on their own. After all, he was busy with the bane of the cage existence. Paperwork. Those three were some of the most determined people he'd ever seen. These villagers had more of the will of fire than Kanoha. Naruto liked to call it the will of the dragon instead. It was much more appropriate, powerful, and not tainted like the will of fire. Once inside the compound, one could already smell the scent of lunch flowing in the air and realize that since he wouldn't be here for a while, the troublesome cooks decided to make lunch which they never did. Oh great, he was starting to sound like Shikamaru. He couldn't help but smile at that. Urza's stomach growled and she just kept standing tall. Naruto looked at her with a smile. Urza. You're hearing things. She quickly proclaimed smoothly. Naruto shook his head in amusement and captured her lips in a loving kiss. I heard nothing. He said, wandering off while leaving a flustered and stammering Urza in his wake. In a few hours he, Urza, and Bahamut would depart to the Elemental Nation's world. In just a few hours, Kanoha's judgment would begin. Back in Kanoha, the atmosphere was heavy. The people and villagers were all jumpy. It had been three years and they were preparing for the worst. 
the Chunin exams were coming up and they didn't know how successful they would be considering their luck over the last three years. Ara had indeed been truthful to his word. He told all their allied nations. The daimyo of fire was enraged with the village and severely cut their finances. Queen Yuki from the formerly land of snow turned land of spring, cut off all ties and imports and exports from the village. The queen from the land of greens did the same. The land of the wave cut off any and all ties with them. The land of the waterfall even put them on the instantly kill when sighted scroll. The Wagaker's hatred grew as well. Even if he was the son of their worst enemy and wanted him dead, a child is a child, and abandoning the honor of a powerful man's last wish was disgraceful even in their eyes. As it turns out, word reached the formerly thought extinct Whirlpool village. Where Kishina Yuzumaki, wife of Minato Namikaze and mother of Naruto Yuzumaki Namikaze, was the Yuzukage, not sure if that's right. Oh well. She was enraged and bowed the fall of Konoha as well. No one gets in the way of a chakra-filled female Yuzumaki when they're in rage. And they just set a stone wall in front of them with big red targets. Konoha was already falling. Hard. Tsunade, too, had enough of the village. After she announced that Naruto was Minato Namikaze's son and got many protests and curses from the civilians, she had secretly gathered all of Naruto's friends and their accepting family members and formed a group that would side with Naruto when the time came. Most of the clans agreed, but only a few of the Hyuga clan were trustworthy. Mainly Niji, Hinata, Hiashi, Hanabi, and very few others who were mostly made up of the branch families. Even those from Ichiraku Raymond were there. Jiraiya and Aruka attended every meeting they could, Kitetsu and Izumo even snuck out of guard duty. Of course, Sasuke Chiha and Sakura Hirano weren't included. The civilian council was spoiling the Ichiha brat after he became devastated when he found out that the Akatsuki was slaughtered, Arachimaru was dead, and his curse mark disappeared. They gave him all the jutsu he wanted, and Kakashi became his personal tutor, even gaining clan secrets. Sakura was following him around like a loyal puppy and didn't really get any better. The council was even telling Tsunade to go ahead and just promote him to Jounin, but she refused. She had strictly told them that he'd have to gain status like the rest of them, and he'd become Chunin if he succeeds the exams that were coming up. Over the three years, it was discovered that Ino didn't really like Sasuke, but Naruto, she just didn't want people to think lowly of her. In fact, it was discovered that Ino, Hinata, Tenten, Tamari, Hana Inuzuka, and even Anko were in love with Naruto. It shocked the village how they could be in love with a demon of sorts. Many ninja on the other hand thought it wonderful and congratulated them for really listening to their teachers, no matter how bad they were, like Kakashi, they looked underneath the underneath. They became known as the Angel Six by Naruto lovers and the Demon Whores by the haters. They ignored that last one. The Angel Six, minus Tamari who was in Suna, were sitting at Ichirakus with a distant expression on their faces. They had all agreed that when they saw Naruto they'd finally confess and tell them their reasons for their love. They knew he had to rebuild the Namika's clan and decided to share him. Ino loved him for who he was, not a spoiled arrogant egoistic bastard Sasuke Chia, but a gentle, sensitive, loving, happy Naruto Uzumaki Namikas who put others before himself despite being the Kaiubi container and all he'd been through. A real man. Anata loved him for nearly the same reasons and not caring about her status as the Hyuga heiress in the slightest. He was patient and even called her stuttering problem cute which, she admitted, made her faint and Naruto to worry. Over the three years, she had gotten rid of her stutter to be of more use to Naruto when the time came. Plus, she didn't want to worry him. True, the stutter did return if she was nervous or embarrassed, but only rarely, thanks to the help of her friends and, surprisingly, father. Denton loved his fighting spirit and wrath less personality. She knew from when she was younger that he'd been abused after experiencing it. On the Kaiubi festival ninja and civilians came in and asked for weapons that were easily disposed of for the demon hunt as they called it. She thought it was a new addition to the festival and agreed to help them. When she told her father, he grew pale and muttered Naruto under his breath and ran to the Sandane. He came back and said everything was fine. The next day she found Naruto slightly bruised. She put two and two together and felt horrible about it. Hana loved him for his animal scent and determination. He had the spirit of a wolf and the durability of a bear. He was gentle like a rabbit yet fierce like a mother fox protecting her kits. The perfect man for an Inuzuka. She remembered the look on her passed out brother's face when she told him. It was hilarious. Anko was in love with him for him. He didn't discern her for her teacher or abilities or love to torture. He even saw through her mask which no one had yet. When she asked how he only smiled sadly and said because I too have a mask, and that was when she fell for him. They were alike in many ways, only she knew that Naruto had it worse when she saw the glares that were even more intense than hers. Those were glares that caused even her to flinch, yet he didn't move a muscle. Damari's reasons were different. She knew what he had gone through in the past due to her brother, Gara. He was strong, stronger than Gara in a sense. 
he didn't become a revenge-filled bloodlusting monster. No, he was gentle and only attention craving a strong man. Ino sighed and let her head fall to the table. When will we see him again? She asked herself more than anyone. Enko laughed. Don't worry. The brat always keeps his word. It's been three years. He'll return to us soon, and then I can ride him as much as I want and bear lots and lots of his strong children. Oh, I just know he'll make me scream and... Enko? Hinata exclaimed, blushing along with the other girls. She shook her head. Oh, grow up. I know you all dream about it too. He's huge as well. When we were on a mission together, I accidentally saw him bathing. I'm telling the truth when I say accidental. She giggled, imagining when that day finally came. The girls blushed, quickly slipping into a fantasy before shaking their heads and glaring at the female snake user. They had to admit it, they did dream about it. I bet he's just like an animal. Hana voiced aloud. When she realized those words passed her lips, she blushed and turned away. Hey, Tenton began. What if he's found someone else in that world? Silence. We'll still tell him. Hinata and Ino said at once. The two looked at each other surprised before determination took over on their faces and they nodded. They'd kept it secret from Naruto for too long. Not anymore. Plus, he needs to rebuild the Namika's clan. Hana spoke. That'll take more than one woman. They nodded. This was true. It'd take far too long to compete it by one wife only, even Naruto understood this. What are you girls talking about? They turned. Haruka sensei They exclaimed. He smiled at them and sat down at the remaining seat at the small Raymond stand. Is it Naruto? They blushed. We just don't know if he'll accept us. All six of us. Ino spoke quietly, implying to Mari as well. Or even if he's found someone else already. Tenten added. Believe it or not, I think the brat is handsome right now. Anko said. If my calculations are correct, a real heart rob. It's only natural for them to find someone rather quickly. Aruka laughed at them with a smile. If I know Naruto, he's not like that. One Mizo, please. Sure. Answered Tucci. They turned to them the scarred teacher. Naruto has always hated fangirls. He only spoke of Sakura like that for much needed attention because he knew she'd give it to him, even if it was painful it was still attention that he craved. He always spoke that when he meets the right girl, he'll know. He won't just pick out a random woman. He wanted to know her, to fall in love. The girls blushed at this. Anko turned away to hide hers due to pride. He was always interested in all of you. He came to me saying that he liked multiple girls and he didn't know what to do. He couldn't stop liking them. Even if some were older. He felt ashamed at first, but I told him it was alright. I knew of his origins at the beginning because of the Sandame's slippery tongue. I knew he'd have to rebuild his clan, so I told him it was alright for only him and him alone. He didn't understand at first, but his shame went away. He's a pure boy, one with a heart ready to be filled. I know he'll accept your feelings. Don't worry. Just fill his heart and he'll welcome you with open arms be he with another woman or not. The girls nodded, relieved and happy. This was a wonderful day indeed. Naruto, Urza, and Bahamut in his human form, stepped out of the portal into the land of the wave. Naruto smiled at the memories of his first high-ranking mission. Haku and Zabuza. His heart skipped. He had something he needed to do. He led them to the graves of the two fallen ninja and lifted his hand. Rise. He spoke, his voice slightly echoing. His hand began to glow, and sparkles fell from them onto the dirt below. He flinched slightly. He never liked raising the dead, it made him feel like he was interfering with their lives. Slowly, the ground began to open, and the two fully fleshed ninja opened their eyes. They looked like they did three years ago. Aku's eyes snapped open, and she immediately shouted Zabuza. While snapping up. Said man groaned. What? He snapped, sitting up as well. He looked confused when he saw himself in a deep hole. He grabbed his sword that was sitting by him, stabbed in the dirt, and walked out with Haku. Hello again, Haku, Zabuza. The two sharply turned around and at full alert. Urza quickly jumped in front of Naruto protectively, only to be pushed aside by him with a reassuring smile. She reluctantly backed down. When the two saw Naruto, they relaxed. It's you, brat. What's going on? I could have sworn that we were. Dead. Naruto finished for them, causing them to silence themselves. It's true, you were dead. I brought you back. What? Haku spoke under her breath. How in the hell could you do that? Zabuza snapped. He could feel the powerful aura coming from the Namikas, and it slightly scared him. He didn't think anything could possess such an aura, not even a biju. Naruto smiled sadly and began to tell his story. Haku cried when he spoke about his betrayal while Zabuza growled, letting loose his bloodlust and slamming his sword into the ground out of rage. He hated himself for acknowledging that man. Never again. 
they seemed fascinated with the rest of the story and frightened when Bahamut turned into a dragon before their eyes, snickered, then turned back. He spoke of his origins and his need to restore his clan. He also introduced Urza who still had a protective aura around her. She may be his wife, but she's also a part of fairy tale, his personal guards. When around powerful unknowns then she was always on alert. That's my story. So you're the Ryakage of your own ninja and magic village? Zabuza asked. When Naruto nodded he whistled. Nice, Brad. Thanks. So, what'll happen to where Kanoha used to stand? Naruto gave a devious grin. The goddesses already have made their decision. Once that land is destroyed and cleaned out of rubble, they're going to send my village to this dimension to where it once stood. Of course, I'll keep the mountain with the Hokage's faces intact, but nothing else. We'll still be able to travel through the two dimensions though. Ryugakur will basically be like a dimension connector. Go in through one way you'll still be in the elemental nations, go out the other then you'll be in Fiori. Wow brat. That's complicated. I think the complicated thing is being chased by rabid fangirls while trying to find the right ones who love me for me to help rebuild my clan. Damn, I sound like Sasuke team, but it was in my father's will. He wished it so I'll comply. Zabuza gave him an eye smile. You're an honorable man, Naruto. Unlike that haddock. He spat. Aku blushed and whispered something into Zabuza's ear who nodded. I think that's appropriate. I agree. We do owe him our lives. He spoke back before turning to Naruto. I have a request. Naruto raised a perfect eyebrow, not expecting something as such. Yes. As thanks, I would like to join your village as a dragon ninja. He said, determined. Naruto smiled and nodded, reaching into his bag and tossing him a headband with character of dragon on it, with a swirl like a whirlpool around it. Zabuza quickly replaced his missing nin one with this. Also, you like Haku, the girl I consider my daughter, right? Naruto blushed. I did. It was true. She was the first person he ever met that shared her pain. He felt a connection to her, a deep one. When she died, he felt a little of the emptiness and aloneness close in on him once again. Then let her help you rebuild your clan as thanks. You did bring us back to life. I don't mind. Urza exclaimed with a powerful look on her face, her arms crossed while Naruto looked slightly shocked. He hadn't expected this. The girl seems strong and Naruto likes her. Go ahead. Only if Haku wants. Naruto confirmed. Quickly, Haku nodded with a red face. Naruto snickered at this causing the red to darken. D does this mean I'm a dragon then as well? If you would like. She nodded again. Please. And she received her headband. Come. It's time to visit some old friends. Spoke Naruto. I'll get it. Inari exclaimed when there was a knock at the door. Once opened, the boy's face lit up. Naruto Nai-san. But that shout, Tazuna and Tsunami were immediately up and running towards the door. Once Naruto was spotted, Tsunami pulled him into a hug with tears flowing down her cheeks. I'm guessing you've heard. Naruto asked as he returned the embrace to the weeping woman. Heard. Tazuna scoffed. I'd be surprised if someone hand. What happened to you spread throughout the elemental nations like wildfire? Kano has fallen. Your job is much easier now. I like things hard. Naruto said. And I'll be damned if it isn't. He finally separated from the woman and tapped Inari on the head who quickly embraced him. Naruto laughed. So, old man, have you finally stopped drinking? I'm serious, you'll drink yourself dead one of these days. Azuna huffed. Yeah, right. Urza walked in next to Naruto and took his hand. What shocked the three the most was Abusa and Haku walking in behind him. Why do I get the feeling that the three goddesses are behind this? Tazuna sighed. He needed more sake. And who's this beauty? Urza blushed and looked away. Naruto grinned. It's a long story. A long one indeed and I've already told it once today, so sit down, listen, and take it to heart because I won't repeat it again for a week. The three nodded and settled in the living room. It had been a week since Naruto revived Zabuza and Haku. Haku and he had a quiet marriage in Tazuna's house with a single priest, having wanted a quiet one away from Ryugakur, where the people would be sure to host a party fit for a king if they married there. He knew one thing. Haku looked beautiful in that Fiori-style wedding dress that Urza had ex-equipped for such an occasion. Zabuza, surprisingly, cried. Naruto got a picture for safekeeping. Blackmail never hurt either. Haku's wedding ring was much like Urza's in a sense. The band was designed like a curled dragon. Hers was blue while Urza's was red. That was the only difference. Surrounding the diamond and keeping it in place was a swirl of silver with blue sapphires like a whirlpool. Urza's little stones on the swirl were rubies instead. All in all, a beautiful and expensive ring. Surprisingly, and to Haku's great happiness, she became pregnant when the three had an ahem biblical night a week ago. She knew of course that Urza's child would probably go on to being the clan head, but she was happy anyway. 
Zabuza was ecstatic, talking about training his grandchild in the art of the sword. Naruto was ecstatic as well. Always running around and praising her wonderful self every minuet possible. Haku very much enjoyed it. She wanted a family as much as Naruto. They both knew what it was like to be alone. Or was coming, they knew, but at that moment, everything was perfect. Naruto awoke between his two wives. He smiled at them lovingly. He felt excitement well up inside him. He knew they held his children, and he was exceedingly happy to be able to start a family soon. He sighed. That was still months away yet, and he was not known for his patience. Even Urza hadn't yet showed any signs of holding a child yet. You know, Kit, it won't go any faster even if you think about it. Teased the demon. Shut it, Kaiubi. Naruto growled back, causing the demon fox to chuckle. He slowly got up, as to not disturb them, and walked out the door, shutting it silently as to not wake them. He walked down the stairs in complete silence, not making a single noise out of habit of training. When he entered the kitchen, he was greeted with the smiles of Tizuna, Tsunami, Inari, Bahamut, and the eye smile of Zabuza, who had seemed a little more open after Haku's pregnancy was announced. Morning. He said. Good morning. Was the stimulus answer from the four. Naruto sat down and waited while Tsunami cooked breakfast. Zabuza turned to the young Ryakage in poorly hidden excitement. When's this siege going to start? We're going to play with them first. I'm going to enter some of my people into the Chunin exams. He smiled wickedly. They'll show them no mercy. He chuckled darkly, causing Tazuna, Tsunami and Inari to pale and scoot away. They swore that they saw a dark aura coming off of him and almost felt sorry for Kanoha almost. Zabuza shivered for a moment before smiling. I like this kid. I like him a lot. Ahmed smirked. That's all my doing. I like you too then. He joked, laughing. Bahamut snorted before turning to his adopted son. Why don't you play with them more? Send them a dragon to screw with them. Naruto's smile grew into a full-on demon fox that was preparing for the ultimate mischief. This smile had been dubbed the Doomsday Smile by Ryugakur and named well. Nothing good came out of a Doomsday Smile. Good idea, Pops. He said, before his smile softened. I'll also send one to Mom. If she is truly alive like what Tazuna says he turned to the man who nodded. Then I'd like to meet with her at the Chunin exams in three weeks. Ahmed nodded. By the way, what are you going to do about those angels that they, he shivered at the implied they told us about. Ahaha. Going to surprise the little ladies and give their fathers heart attacks, right? I just love how your little mind works. Naruto smiled at the Dragon King Kaiubi too who gained his own smirk before walking outside. Shiro, Kuro. The Midnight Black Dragon and Snow White Dragon appeared before him. They were a little bigger than Naruto himself in height, and both had golden eyes. These were the twins who were a few years older than Naruto himself. Dragons are immortal yet they age like a human until they're adults. Kuro, I need you to deliver a message to Konoha and Shiro one to my mother in the Whirlpool village. They nodded. Kishina was having a bad day. She was still irked about Konoha treating her son as such and pissed at Danzo over lying about him being dead. When she gets her hands on him he won't know the meaning of pain anymore. She knew even Danzo feared the legendary Uzumaki rage that was usually passed down through females and were ruthless when in that rage. Suddenly, in cold white flames, a large dragon appeared in her office. She was about to call for her Anbu when she paused and remembered what the Kazakiage personally told her then they met. Kami-sama referred to him as the Dragon Prince. The dragon looked at the woman with powerful calm eyes and sat down and held herself high. The ceiling was barely high enough for this mighty being. I have a message for Kashina Uzumaki from the Dragon Prince my lord. The woman shook in anticipation. A and who's this prince? The dragon looked at her kindly. Naruto Uzumaki Namikas. The woman nearly fainted as tears of happiness fell from her eyes and down her smiling face. She slowly sat down on her desk. She was overjoyed. Her son wasn't mad at her for not being there. He still thought of her. She knew the council didn't allow Naruto to know of his parents, but she was still overjoyed. He proceed. She rasped out. Just then, Anbu stepped in after hearing their cage weep. When they saw the dragon, they pulled their weapons to the ready, but Kishina beat them. Don't raise your hand against this dragon. She bears a message from my son. At this, the Anbu were shocked. They had heard the rumors. They nodded and immediately put their weapons away, but refused to leave the room. The dragon nodded to them. The message is as follows, word for word. Kishina nodded, growing more anxious. Go on. Mother, may I call you that, I know I haven't really known you, but I wish to. During my stay in the other world, I have established my own ninja village. As soon as Konoha falls my village will be transported to where it once stood. I would like us to form a treaty there. After all, I am my father's son. I don't want to anger a woman, especially in Yuzumaki. Kishina laughed at this. The Anbu snickered. He had no idea the rage of an Yuzumaki. 
no idea. They shivered at a memory long departed. Before Kano has fall, I'd like to meet you. During the Chunin exams I am entering those from my village to screw with them. I request that you be there to watch with me so we may meet and get to know each other better. My dragon father, Bahamut King of the Dragons, also wants to meet the woman who was able to tame a man of such caliber, able to seal the legendary Kaiubi, and even summon the Shinigami, or Yami, whichever you prefer. Ashina blushed. I do hope you accept this. I really want to meet my mother, something I never had. Please meet with me. Tell Shiro, the dragon, your answer. Hope to see you soon. Sincerely, Naruto Uzumaki Namikaze, the Dragon Prince and Ryukage of Ryugakur. Ashina was crying tears of joy. Her baby wanted to meet her. Her baby wanted to meet her for God's sake. The decision was obvious. She turned to the dragon. I accept. Tell him I shall see him then and help participate in their fall which I assume will be after the exams. Shiro nodded and disappeared in the same golden fire she came in. Anbu? Prepare for my departure. I want six Anbu and four Jounin to accompany me. Kanoha will fall, and Ryugakur will rise. At this, the Anbu cheered in a very unprofessional way and went to spread the news across the Whirlpool village. Anko collapsed on her bed after yet another day of torturing for information. It wasn't that she disliked it, it was quite the opposite. She loved it. The fact was that it was just getting quite exhausting. The number of spies and traitors in Kanoha were bordering on ridiculous levels. Ever since the village's prophesied destruction those who weren't as loyal were turning their backs on them or turning into spies for other villages. She understood this in a way. Why ally yourself with a place that your death is inevitable? But, if you're going to turn traitor, make it less obvious. Luckily, no one from her group was brought in yet. As much as she loved torturing new toys, she'd hate to torture the ones from the group Tsunade formed. During the past three years she'd gotten close to the people in it, especially to the Angel Six. She knew her love for him was the most shocking out of the others. The others had known him since the academy days, but she hadn't. What many didn't know was that she had. She was once one of his Anbu guards, one of the only ones that actually bothered to take care of him, and that was why she was removed from protection detail by the council and threatened to be executed if she so much as talked to him again unless it was required. It was a huge change, being away from him. She had often come over for meals and just a normal chat. Hanging with Kurinai was wonderful and all, but she had missed the little brat, and cooking all three meals by herself wasn't appealing. Her addiction to Dango was also because of Naruto. He had taken her to one of his favorite Dango restaurants, one of the perhaps three food-selling places in the whole village that even let him in. He had gotten her Dango and she just couldn't stay away from it afterward, always having a need to eat it. When she had seen him in the Chunin exams room after she had bashed in through the window she was shocked. She hadn't seen him besides glimpses on the streets since she was removed from protection when he was 10. After two years her feelings didn't subside. She knew he had recognized something when he raised an eyebrow at her behavior, but it immediately brushed it off, probably not believing that she could be Viper, the only Anbu that actually gave a shit. When she was told he died, she felt like breaking down. She finally had a chance to talk to him again, only for it to be taken away. When Kami appeared and told them the truth, she was filled with two things. Rage and relief. She was in rage at Kakashi and his actions, and that the village actually had the balls to cheer about his death, as if he hadn't risked his life to bring back the precious Achiha after he turned traitor. That was one person she wished she could but wasn't allowed to torture. She felt relief that he was alive, like thousands of butterflies flew down her throat and started to flutter in the pit of her stomach. Not long after, the Angel Six came out with their feelings, telling all that they loved Naruto despite the negative attention they'd receive. Kurinai, who already knew of her feelings, often joked about how the so-called last Ichiha got all the weak girls, and the dead last got all the strong and hot ones. Anko let her mask slip a little, and let a small loving smile fall onto her face. No one was here, so her reputation wouldn't be ruined. Naruto was returning soon. The only thing she was truly nervous about was when he finds out about the Angel Six. What would he do? What would he say? She knew he wasn't used to that much love and attention, so she couldn't interpret his to be actions, even if she had dealt with the same things. But that was the past and the past didn't matter. What mattered was the future and she saw a bright future indeed. I see. Naruto said happy when Shiro returned. Thank you. Can you please deliver this letter to Gara, the Kazakiage, for me? After a nod, he quickly told the message to the dragon. Your mother seems like a very nice woman. You're lucky. Goodbye, my prince. Shiro said, disappearing. Your mother? Haku said. When do we get to meet the woman? Urza asked, crossing her arms out of habit. During the Chunin exams. He chuckled. He could barely wait until the day. Aw, oh, kid you're evil. I'm so proud of you. Thank you Kai Ubi. I had a good teacher. You flatter me, but you're damn straight. I was talking about Bahamut. 
I'm kidding, fuzzball, I'm kidding. Both of you were good teachers. You're lucky I'm behind a cage kid. Who's going to participate? Oh, I have a couple people in mind. He smirked. Back in Fiori, five people sneezed. Sunaid resisted the urge to slam her head against the desk she sat at as she faced the civilian council. And, judging by their looks, most of the clan heads were doing the same. Su Minyazuka, however, wasn't resisting the urge and slamming her head against the wood full force. Once again, the civilian council was blaming the demon child for this predicament. It's because of how you treated him. Sunaid finally snapped. This is the demon's fault and you know it. Screeched Lily Hurano. Shikakunara sighed. I disagree. He said. What makes you say that? Kaharu countered. Indeed. If you had just let me enroll him in my route. That's enough of that, Danzo. Sunaid shouted. Once again, the Nara head sighed. Think back. No matter how much abuse you put Naruto through, he kept himself back, didn't blame the village at all, and loved it with the bottom of his heart. Finally, after betrayal, he snapped. I don't blame him though. I'd have snapped long ago and took my own life or destroyed the village as much as I could. Personally, I think we're fucked when he gets back. How dare you? Homura shouted. I speak nothing but the truth. I agree with Shikaku. Hiashi spoke, surprising the civilian side that he was sticking up for the man speaking good about the demon I met the boy a few times due to my daughter, Hinata. He was a fine young man. I was surprised how pure he was actually. I'm not surprised, however, that his sensei's betrayal finally made him open his eyes. Now, now. Danzo began, trying to take control. I think. His speech was interrupted when a large black dragon appeared in the middle of the council hall in cold black fire. Nearly everyone gasped. The dragon scoffed before looking into everyone's eyes. I bring a message from my lord. And who is this? The dragon prince, Naruto Uzumaki Namikis. Silence. Tsunade broke it. Please, speak your message. And I want no interruptions. Lady Tsunade. The Hokage slammed her fist into the wall beside her, causing it to crumble and the room to flinch. I think you need to remember that I am the Hokage, and therefore I am the one in charge, not the other way around. She turned to the dragon. Please continue. My master has told me that judgment time has come for Kanahagakur. In the name of the three goddesses, it shall fall. But. Silence. Snapped Sunade. During those three years, my master has established a ninja village of his own. Ryugakura the dragon village, named after his teacher, the dragon king. He is the cage there, the Ryukage. Thus, he's decided to test his new followers in the Chunin exams in three weeks. He, himself and his dragon father, will be joining to watch the show with the other cage. The dragon paused. Is that all? Tsunade asked, dumbfounded that Naruto was a cage. The dragon shook his head. No. Three years ago, when Yami-sama destroyed the Akatsuki, grumbles radiated through the room, and Kuro patiently waited for them to calm down. She spared four. Those four, along with others, have become his personal guard. The guardians of the dragon. Those four shall be coming as well. Who are they? Danzo inquired. Aiden, Didara, Kisum, and Itachi. Itachi? Chaos reigned free throughout the room. Tsunade herself was shocked. Also, Itachi didn't kill his clan. The goddesses have confirmed that. Spoke Kuro calmly. Danzo, what do you have to say about that? The man visibly flinched. My master would like to know why you had your Ru kill them and blame it on one of his best guardians. The man growled. Tsunade was enraged. Anbu. She screeched. Arrest this man for treason. Now. What? After all I've done for this village. Danzo snapped as he was being pulled out by the Anbu summoned. Mark my words, Sunaid. I will get out and take my revenge. He shouted, his voice growing quiet as the distance between them greeted. My master shall arrive in 17 days, two days before the exam. Please, have a large house ready so he can house his ninja and guards. Clan heads of Yamanaka, Hayuga, and Inuzuka. I must speak with you and a girl named Tenten's father. Also a woman named Anko as well. The dragon didn't even bother to bow before he disappeared. Silence fell over the hall. The civilians were too frightened to speak, and the clan head smirked. Things were getting interesting. Yep, it's as I said. The Nara head spoke with a small smirk. Fucked. Nara blinked. And blinked again. Before him was a white dragon. A dream? Maybe. He'd had insomnia for almost his whole life. It was possible. His brain messing with him? Also possible. He felt his eye twitch as his brother and sister looked at him in amusement. His rage had been turned from the paperwork to confusion and annoyance to a dragon he was debating about authenticity. Hazuki Ajgara. The dragon repeated for the third time. This time, the redeed heard and nodded, his arms still crossed and glaring at the dragon, as if it was about to pounce and eat him. I have a message from my master, Naruto Uzumaki Namikaze, the dragon prince. 
Glaring stopped. Naruto. My master told me to tell you he'll be entering people from his own village into the Chunin exams. Yes, he's created his own village in the other dimension and will move it here when Kanahagakur is no more. He will be watching the Chunin exams. Though he didn't show it on his emotionless face, Gara was ecstatic. Is there more? Yes. Tamari. Said girl jumped. The dragon looked at her kindly. My master knows of the Angel Six. The girl blushed and started playing with her fingers, much like Hinata when she's shy. Gara smirked and Kankuro laughed at her, earning a slap of her fan. My master has told me he accepts you if you so wish. Damari, to say, was on cloud nine. Her brother smiled happily at her. If you wish, you may return with me to him. He also told me to tell you in advance time that he already has two wives. One from the other world and one from here. Damari, truthfully, didn't care. The girls back home had already discussed such an outcome. I'm fine. Let me go pack. She exclaimed with a squeal as she ran out of the office in a blur. Gara remained impassive and shook his head. Tell him he has my blessing. What? Kankuro said. No, treat her right or I'll slaughter you. Naruto wouldn't do that. It's your type of person that I would threaten. Gara said bluntly. Kankuro sighed. Back at Kanahagakur, said clan heads and their daughters met in the Hayuga household, away from prying ears. Tenten had just arrived with her father when she was quickly followed by a confused-looking Anko. Did you, perhaps, meet with a dragon? They all nodded. Said dragon appeared. Good. You're all here. Yes, what's this about? Asked Inoichi Yamanaka. The dragon smirked. Prince Naruto knows of the Angel Six. Oh, surprise, surprise. Everyone's jaws were on the floor. And he's fine with it. The girls let out sighs of relief but braced themselves, hoping that he'd continue with the message. He did. If you do so wish, he accepts you he paused for the inevitable as the four girls squealed and one girl, Anko, brightened drastically. But, you must know he already has two wives. Doesn't matter. Proclaimed Hana. It's to help him rebuild his clan. That's my girl. Tsum exclaimed proudly, happy she was getting her alpha. The girls ran over to each other and hugged. How did Naruto know of it? He ashy found himself asking. The dragon scoffed. I can answer that one for you. He said. When you have three gossip-loving, all-knowing goddesses that like to pop in randomly it's hard to keep anything secret in the world. The room sweat dropped. Also, I have a different message. The dragon's tone was serious, the clan heads tensed. We do know about your group Tsunade formed. Tell them this. The time for Kanoha's fall is nigh. Those who fight with me shall live, those who are against me shall die. After the Chunin exams last round, Kanoha's judgment shall begin. Blood shall reign in righteous fires all around, and this is a battle I will win. Join and fight and your clan shall prosper, deny and cower, and it shall perish. The heads tensed even more. It was nearly time. In a week a dragon will come to the Hyuga household and receive an answer. Fight us or join us. Now, if the women would like, I could take you to Naruto. The girls squealed again, even Anko, and raced out the door, and the clan heads chuckled before becoming serious once again. We will give our answer in a week, though Naruto probably already knows the answer. Kuro huffed. Naruto Sama or Prince Naruto if you join. Show respect. Not that the prince cares, but it's manners that us dragons hold very dear to us. They nodded. Oh, before I go, I think I'd like to tell you something unrelated to this message from my lord. He said, turning an amused scaly eyebrow at them. The Kaiubi created both the Byakugan and Sharingan when he was bored. And if Kaiubi's in Naruto, then he's technically your clan founder. See. Respect. Then Kuro disappeared, leaving a shell-shocked room. Anzo growled as he collapsed onto the throne in his secret underground base. Thanks to his root Anbu he was able to escape the cells before he had to deal with Ibiki. Even though he was relieved at the thought, it also enraged him. He had done so much for this village, and this is how they repay him. By locking him up and scheduling his torture at the hands of a man that made even cages shiver in fear. If only he had gotten that demon brat when it was a baby. He could have raised a boy to be a weapon like no other, a weapon that would have allowed Kanoha to rise above all others. With him in command of course, he would have, after all, trained the weapon, and it would only obey him. If only. He paused his angered musings. Why should he give up? The demon brat could still be controlled. If he took control of Naruto, not only would he rule the elemental nations, but the other world as well. His eyes widened at that thought. Why go for Hokajur the leader of the nations when he can be an emperor? A god. Tuckling to himself, a sly grin moved its way onto his scarred lips. All he had to do now was wait for the boy. After all, why have his root search for him when he knew the boy was going to be here himself? It was almost as if he was handing himself to Danzo in Red Ribbon. The Angel Six stood in front of a moderate-sized house. 
The two dragons had appeared at nearly the same time, dropped the girls off, then disappeared again as if they weren't worth it. They shook their heads. If they were going to be with Naruto, oh, they'd be sorry. Anko walked up and knocked on the door, waiting. Again, she knocked. Silence. Annoyed, she slammed her fist against the door, and it opened to reveal a beautiful woman with blood-red hair, flawless skin, body armor covering her torso and armor-like gloves, and a red skirt on with armor-like knee boots. All in all, a goddess. Who are you? She demanded in a strong yet seductive tone, her arms crossed. Anko didn't like to be sized up. Well, who are you? I asked first. Well, I. Urza. Another girl walked next to her. She had deep black hair and ice blue eyes. She wasn't as tall as the tall one dubbed as Urza, but not short for her age either. She looked at them with a powerful gaze. You are. Anko sighed, giving in. I'm Anko Midarashi. This is Ino Yamanaka, Hana Inuzuka, Tamari, Tenten, and Hinata Hayuga. We're looking for Naruto. Urza smiled. Is that so? Why didn't you say so? He is he she started to turn red. Haku, where is Naruto? Taking a shower I believe. He should be out in a minute or two. He's been in there for a while. Girls. Who's there? Some girls who want to see Naruto. Well, let them in. Who was that? Tenten asked as the two girls led them through the door and into the quaint home. This home's owner, Tazuna. Haku stated, motioning them to the living room. Then, who are you if this isn't your house? Hinata spoke, clearly confused. Yeah, and how do you know Naruto? Ino asked. Urza smiled at them, showing perfect teeth. We're his wives. We carry his children. She proclaimed loudly, causing Haku to blush. The others blushed as well. So these two pretty ladies were his wives. The one named Urza was a prize in herself. They felt slightly degraded by her presence. Besides that, these two had Naruto's children. They really needed to catch up. They would not be upstaged. How'd you get to know Naruto? Hana asked. Well, I was part of the Guardians of the Dragon, his personal guards of the mage side and one of the strongest. We met, got closer, went on dates like a couple, fell in love, married, moved in together, got. Aku slapped a hand over her friend's mouth. That's enough. She sighed. I got to know Naruto a few years ago. He saved my life. So, Anko began, not being able to put off the one question she's always wondered any longer. Is he huge or what? The two wives blushed and nodded, adding to the girl's anxiety. Urza, Haku. Have Kuro and Shiro returned yet? A slightly more deep voice of Naruto flowed down the stairs. The girls straightened as they heard footsteps and almost faulted when they saw Naruto, a much older one. A much older, much hotter Naruto. If people thought Sasuke was hot, Naruto was a god. He smiled at them with a perfectly wide and straight smile, his canines only slightly longer than normal, but they guessed that was due to the Kaiubi. Welcome. I hope Kuro and Shiro treated you well. Before he could get an answer, he was slammed into the ground by six girls. Tazuna and his family ran in to see what was so loud, and Tsunami quickly ushered the disappointed Inari into another room. I'm guessing you missed me. Anko glared at him, giving him his answer before slamming her lips into his. His eyes widened for a second before he, too, closed them and moved his hand behind her head to deepen the kiss. Azuna dropped his sake, Tsunami giggled, and the other girl's blushed looked her as a looked away to hide hers. Anko's fingers started to curl, and she let out a squeal while the girls drooled and glared, wishing it was them in her position. When they separated, Anko was panting and they stood up. She had a deep blush on her face and a far-off look. Anko? He asked. Are you alright? She looked at him with a full-on blush and slowly nodded before walking back to the couch with a seductive sway of her hips. Naruto shook his head and looked back at the five girls surrounding him. He opened his mouth to speak but was interrupted by Tenten. Um was what you said in your message true? Yeah do you accept us as your wives to help rebuild your clan? Said Hana. The girls fidgeted, nervous. They looked at him with hopeful looks. He raised an eyebrow. What are you talking about? I thought I told you that was the case in my message. Did Kuro not deliver it well? Extremely happy looks found their way onto the girls' faces. The six, once again, tackled Naruto to the ground. He grunted when his back hit the hard floor. Naruto-sama. Urza called, worried as she literally started throwing the woman off of Naruto and held him against her metal-covered chest. Are you alright? Yeah, he groaned. You girls have gotten stronger. Of course. Proclaimed Ino. We didn't want to marry you if we were weak. We've worked hard to share you. Oh? Naruto said, his eyebrow rising again. You mean you were planning to share me from the beginning even without my consent? The girls blushed and fidgeted. Naruto laughed. I'll never understand girls. Aku shook her head and offered him a hand he took it. That's the thing. Girls don't understand boys and boys don't understand girls. It's nature. Once again, he looked at the girls. 
Welcome to the Yuzumaki Namikas clan, my dragon princesses. He smiled. I see. Tsunade smiled. Naruto had one told her about his multiple crushes and thought that he'd be able to have a craw here in Konoha one day, not in a different dimension as a cage and dragon prince. The boys, especially Kiba, grew envious over this, but quickly let it subside. They knew Naruto deserved it, and they wouldn't be bitches about it. Even Izumo and Katetsu started grumbling about Lucky Bastard and the likes in good nature. Naruto really is a boy of burning youth. Unlike my ex-rival. Shouted Guy who was silenced by a punch from Tsunade. I agree, Guy-sensei. Screamed Lee, receiving a twin punch. Silence, both of you. Do you want the council and villagers to discover our little group, huh? She snapped. Anyway, please continue, Hiashi. Said clan head nodded. Yes. He left a message. He said, turning to the near 70 people in the room, ninja and civilians alike. It is as follows. The time for Kanoha's fall is nigh. Those who fight with me shall live, those who are against me shall die. After the Chunin exams last round, Kanoha's judgment shall begin. Blood shall rain in righteous fires all around, and this is a battle I will win. Join and fight and your clan shall prosper, deny and cower, and it shall perish. With each word spoken, smiles found their ways onto every face. The time was soon and the corruption shall fall. Gureya smirked. Damn brat. Lucky in so many ways. Shikamaru looked at Hiyashi who seemed a bit pale. He raised an eyebrow at this and looked at his dad who had noticed as well. The Nara head nodded to his son who sighed. Hiyashi-sama, it's troublesome to ask, but are you alright? Inoichi laughed. Oh, he's just still a little shocked at something the dragon messenger said. I, too, was shocked out of my wits. Zhaoza, who was standing next to his son Chaoji, looked up from his chips. You? He spoke for the first time tonight. Inoichi shot him a glare. What? Asked Kiba, anxious to see what would make Mr. No emotion shocked. The Ashi just looked away, not finding the strength to make words. Tsum snorted at the Hyuga head's behavior and answered her son for him. My dear little pup, it seems that the Kaiubi created two well-known techniques, and he's stunned by it. What? Which ones? Kaiubi created the Sharingan and the Byakugan. Niji sputtered for a second before every eye turned to Hiashi who sighed and nodded, confirming her words. Their mouths fell open. That's beside the point. Tsunade said, standing up straight. Naruto has sent his message when he will attack. We must be ready by then. I can help with that. Everyone turned towards a small fox that skipped over to the confused Tsunade. She raised an eyebrow at it when it climbed up to her shoulder. And you are. Ami. One of Prince Naruto's informants. You? You insult me. I am one of the Kaiubi summons. Since Kaiubi sama is inside Naruto, Naruto gets to summon us. Grumbled the creature. Shikakunara smirked. Though Kano had dislikes foxes, they'd never suspect one to be a spy. I didn't even know there was a fox summoning contract. The fox huffed. Of course not. Only those Kaiubi sama sees as worthy can summon us. It turned to look back at Tsunade. I bring you news that Naruto forgot to ask Kuro to say. Everyone sweat dropped. That was so like Naruto. When the messenger arrives at the Hyuga compound in a week, he will bring Dragon Ninja Hideates, and I think that's right, the headband things. Correct me if I'm wrong. When the attack happens, discard your leaf Hideates and put on the ones given to you, even the civilians, so they know that they are on our side. Understand. Makes sense. Tsunade said. Will there be anything else? No. If you need one of us, we'll know. He said, running down and disappearing into the shadows. Now that we have that, what will our plan be? A? Eh? Was the stimulus response throughout the room. Ahamek crossed his arms and stood up straight. The ninja girls will be trained by magical spirits for two weeks before you're married to Naruto two days after you return. He said simply. Naruto sighed while the other girls gawked. He had expected this from his dragon father. The man, well, dragon disliked humans, but he absolutely loathed weak ones. Why? We're strong already. Argued the Inuzuka female. Enko nodded. Yeah. What are you talking about? We're ninja for Kami's sake. That may be so, but as you are you're no match for Urza, even if you all attack at the same time. Scoff the Dragon King. Haku is fine and she carries my boy's baby. I don't want that baby hurt. So, in an hour or so, I'll send you to my dimension to learn the elemental magic. Of course, it'll be nothing like Dragon Slayers, but still powerful enough. The girls looked to Naruto who just smiled and started sipping his drink. He decided it was much safer to not take a side. He'd live longer that way. The girl sighed in defeat. They didn't want to get on the bad side of their father-in-law to be, let alone a dragon. Good, now go get ready. As the girl was headed to pack, Bahamut turned to Naruto and smiled. You chose good woman with potential, Nehru. Naruto grinned back. Funny thing is they don't even know their own potential. 
Urza smirked, placing herself on Naruto's lap. He wrapped his arms around her waist. Hopefully the spirits can help. They have been known to awaken people's inner power. Excuse me. Haku said. What are these spirits exactly? Spirits of magic. Bahamut said. Powerful creatures made up of an element and have complete control over that single element. Urza turned to her. Though they have nowhere near the power of a dragon, her eyes narrowed dangerously. Their power it's devastating. I've experienced it firsthand. They're not that bad. Naruto said. Some of them are my friends. Are they the ones who will train them? Ahmed nodded. You amaze me, Naruto-sama. Urza said. You have just as many surprises in you as Natsu, maybe even more. Even he has trouble with the spirits. Naruto gave her the what's that supposed to mean look, and she just ignored it. Shaking his head, he turned to Haku. Where's Zabuza been anyway? Um? Zabuza stared at the vast forest before him that seemed to twist and reach for him, mocking him, daring him. A dark shadow covered his face. He just went out to get Naruto and Haku a present for their marriage which he had forgotten before due to excitement of living again. It was a simple errand, so why? Oh no, he was not lost. Zabuza never got lost. He was just no, he was not lost. He growled and grabbed his sword. He was going to find his way back one way or another. He wanted to meet these new brides. They'd better be strong. He wouldn't have it if his cage was marrying weak woman. But the swing of rage, the trees around him fell. Within the next hour, the girls had packed and were reluctantly ready to go. Zabuza is still missing, but if the distant booms were any indication, then he'd be back within the hour after destroying the forest. The six, along with Naruto and Bahamut, met outside the house, while Haku and Urza went into town with Inari and his family to shop. Naruto faced the woman with a smile and said. Ready. The girls nodded. Alright, I won't be with you for I'm staying here. After the two weeks are up Bahamut will pick you up and bring you back here for our wedding and the final preparations. Understood. The girls, again, nodded. Why can't you come with us? Asked Tenton, sad that she couldn't see him for a while. They hadn't seen him for three years then after one day they're being sent away again. I have to stay here and prepare. I have a few people I'm contemplating on reviving and seeing before things begin. Enough talk. Bahamut said, holding out his hands. It's time. He said. Naruto waved at them with an encouraging smile as a magical symbol appeared below the girls, and, in a bright light, they disappeared. Motherfucking assholes! exclaimed Anko as she slammed onto the floor of a cave with her face. She sat up and rubbed it while growling. That fucking hurt. Our chuckling caught her attention. Her eyes flew to the shadows and grabbed a kunai and stood at the ready. A bad mouth, trust issues and good reflexes. I might just like you. Said a hissing voice as a man emerged from the shadows. Anko examined the creature for it was no human the way it looked. It had the shape of a man. Purple slitted eyes that sent shivers down her spine and skin that made Orochimaru look like a tam god, black nails that stood at a point, and fangs sticking out of pale lips. Its ears were pointed and had piercings all along them with dark purple hair tied in a high ponytail. In places on the pale skin were purple scales that only added to the inhumanness. Who are you? She demanded with venom. The creature shook its head. Now, now, is that any way to speak to someone who's doing you a favor? It's not every day you can learn from a spirit, girl. I'm only doing this as a favor to my friend, Naruto. Be respectful. She huffed. Earn my respect. She spoke, causing a feral grin to come onto the man's face. I really do like you. My name's Khan, a spirit of poison. When I'm done with you you'll be able to produce poison of any kind from your body. Let's not forget the fighting style of my people. Are you ready to get started, little snake? Anko licked along the kunai with a smirk. I was born ready. Ino landed at the edge of a cliff. She didn't even manage to gain her balance yet when the edge broke causing her to fall. She screamed thinking it was the end, but found herself just hanging. Geez, you just got here and you're already troublesome. Said a boyish voice. Ino looked up at a teenager as he hoisted her up by her collar onto the ledge of the cliff, a storm starting to rumble in the sky. The teenager was an inch or two taller than her and had tanned skin. His hair was streaks of blonde, red, and white. His eyes were a lightning yellow and the other lightning white. He stared at her. Ino Yamanaka, correct. I'm Blaze, a lightning spirit. You are? Is that an insult? Ino frantically shook her head. No, I was just thinking of something that didn't look human. To her surprise, Blaze chuckled with a knowing grin. Ah, you wouldn't be the first. He waved it off. Elemental spirits usually look human-like. Others don't. It's a common mistake. So, you're one of Nero's brides, eh? I must say, he scored well, especially with a chest like that. Ino blushed and hit her chest with her arms and bag. Pervert. He laughed heartily. All right, ready to learn, Ino. She nodded. I'm ready for anything. 
Good, because learning lightning style is very painful. She gulped. Anata landed gently onto the water and stood up. She looked around the beautiful area of sparkling water and a waterfall surrounded by a beautiful rainforest. She blushed. Pretty. It is, isn't it? Spoke a dreamy voice causing Hinata to turn. She saw a beautiful woman with eyes as blue as Naruto's. Her silver hair had many beads and ornaments placed here and there and flowed gracefully in the wind, as if dancing. Her pink lips in a soft, loving smile that caused Hinata to feel warm. Her skin was a little pale, while her body nicely shaped. Hello, little Hinata. I'm Lily, a water spirit. Hello, Lily Chan. Dust Lily is fine, Hinata. She spoke kindly. Child, are you ready to bear the abilities of a water spirit? You must be calm and collected, kind in spirit. Do you believe you can hold the healing and destroying powers of water? For Naruto kun, I will. Lily smiled at the in love girl. Very noble, Hinata. I can see while he loves you. Hinata blushed and tapped her fingers together. W-L-I-I. She giggled. I'm kidding with you, Hinata. Let us get acquainted so we may begin. Denton arrived in a place filled with mountains and rocks, barely any life besides patches of green and water. She frowned at this. She'd have to be careful about food and water for the next two weeks. I know what you're thinking and everything will be fine. There's a plentiful forest just on the other side of this big rock here. Denton turned around and saw nothing. Raising an eyebrow she looked down to see a little girl with black bun hair and green eyes staring up at her with dark skin that blended in well with the shadows. Who are you? I'm an earth spirit, Tora. Denton growled, causing the girl to raise an eyebrow. It's not you, it's just there was this demon cat that we always had to chase a few years back. I still want to murder the damn thing. Tora smirked in amusement. You're fun. I just might like you. Now, let us begin. Begin what? Training, of course. Why else are you here? Denton blushed. I knew that. The girl snorted. Yeah, whatever. Come on, princess, I won't wait all day. Hey, only Naruto can call me that. Once those words came out, Tenton blushed. The girl smiled at her laced with mock. Well, I'm your sensei. I can call you whatever I want, princess. Tenton sighed. Whatever. Damari had to quickly use wind jutsu to fly as she appeared in midair and started to think of ways to painfully kill the Dragon King. Dropping her off literally in the air wasn't part of the deal. That was just an attempted murder. Impressive. A male voice called out before clapping echoed in the clouded sky. Damari looked up into sky blue eyes and white blue hair. The boy in front of her could be no older than eleven, yet he emanated power. You are. Oh, yes. Forgive my lack of introduction. I'm wind spirit named Storm, your new sensei. Pleased to make your acquaintance. Oh, my name's Tamari. I know. The Kinoichi was taken aback at this. How? He grinned at her. Do you really think I'd take on a human as an apprentice without knowing at least their name? Bahamut gave it to me when he requested I do this. Naruto's cool, so I accepted in helping one of his brides, as long as she gives him strong children. Damari blushed and almost lost the jutsu. She turned her face away to hide her blush in vain effort, as Storm laughed at her. Hana was not happy. Not at all. First, she had been dumped into a giant lump of snow, and now she's wandering the mountains when a blizzard decided to make her day so much better. She hated that dragon. She turned the corner and saw a cave which she quickly wandered into. Unfortunately, she didn't know that the cave had a hole for a floor. She fell straight down and landed on her butt. Unfortunately for her, this place was just as cold as the outside. She opened her eyes and was taken aback in awe. The whole room was filled with diamonds and crystals. As she looked around, her eyes landed on a teenager with white hair, white skin, and white eyes. She looked albino, but was more like the embodiment of snow. Hello, young one. The girl spoke, her voice echoing off the gems. Hello. You must be the spirit I'm to learn from. Yes, I'm an ice spirit, Tanya. I do hope we can get along. Ice? Hmm, I like that. So, when do we start? Tanya smiled at her eagerness which reminded her of Naruto when they first met. Soon. First, let's get you somewhere warm. You'll be used to the cold soon, but for now, come. Thank you. Hana shouted, desperately wanting warmth. So drawled Naruto as he stared at the pissed off Zabuza before him. Mind telling me why you were destroying the forest? Zabuza growled. It messed up my sense of direction. Some sort of strange magnetic pull or something. You mean you got lost? I don't get lost, you brat. Is that any way to talk to your cage? Zabuza growled. I don't get lost. Naruto smiled. Sure sure. Zabuza blushed before he huffed and stomped towards the kitchen to grab some of Tazuna's sake. Naruto shook his head and lay down onto the couch, relaxing while wondering how the girls were doing. He knew that once the training started, they'd be cursing Bahamut's name for all eternity. Kit. 
Naruto smiled at that familiar voice in his head. Kaiubi. It's been a while you fuzzball. Naruto grinned as Kaiubi growled lowly, muttering about ungrateful, disrespectful brats with a scowl. So, what do I owe this honor? Kaiubi. I have some news, Kit, but I don't know if you like it. I certainly don't, but you. What's wrong, Kaiubi? Before I begin, even I thought him to be dead so you weren't lied to. That damn reaper probably just messed with everyone because she likes to do that because being eternal gets boring, I know this firsthand. Kaiubi, please. Well, I think he's alive. In a coma because it's faint, but alive. Who? Who, Kaiubi? Who? Minato Namek is, your father. Naruto nearly had a heart attack. If he was Saratobi's age, he just might have. D-Dad is. Where? A few miles from here, the next town over towards the north. Zabuza. I'm leaving for a while. You're in charge. What? Bellowed Zabuza. What'll I tell dear old dad of a dragon then, huh? If it's not something he likes I'm going to end up in the ground again. Tell him that I'll be right back. He shouted as he ran out the door, ignoring Zabuza's that's not good enough yells. You sure this is the place, Kaiubi? Naruto asked as he wandered through the small bustling village. It was one of those small peaceful ones that usually avoid war and have no ninja around, mostly a trade village. Yep. I'd know that powerful aura of your yandame anywhere. I still hate the man and I always will for sealing me. I like you, hate your pops. Deal with it. Naruto shook his head in mild amusement. Whatever, Kaiu. Naruto walked into the small hospital, a little wary. If this was true, what would he tell his father? He had tried so hard to protect the village and trusted them. What would he do when he found out that the village, including his prized student, ignored his last request and tried to murder him countless times? Beside. The truth. He would have to tell the truth. He wasn't about to see his dad for the first time and lie to him, but how should he treat him? He'd never truly had a dad before. Bahamut was a good father, but dragons and humans treat their young differently. He slowly walked up to the lady at the front desk. She turned to look at him with a slightly annoyed expression on her face. Yes. She asked in a sickly sweet voice. Oh, how he hated hospitals in this world. The ones in Fiori were fine. They were kind and didn't smell like sick and old people. It smelled like magic and flowers. He still didn't understand how though. Um, I'm looking for a man who looks a lot like me, minus the scars on my cheeks of course. I think he's my dad. The woman's eyes widened for a second. Akio-sensei. She screeched toward the back causing Naruto covered his sensitive ears. Though she wasn't as bad as Sakura when she screeched, screeching still hurt. The man with a stubbed chin walked out with a lazy expression on his face, but everything about him radiated professional. Naruto smiled. Though the man didn't look it, he could tell that this man was the best as they come. What? He asked in a firm tone that had an I just woke up sound to it. She nodded towards Naruto. Think we got an ID on the blonde John Doe. You know, the one that's been in a coma. The doctor's eyes widened like the nurse. He looked at Naruto and examined him for a moment before nodding. All right, come with me. Naruto nodded and followed him throughout the white halls. The doctor didn't say anything, but the blonde could feel he hopeful anxiety radiating off the man. Soon, they came to a room. This is it. Take your time. Naruto nodded and walked in, shutting the door behind him. He nearly cried. Before him, in a coma, was the Yande Minato Namek is Naruto's father. He bit his lower lip and walked over to him and sat down on a chair, looking straight into the face of the man who sealed his fate long ago, yet he didn't hate him. He lifted his fingers hesitantly and wiped some blonde hair from the Yandame's face. He really did look a lot like an older Naruto. He smiled slightly at the warm touch, proving that this man was real and not another one of Naruto's dreams. Kaiubi. What, Kit, I was sleeping. How do I wake him up? The Nine Tails snorted. And why should I tell you? I hate the man with all my demonic being. I would rather him be in this coma forever and die pitifully. Please, Kaiubi this would mean a lot to me. Kaiubi groaned. You're lucky I see you as my kid. You owe me for this, brat. Naruto smiled. Sure. He spoke aloud with a smile, looking longingly at his father who he'd soon meet. We'll need blood. Naruto nodded and bit his thumb, letting the red flow. Focus your and my chakra into it and make sure it enters the damn man's mouth. The pest should wake up after that. Naruto nodded and did exactly what he was told. He pulled his thumb away from the cold lips and watched, hoping, praying that this would work. Just when he thought he failed, the Yandame's hand flinched, causing Naruto's face to light up. He watched as the man groaned and slowly sat up, clutching his head. He blinked and looked around, seemingly confused before his eyes landed on Naruto. Not sure what to do, Naruto let a small smile play on his lips. The next thing he knew, he was in a tight embrace. He stiffened but slowly wrapped his arms around the man's back, not used to this, and not really sure what to do. 
Sure, Urza hugged him, but she knew to make sure he knew what she was doing to do his caution to touch. Naruto that is you, right? Yeah. He pulled back and looked at the man hopefully. You're my dad, right? The fourth Naruto's eyes, his brows knitting together. You weren't told. Naruto let sadness flow into his eyes as he shook his head. I found out when I was 12 and not from anyone in the village. I'll need to speak to that old geezer. He's dead. Minato looked at his son in shock, still holding him around the shoulders. He didn't want to let him go, not yet. Though he was in a coma, he could feel every day pass like he was awake, only he'd sit in darkness and wait day and night, unable to sleep. So, for him, it felt like an eternity since he saw his child. A while ago, Orochimaru turned traitor and established a village. He attacked three years ago and killed the old man. Tsunade Bachan is Hokage now. Minato's lips twitched. She is, is she? So, how's the village been treating you? Like a hero, yes. You have me to thank for that. He smiled brightly, but it faded when he saw the look on his son's face. What's wrong? Dad, they ignored your request. What are you talking about? Naruto opened his mouth a few times before sighing and placing two fingers on his father's forehead and closed his eyes. This was a trick he learned from the Kaiubi while he was taught jutsu. Since the demon was locked up, he had to use an alternative way to show the blonde child the technique. Naruto's memories flowed into the older man. Memories from his childhood, from the beatings, to the assassination, to the comforting talks with Kaiubi, to Kakashi's betrayal, and his meeting with the goddesses and his new village, flashed before the Yandame's eyes. Naruto was glad he didn't have the scars from his childhood. He had to make a mental knot to thank Kaiubi that he didn't scar. When he pulled his fingers away, Minato's face was in pure rage. Killer intent filled the room. Now, if Naruto was any lesser than cage level, he would have been shaking and fainting, but he was thankful he was stronger and didn't feel the effects. I can't believe I saved that place. He hissed with great venom, a Rasengan slowly forming in his free hand that wasn't wrapped protectively around Naruto who once again unwillingly flinched, causing Minato's anger to rise even more. I'll Rasengan them to their next life, especially Kakashi. I can't believe he was my student. I'll crucify him and make him eat his eyes and balls. Ooh, I still don't like him, but I like his way of thinking. Go Minato. Kit, why don't you just let me out? He and I can deal with them together. How about it? You won't even get your hands dirty so to speak. And what would happen after Kano has destroyed? Killing spree. The demon announced happily, a large toothy smile forming onto his foxy lips. Naruto sighed and looked up at his growling father. Dad, the man turned to him with a now gentle expression. I'm going to destroy Kanoha, even if you side with that village. I don't want to be enemies, but will you side with them or me? I'd like to know. I will not blame you if you side with the village you grew up in. Minato scoffed. Isn't it obvious? Why would I side with a village that nearly killed you, betrayed us both, and lied to my wife about you living? There's no way I'm on their side. I'm with you all the way. Naruto smiled brightly at the man holding him. Thanks. Now, when am I gonna meet these wives of yours? I'm glad you read my note about rebuilding the clan. Do you like having a harem, my boy? He asked with a mischievous grin. Naruto chuckled. I hate that word, it makes me feel like Hiro Senen. The young Raikid shivered. I like to refer to it as a big family instead. Minato smiled at him. All right. Let's go. I want to meet these girls, get some exercise, and practice my Rasengan to put a hole those civilian chests. You do know that they're probably gonna cry about you not being on their side, yes? The Yandane grinned sadistically. I laugh at them like how they laughed at you. Yes, yes. Rip out their inside and feed them to the crocs, stab their brains and let their blood flow. Rip out their tongues and shove them down their throats, letting them choke on blood and flesh. Let them feel the agony of calling for help with no one coming. Watch them cower like a king as their feeble lives fade from their eyes, and. Ignoring the ranting fox, Naruto had the same smile on his face, though his was slightly influenced by the Kaiubi, and they both started laughing, slightly evilly. That's the sound and look that Dr. Akio saw when he came in. It made him shiver and yet astonished that this man was up and moving like he wasn't in a coma for 15 years. An hour later, father and son were heading back to the wave. Everyone, besides the Angel Six, was sitting in Tazuna's living room, talking and laughing. Every once in a while, Urza or Haku would touch their bellies, as if it would cause the baby to move. Tazuna, while constantly getting scolded by Tsunami, had brought out the liquor. Suddenly, Zabuza who was sleeping on the couch, jumped ten feet in the air and slammed against the floor face first, startling everyone. Zabuza-san. What's wrong? Haku asked, slightly worried. Hucking, son of a bitch. He screeched, looking slightly afraid at the chakra signature that was constantly getting closer. There's no way in hell he's alive. Boo. 
Before he could answer, the door opened and Naruto and an older Naruto walked in, both with almost identical smiles, only Naruto's was more fox-like. Zabuza gaped and slightly shook. Why why yandame hokage? The room broke out into gasps. Wasn't he dead? Everyone, meet my father. Naruto proclaimed proudly. Yo. Zabuza nearly fainted, sputtering incoherent syllables. W wa wa. The two blondes laughed at him. Yami decided she was bored and didn't want my soul. She placed me into a coma and threw me into a random spot in the elemental nations. Naruto raised an eyebrow at his father before chuckling. That sounds just like her. Mouths were still agape. Please, shut your mouths. You'll catch a bug. Urza stood and walked over to the man and looked him up and down, feeling the power coming from him she smiled and held out her hand. Minato-sama, I'm Urza Scarlet, Naruto's first wife. The man smiled and took her hand. A redeed. Why do Namikazes always fall for redeeds? He asked himself more than anyone else as the woman bowed politely. Haku stood and bowed next to Urza. I'm his second wife, Haku. He bowed back. Minato sighed for a moment before pulling the two girls into a hug, causing them to squeak. He pulled away with a grin gracing his features. You know, we're family now. Hugging isn't illegal, and bowing is too formal. The girls blushed and quickly fled back to the couch. Zabuza slowly sat up and stared at the man in awe before bowing. He had always admired the man before him greatly and was saddened when he was told he died protecting Kanoha from the Kaiubi. And you are? The Yandane kindly asked. Zabuza, demon of the mist, sir. Missing Nin turned Dragon Nin. He said, pointing to his dragon headband. Minato's face lit up as he pulled out his Kanoha hit aid and, I think it's right this time, from his cloths, took a kunai and slashed across it. He looked at his son with a smile who reached into his cloths and pulled out a duplicate of the ones Abusa and Haku wore. The Yandane quickly tied it onto his forehead. And now, so am I. That moment, Bahamut walked in as tall and proud as ever. The two men quickly caught each other's eyes and stared at each other for what seemed like a century before Bahamut spoke. Yandane. Dragon King. It was a simple exchange that caused many to sweat drop. I see you've been retrieved by my son. My son? Minato corrected. They glared at each other, having an inward battle over fatherly rights for the one named Naruto. Naruto was, of course, oblivious to the exchange as was Urza. The rest of the room was amused and smiled. All right, I have some business to attend to. I'll be right back, Daddy nodded towards Minato. Father. Towards Bahamut. The two didn't hear, their glares still locked on each other, however, the others in the room nodded towards him. Naruto stepped outside and stretched for a moment before shouting Nora. The large sky blue and black dragon appeared before the dragon prince. This dragon was slightly larger than both Kuro and Shiro. Naruto smiled at him. Nora, can you do something for me? Nora smirked. From massacres to jumping into a volcano, to messages, my prince. Naruto nodded approvingly and tossed a large sack towards the dragon who raised a scaly eyebrow. This is. Your mission. Listen, I need a message delivered to the Hyuga compound. In the compound of the Hyugas, anxiety was at full notch. Tsunade, herself, was starting to walk circles, grumbling to herself. It had been a week and all the important figureheads of the rebellion were there. The clan heads, herself, Jiraiya, Ibiki and Aruka. She took a swig of her sacrite before a giant dragon appeared before them, with what seemed to be a mocking smirk directed at them. Tsunade already didn't like this dragon and wanted to punch him to next Saturday. Maggots, the dragon began, causing everyone to flinch. I have been sent by my prince for your answer. Tsunade huffed. Isn't it obvious? We've agreed to join. We want this corrupt village to fall. I've had enough of the childish arguments with the council, going at Chiha this and at Chiha that. The dragon nodded approvingly. He flicked his clawed foot at them, and a large bag fell before them, landing right next to the Nara head who didn't move a muscle, deciding that yawning was best in that situation. The ashy Hyuga, not interested in waiting for the lazy Nara, walked from the other side of the room to the bag and opened it. Inside was around a hundred dragon nin headbands. He nodded towards the dragon before handing them to Tsunade who looked. Thank you. We will hand these out in the next meeting. The plan is simple. Spoke the dragon. At the end of the Chunin exams, Prince Naruto will stand and shout it's time for judgment. And the battle will begin. Attack all those of Konoha, no one else. They will be our allies. Only Konoha. Understand. The room nodded. Fully. Spoke Tsunade. Nora nodded. Clans shall be offered a place in Ryugakur. Though your homes will probably be destroyed, don't fret. Take all your most wanted possessions and seal them to put back into a newly built clan house. With each clan's help, we can rebuild an exact replica of your old homes. The clan heads smiled and bowed their heads at the dragon. We accept. They said simultaneously. 
My prince also wants to know how the so-called duck butt team prick and the pink banshee howler monkey are doing. Snickers and scowls filled the room. The little bastard is being spoiled. Shibi Abiram spoke, surprising everyone. Abiram rarely speak let alone curse. The ashy nodded. He's demanding for our clan's secrets and for our daughters. Luckily, we sent them away because the council is demanding for them to return to help rebuild the Ache. Like I'd ever let my daughters near him. Aruka sighed. He's much worse than three years ago. After being defeated by Naruto, he's talking about murdering the brat and demanded for the Namikas and Yuzumaki clan's secrets when he found out Naruto's identity. Luckily, all those scrolls disappeared much to his disappointment. The dragon smirked and they all knew where they disappeared to. And the pink thing. Worse. They all groaned. Louder. More annoying. Demanding. She had the gall to demand that I, the Hokage, to teach her to help beat the demon brat and help Sasuke have strong babies. She even went to the council and, of course, I refused much to their displeasure. She's more ugly. Shibi muttered, causing snickers. Very well, thank you for the report. Nora said. Now, I best be on my way. Wait. He ashy spoke. The dragon turned to face him. The council is demanding that Hanabi marry the Achiha boy since Hanada vanished. Please, he bowed onto the floor, surprising everyone. He ashy never bowed to anyone. Please take her to Naruto for protection. I beg of you. He spoke as said girl was ushered in by a branch member, looking absolutely miserable at the order to marry the prick. She had small rings under her eyes to show that she was afraid to sleep, afraid that someone would sneak into her room and take her away. The dragon faintly smiled. I don't think my master will have any qualms with it. Climb on my back little one and don't let go whatever you do. She nodded and looked at her father. Hiyashi-sama, I. Quiet, Hanabi. After this war is over, we won't have any of these old traditions. The elders will be gone as well as caged bird seal. Call me father or dad from now on, okay? Tell Hinata that as well. Her eyes lit up in tears and nodded, quickly hugging her dad before climbing onto the large reptile. Bye. She spoke in barely a whisper. And with that, the dragon disappeared in flames. Naruto had to admit, he was surprised when Hanabi showed up at Tazuna's with the explanation and report from Nora, causing him to growl. He knew that Sasuke would probably get worse, but not this bad. Sakura well, he can't say he didn't expect it. Hanabi seemed to smile more than he'd ever seen her do in the village, which made him smile in return. After all, she was going to be his sister-in-law soon. He didn't want his sister-in-law to be depressed, that just goes against everything he stood for. Plus, Hinata would probably murder him as she was. Speaking of Hinata, she and the other brides have been training for a week now. Naruto wondered how they were faring. From sparing with the spritz, he knew that they didn't go easy. Shaking the unpleasant and painful memories from his head, he relaxed under the blue sky. He was approximately a mile away from Tazuna's and could finally get some fresh air. Despite telling them otherwise, Bahamut and Minato thought they had to compete for fatherly rights over him, which turned the air around the home quite thick and uncomfortable. Now, however, he was finally able to clear his head and think. He had been pondering about reviving the Sound Five. Not all of them of course, but Kamimro. He was a strong ally, one that had the potential to surpass Orochimaru, and the deceased snake bastard knew it and gave him that fatal disease. Which, without knowing the complete gist of the virus he doubted he could heal him completely. Despite the abilities Kami gave him, he had to understand what he was doing when dealing with an injury which he found quite difficult. The twig snapping caught his attention and he quickly snapped up, kunai in hand and eyes sharp. He scanned the wooded area and his eyes landed on a figure not too far off of him. His eyes widened. Wah. Wow. Banko collapsed onto the ground, panting. She was covered in cuts, bruises, burn marks, poison marks, and her own blood. She lifted up her head to glare at her sensei who was smiling down at her clearly amused. What's wrong, little snake? Tired already? Khan mocked. Has only a week of my training broken you? Pathetic. You have no right to call yourself Naruto's bride. That caused something to snap within her. She growled and shakily stood up before standing straight and unmoving, trying to contact her life's energy with closed eyes. A twisted smile formed onto Khan's face. His eyes widened when she started to glow purple. He smiled and licked his lips, intertwining his energy with hers, said girl oblivious to what was going on around her. You really are pathetic. He said, slashing an arm with his nails, trying to distract her. I don't know what Naruto sees in you. You're just a freaky little girl with a freaky personality. Who would ever love you? She started trembling, blood coming from her cuts. She bit her lower lip, trying to block out the insane spirit's voice that seemed to affect her so much. Maybe I should talk to Naruto. After all, he's my friend. I'll tell him you aren't worthy, strong enough, or good enough for him. He'll drop you like yesterday's lunch. Right, student of Arachimaru. 
you see, that's what I do. Her eyes snapped open, glowing a sinister purple as her life energy started sucking in his unconsciously. His simile broadened and started laughing. He pulled away after, having transformed her energy into pure poison. Don't she growled out, her fists clenching till they bled. Assume that she clenched her teeth, her energy starting to waver. Naruto would ever she looked at him. Be like you. Her energy spiked, flying everywhere and poisoning all the plants causing them to wither and melt. Khan stuck out his hands and laughed. Yes. Excellent. Anko started to feel weak. Slowly, her eyelids drifted together. Her energy receded and she started to fall. Khan was instantly at her side and caught her, laying the out-cold girl down onto the ground. Well done, little snake, well done indeed. He whispered to her. And, even though she was unconscious, a small smile formed onto her lips. Blaze winced again as Eno screamed. She had gotten better, true, but being shocked by lightning bolt after lightning bolt would bound to be painful. Eno shut her mouth and gritted her teeth. She had to be strong. For Naruto. When the lightning receded, she slumped to the ground. Blaze walked towards her. Better. He said. But not yet. Stand up. We'll do this till you no longer feel the pain of electricity. She grunted and nodded, slowly standing up and taking in a deep breath. Blaze's hands lit up and lightning fell onto her once again. Blaze couldn't admit that he wasn't impressed. He was, very in fact. For a human, she had been getting used to lightning faster than anyone else he'd ever seen. Between himself, he was secretly enhancing the lightning's juice every time he struck her. She'd be able to handle most lightning now no sweat, but he didn't want most. He wanted it to be all. No lightning or electricity to ever hurt her. Blaze was surprised that she wasn't screaming this time. Yes, she was gritting her teeth again, but that's much better than screaming. He watched as her features slowly softened until it was a peaceful look, and her hair flowed about her as if she was swimming, it was an exotic sight. He smiled and called off the lightning, and she fell to the ground, breathing heavily. He clapped and walked over to her, kneeling down. You did good. She smiled at him. And I must say that you looked absolutely sexy when lightning strikes you. Pervert. She grumbled. He chuckled. We're ready to go to the next step. We'll start tomorrow. She smiled once again before everything went black. Lily smiled at her charge. It seemed Hinata was perfect for the water element. She had already become one with the water and could breathe it, much to her surprise. Right now, the girl was working on healing and pulling water out of thin air was the next step. Healing with water was different than chakra as it was more effective. It healed completely and never ran out unlike chakra. Water healed anything, death was the only thing out of its reach. Once again, the water spirit slid a large gash into Hinata's skin, causing her to wince. Again. She spoke. The high Uga nodded and glowing water encircled her hand. She held it up to her wound and concentrated, and it slowly started to heal. Lily nodded. The girl was a genius, a strong one at that as well. Another smile found its way onto her lips. She couldn't help but think Naruto picked a perfect bride. Come on, princess, stop the rock. Tora shouted as another boulder started falling down a cliff towards the sweating, panting, bruised Tintin. Tora had been teaching her that to control the earth, one must be like the earth. Strong and unmoving. Tintin strained her ears to listen. Her weapons wouldn't help her this time. Remembering the last lesson. Feel the earth, she stopped straining her ears. When she felt a large vibration, she stuck out her palm forward and hit something before it crumbled away. There was silence before there was cheering. Good job, princess. Tintin removed her blindfold and looked around for the rock. She looked down onto to find it in pieces, and her eyes widened before smiling and jumping for joy. Yes. She celebrated. Hold up, princess, not yet. You still have a long way to go. As if to prove her point, she snapped her fingers, and at least twenty boulders appeared behind the spirit, causing Tintin's heart to stop. Now put that blindfold back on and let's start. Tintin felt faint. Their wind control has improved greatly. Storm said to Tamari as they walked along a cloud. For a human, I'm impressed. Tamari wrinkled her nose at that hidden insult. I'll have you know, Naruto is human as well. Storm shook his head. I wasn't mocking your kind. I was simply stating that humans usually don't have such great control on wind. She blushed at her assumption. Plus, technically, Naruto is greater than human, but whatever. He shrugged his shoulders. He led her over to the edge of the cloud. What'll I learn now? Wind control is different among different situations. He answered. During the calm is easiest and during the rage it isn't. The rage has many different categories. Desperation, danger, helplessness, extreme anger, you get the idea. You're great with the calm category, so we're working on the rage category now. How? He smiled sinisterly. She didn't like that smile at all. It usually meant she was going to get hurt. Like this. He said, pushing her off the cloud. As she fell, she looked up and saw him waving at her with a smile. 
She screamed as she came crashing down through the air. She started to reach for her fan, but remembered that Storm has torn it up, saying that using a fan was cheating. For a moment, she felt helpless. She tried to call the wind to her, but it never came which confused her. She tried again, more desperate this time as her speed kept picking up and picking up. Storm watched as she fell. Maybe I should help her now. Nah. Let's give her some more time. She remembered what Storm had said. Wind control during the rage category was harder to control. It hit her. She needed to be calm. She took in a deep breath and relaxed herself and closed her eyes. Seeing this from afar, Storm let a smile crease his lips. Damari slowly raised her hands and called the winds towards her. Slowly, she felt herself slow until she was at a stop and floating in the air. She opened her eyes and smiled, willing herself to rise up towards the cloud Storm was on. I'm. Gonna. Kill she never got the chance to finish as she was pulled into a tight hug by her sensei. Wonderful job. I never thought you'd actually get it the first time. Perfect. His kissed each cheek giddily before bouncing away. Her anger forgotten, she touched her cheeks and smiled at the rare praise. She was becoming of use to Naruto ever so slowly, but surely. Hana cursed the winter, she cursed the ice, she cursed her sensei, and she cursed Bahamut for this. Yes, she'd become immune to the cold, yes she was slowly becoming one with ice, yes she was doing great in her training, but that didn't mean she hated it. Oh no, she loathed it. Right now, she was frozen in a block of ice courtesy of Tanya, who was currently in the corner petting a polar bear and reading a book with a smile on her face. She had told Hana that they were going to make her one with the ice today, make her its messenger, its controller, ice in human form. She had no idea that she was going to be literally frozen. She growled, but it was muffled by the ice. Hatching the faint sound, Tanya looked over at her student who managed to glare. Hana, sweetie, don't look at me like that. Feel the ice. Listen to its tune. Feel it melt and harden, feel it move. Now, don't interrupt my reading until you got it. She turned away from her charge. Hana, with no choice but to listen lest she be stuck in the ice for the rest of eternity, closed her eyes and relaxed. Slowly, she heard a strange sound. Realizing it was water running through the ice, she let go like the water and quickly realized that Tanya was right about ice having a tune. The ice cracking, moving, settling, and water running inside and outside of it made a gentle and soft tune that made Hana feel at peace. Slowly she pulled up her hands and found that she could for some reason. Seeing this, Tanya put down her book. Hana touched the shell of the ice, letting the coolness fill her pores and cells. She felt her body glow and didn't notice her hair turned white. She smiled and pushed on the shell of the ice, shattering it and fell to the floor. The glowing stopped and her hair returned to brown. Tanya calmly got up and walked to her charge's side and helped her up. Wonderful, young one, wonderful. Tanya smiled at the compliment. Thank you. She said. Tanya nodded. Let's go have some tea. Tomorrow your training intensifies now that you're one with the ice. For the first time since Hana became immune to the cold, she shivered. Back in the Whirlpool village, all was peaceful. People had just learned of their cage's child's planned invasion. Ninjas were already begging to help. They'd heard of what they did to their cage's son and were disgusted. Suddenly, a shout of both anger and joy broke out, and the cage's desk flew through the window, nearly landing on some civilians. They all looked towards the cage tower, shrugged, then once again started business. Ashina was both mad and overly overjoyed at the moment. The cause. Danzo had vanished. Disappeared, was completely under the radar. Her spies in Kanoha had just confirmed this. She was angry at him, so angry she wanted to grab the nearest Anbu and rip his head off. But she was also happy, happy that the fool had finally been taken off of the council. She was also frustrated that she probably wouldn't get the chance to destroy him herself, which caused her to let out another shriek of fury. The Anbu in the room flinched back as she started chuckling to herself. It was as they feared. She was crazy. Then again, she was the Red Death. Not to mention a female Yuzumaki. Inheritor of the Yuzumaki rage. Yep, she was someone to be feared. FK clutched her bleeding arm and sighed as she ran further and further away from Takigakur. She couldn't stand that place any longer. They treated her like mud, no lower than mud. If it weren't for Nanabi, the seven tails sealed inside of her, she'd have long given up or gone insane. Nanabi kept her alive all these years, and she wasn't about to let the Bijuu's efforts go to waste so easily. When she had been assigned a mission near the border of the wave, she had been inwardly jumping for joy at the chance to finally escape. But, her cage, who referred to himself as her owner, had run his fingers over the seals on her neck, showing her escape wouldn't be wise. If the cage felt like it, she'd be dead at the snap of his fingers. But no, she was too powerful and valuable to the village to be killed. She'd just feel pain oh so much pain. 
when she reached the border, she had gone against the other Taki ninja and fled, but not before receiving some injuries herself which Nanabi was having a difficult time healing because of her constant movement. She knew she couldn't stop. She had to get far enough away so that when the other shinobi returned the seal wouldn't be as strong due to the distance between her and the activation. Her vision was already starting to see black spots due to blood loss, and she cursed under her breath, forcing her numb legs to keep running at top speed despite her body's protests. Keep pushing yourself, FK Chan. Nanabi whispered encouragingly in her gentle tone. Just a little further and you'll be relatively safe. A small smile stretched across her lips. Freedom was so close she could almost taste it. Suddenly, pain racked her body. She screamed and bit her lower lip, causing blood to fall from it. He hand cradling her injuries, shot up and clutched her neck as the seal revealed itself in an angry glowing red color. Tears spilled out of her eyes at their own accord as her screams quieted to whispers. She had to be quiet so their chance at finding her would be less likely. Nanabi can't you do something? She inwardly gasped as she staggered towards an opening in the thick woods, the pain growing intense due to what she thought was her cage's anger and frustration. FK Chan Nanabi whispered her silent apology with slight anger in her voice. She wasn't angry at her vessel, but at those humans that dared to call her FK Chan, her baby a monster. Sweetie, there's a chakra signature up ahead. FK's eyes widened in panic. A talking ninja. Here. She felt desperation claw at her insides. What would they do to her when they caught her? She had once just gone out for a walk, but the village thought she was trying to escape, and a Nanabi couldn't heal her for days she choked on her breath as she staggered faster. She didn't want to know what they would do when she had truly tried to escape this time. No, it's not a shinobi from Takigakur I've never felt such a signature before. Head towards it sweetie, it's our only chance. Nodding as more tears of pain and panic fell down her tan cheeks, she headed towards the signature, praying to any deity, any god, any almighty figure that even bothered to listen to a Jinchuriki that it belonged to someone friendly, strong, and helpful. As she entered a clearing, she felt the finalities of consciousness fade from her. Don't worry. I'll protect you. Rest. D thanks Nanabi. She thought as she fell towards the ground. What was the last thing she heard? So, let me get this straight, Tazuna said as he looked down at the green-haired girl laying in one of the guest beds. You were just minding your own business when out of nowhere this girl appears and collapses. Naruto nodded. Yep, that's the gist of it. Sighing, the drunk shook his head and headed for the door. You and your little adventures will kill me one day. Not before the alcohol. Grumbled Naruto as he examined the girl. It looks like she's had it rough. Minato stated, examining the cuts, bruises and badly healed fractures with expert eyes. Pulling up her shirt to look for more injuries, he saw a sequence on her belly. She's a Jinchuriki too. Naruto's eyes narrowed. Her village probably did this. He hissed, knowing full well how people viewed and treated Jinchuriki. I'm willing to bet she was running away from them. Nodding, the Yandame sighed. I'm no expert with a human body like Haku is, but judging from the scars she's been treated just as bad as you. Naruto flinched at that. Scars. Even with Kyuubi's chakra some didn't heal. The worst of the worst, ones that would probably kill you ten times over would never heal even if you were a Jinchuriki. Hey dad. Hmm. Could you go find Haku for me? Sure. The Yandame agreed, standing up and heading out the door. Hey Kyuubi. What? I've got a Jinchuriki here. Can you tell me who she holds? A Jinchuriki? I go to sleep for five minutes and while I'm dreaming you find yourself a Jinchuriki. Sometimes I wonder if more than just Kami, Tozi, and Yami like you. There's Jashin, he treats me like a little brother, and there's. It was a rhetorical question, Kit. Kaiubi rolled his eyes in exasperation. The kid could tame gods like an Inuzuka could tame a dog. You want me to identify the demon, correct? Naruto nodded. Yeah. After a few moments of silence, Kaiubi started laughing. Nanabi. You found Nanabi's vessel. Didn't think I'd be seeing her anytime soon. Nanabi that's the seven tails correct? Naruto pondered as he looked at the girl's pain-ridden face. Why is she in so much pain? He wondered to himself. Nanabi is the delinquent of the Biju. She's a caring creature she is. Despite her power she's sweet, kind, peace-loving. So, the complete opposite of you. He summarized. Correct. She always gets on my nerves. Don't do this, that's not nice, have some compassion, don't insult the humans, don't this don't that, blah, blah, blah. I can't tell you how nice it is not hearing her and her talk about kindness. Though she's powerful and can be quite scary and sadistic when she's angry well, let's just say not seeing her is a perk about being sealed inside someone. Naruto rolled his eyes. He'd have preferred having the Nanabi sealed inside of him than the Kaiubi. True, the two had gotten attached to each other over the years, but he could do without Kaiubi's lust for blood, death, and massacres. You don't seem to like her very well. 
I hate her, not as much as I hate the Yandane though. Ichibi, on the other hand, hates her with all his demonic being. He's worse than me when it comes to blood and slaughter, and she always gets on his case. And, because she's stronger than him, he can't do anything about it, it's sometimes fun to watch two Kaiubi spoke, drifting off into a memory. Naruto smirked at the last comment. That psycho versus a demonic saint yeah, it would be interesting to watch. He focused his eyes back onto the pain girl. It wasn't her injuries, they were nearly healed thanks to Nanabi. So, maybe it was something internal. No, Nanabi would have healed those first. Think, Naruto, think. He pushed himself. What were some of the things Zeratobi prevented from happening to him because he was a Jinchuriki? Being turned into a mindless weapon, being killed, being locked away, being turned into a baby machine and have his descendants join Root, get a loyalty seal placed on him, get a weight no. Growling, Naruto looked at a red neck and let Chakra seep into it. Just as a seal appeared Chakra surrounded the girl and stabbed itself through his hand as a warning. While still glaring at the seal on the girl's neck, he remained calm and still. Don't worry, Nanabi. I won't hurt her she's like me. The chakra calmed at that, but didn't disappear. It removed itself from his now bleeding hand which Kaiubi quickly healed for him. Pushing more chakra into her neck his growling grew even more feral when it came into full view. Hucking sons of bitches. The squeak from the door caused him to look over to see a startled Haku and confused Minato in the door. Naruto's glare didn't diminish and gestured for Minato to come look. When the man got a look at what had unleashed Naruto's ire, he glared and cursed as well. What's wrong? Haku asked. We got ourselves a loyalty seal. Snarled the Yandane. What exactly is a loyalty seal? She asked. The loyalty seal is just that, a seal that ensures the loyalty of one to another. The Sandane kept one from being placed on me so I couldn't go against the village. Naruto said softly. If you disobey an order, fail one, or simply displease them, they can force you through indescribable pain so you won't do it again. If it's activated for a long period of time you will die and it's not a peaceful death. Now, it was Haku's turn to curse as she realized why she was brought here. She immediately started to examine the girl when the chakra started to get more intense. I won't hurt her. Haku assured, not even stopping her examination. Do you know of a way to disable it? I may be a seal master, but I've never seen a loyalty seal like this one. Naruto muttered, running his fingers over the complex design. Minato shook his head. Neither have I. I'd have to study it. Nodding, Naruto brought out a scroll and quickly drew an exact replica of the seal on the paper before rolling it up. Haku, please keep her alive as long as you can. I'll do my best, but I've never worked with a seal that's supposed to kill her. She said, not looking at them. I can't promise anything, but I can at least prolong her life by a few hours I think. Her voice was soft, successfully relaying the message to hurry. Outside of the room, Naruto turned to his father. Go visit mom. Minato raised an eyebrow at the tone of his son's voice. This wasn't a suggestion, it was a command. As much as I'd love to we have a dying girl in there. I can take care of it. I'm on par with you right now in seals. I can't visit with you because I'm a Jinchuriki too, I feel a connection to my fellow vessels and can't abandon them. Minato stared into Naruto's hard eyes before sighing. He had no choice it seemed. Alright, but if you need any help send a dragon. Of course, Naruto grinned. But, before you go, I have a present for you and mom. Eyeing his son with a childish gleam in his eyes, he said, what kind of present? Damn it. Naruto snarled as he threw the scroll to the floor. It had been four hours since he had started studying the seal, and he'd gained a total of zero progress. Whoever made this was either a genius in seals or stumbled upon it by just pure luck. Ayubi. What? Screaming like this will make me go deaf, kid. Do you know how to deactivate this seal? Naruto asked, focusing his eyes on the seal on the floor for the fox demon to see. The seal kit, what in the nine hells made you think that I know about seals? You're sealed. Your logic has left me speechless. Shudakai Ubi. Do you know how to or not? The king of Biju huffed. I have no knowledge of seals. I may have been sealed a few times, but I find seals in general a waste of my time. You know if you knew about seals you might have been able to avoid being sealed numerous times. Get back to your studying. That girl doesn't have much time left. The young Ryukage resisted the urge to roll his eyes at Kaiubi's change of subject. He knew that the demon was right. The girl should have died already, and it was only thanks to Haku that she was alive. Focusing his eyes back on the seal, he traced the design with his finger. He could heal death, this was true. He'd brought Haku and Zabuza back to life after all, but this kind of death is different. It wasn't of natural causes. The last time he'd tried to heal in a situation close to this one, he'd been in a coma for days. He knew he could just let her die and revive her later, but he'd be damned if he let that happen. He wasn't heartless, he wouldn't let her suffer both this pain and death, only to be revived again. 
he was missing just one thing, just one little piece that was decisive to unraveling the whole thing and bringing the girl back from the clutches of death. Impatiently tapping his finger on the table with an irritated beat, he wrinkled his nose and scowled at the seal design. His glaring ceased however when he saw something that made him pale. They didn't. Ashina stared at the man standing behind her desk in shock, her brain not working. It looked like no, he died. He's gone. They never found a body or it can't be her love, her husband, her sunshine. It had to be some cruel trick. It can't be Minato. She pulled out a kunai and took stance, ready to call her Anbu if needed. Is that really necessary, Kushi-chan? The man whined with a doggy pout. His eyes grew wide and watery and his lips stuck out. He was a master at this, only surpassed by his son. Kashina flinched. She only knew one man who could make such a face successfully. Still, she had to be sure. What did you do when I went on a two-month mission for the leaf? Well? Um, you see. Flashback. Extra food. Minato Namikas asked his wife at the front gate of Kanoha. Behind the two, five Anbu and Jurei watched, amused at the couple's antics. Yes, Kishina replied, adopting another tick mark. Clothes. Yes. First aid. Yes. Underwear. For Kami's sake, Minato. A red-faced Kishina shouted as the six behind them giggled, Jurei perversely. I'm fine. But, Kishina. I'll miss you. Crossing her arms, she turned away from her flaunting husband. You're the one who assigned me this mission, Minato. Now, let me leave. But. Minato. Sighing with a pout, the Yande nodded. Straightening herself up, Kishina bent down and placed a kiss on Minato's forehead. He looked up at her and she winked. Be back in two months, Mina Koi. And as she said that, she and her team vanished. Minato stared at the empty place before him before he fell to his knees and started weeping. I changed my mind, Kishina. I'll assign the mission to someone else. I miss Y.O.U. he cried. And Jurea couldn't hold it in any longer. He was on the ground as well, rolling around in laughter. Flashback end. Kishina sweat dropped at the pathetic man in front of her. He was tapping his fingers together while pouting. She shook her head and sighed, letting tears of joy fill her eyes. Slowly, she approached a man with open arms, and they immediately embraced before Minato took her face between his hands and kissed her. They would have stayed like that forever reunited and protected in one another's arms if the Anbu didn't decide that they wanted to speak with their cage. Stepping in, one began to talk, but paused when two glares were directed at him from two people who just parted. Seeing the Yandame his eyes widened before taking the hint and pushing the others out, shutting the door after him. Sighing, he looked at Kishina. The moment was ruined. He pouted. Playfully, slapping the back of his head, she looked at him in renewed sadness. How are you still alive? I thought she let her words trail off, biting her lower lip and staring at her husband. The Shinigami decided she didn't want my soul I guess. She put me to sleep and the next thing I know I'm waking up in a hospital with Naruto next to me. I never died. Reaching out to touch the man's chest as if to make sure it weren't a dream, she gave him a small smile. At least you didn't lie to me like Kanoha. Yes he said quite sadly. They have fallen quite low, haven't they? I'm so disappointed. What happened to the people filled with a will of fire and looking underneath the underneath like they're so proud of? He sighed and shook his head, not willing to speak on. We, and my village, are going to help Naruto, Mina-kun. She spoke. Whose side are you taking? Gushi-chan, I'm hurt. Do you think I'd take any wide besides my beautiful wife and child's? He spoke with a dashing grin, the same grin that had women of all ages swoon all over him back before Naruto was even born. Grinning back, she hugged him once more. Then let's go. I still have to ready my ninja and. Wait, he said causing her to look at him strangely before a squeak filled the room. He blushed since the squeak came from his direction before scratching the top of his head. Naruto gave me a present. You have one as well. Her eye slid up. A present from her baby. Well, where is it? Reaching into his pocket, the Yandame pulled out something in between his cuffed hands and held them out to her own held out hands. When his fingers opened, her eyes lit up. Placed into her hands was a red baby dragon that was looking at her with a tilted head and large eyes. This. I have one too. He said, showing the blue baby dragon that popped out of his hair. We raise them and train them, and they'll always be able to find Naruto. I hear they're excellent fighters and messengers. Hello little one, Kishina whispered to the dragon. What's your name? Opening its tiny mouth, a happy squeak came out causing her to beam. I'll call you Squeaky. Minato snorted but covered it up with a cough when her emerald gaze turned to him. The baby dragon wrinkled its nose showing its dislike. No. Well Luna. The baby dragon unfurled its wings and pranced happily. Oh Minato, isn't this just a lovely gift? Wonderful, now back to business. He said, raising a suggestive eyebrow. We don't have to go right away, do we? 
Smiling, she placed a baby dragon into her bag, grabbed Minato's wrist, and started dragging him out of the office. The Anbu jumped when their cage slammed the door open. Um lady. I'm taking the rest of the day off. She announced, running off while dragging the blonde man with her. All the poor Anbu could do was stare after them, bewildered. Aku glared at the seal on the girl's neck. Whatever she did to counter it, it always came back stronger than ever. It was really starting to piss her off. Truthfully, she wanted to just stab the girl's neck until the cursed things was gone from this planet, though the girl would die, and Naruto wouldn't like that him, life was just full of choices. Fucking idiots. This whole damn world is full of fucking idiots. She jumped at the demonic scream that echoed through the house, along with a quick burst of both Kaiubi and Naruto's chakra. She squeaked when the door slammed open to reveal a majorly pissed Naruto whose eyes had turned red. Unintentionally, she let out a whimper. Hearing the whimper was what was needed to calm Naruto down. He took in a deep breath and calmed his chakra, his eyes reverting back to blue, but he could not hold the hateful look from molting onto his face. What's wrong? The damn seal is the problem. Don't tell me you couldn't solve it. Don't need to. I already know that these people were idiots just by looking at it. He growled, slamming fist against the wall making it crack. They foolishly combined two seals blindly thinking it would make it stronger. I'm surprised the girl's even alive still. Haku's eyes widened. You mean? Yeah, even without activating the seal, it was killing her, and they probably didn't even care if they knew. They probably didn't even check to see if it was safe. Do you see why I hate this world so much? Haku narrowed her eyes. Can you do anything about it? I can. He stood up and cracked his knuckled. But I must warn you that I have no idea what I'm doing and will probably end up in a coma. Thus she grabbed his hand. Don't do anything stupid. He grinned and gave her a comforting squeeze. Understood. He kneeled before the bed. Nanabi, I'm gonna need your help. Though I have been given the ability to heal any injury I don't want to mess this up. Your vessel will be in pain. I need you to keep it at a minimum. My understanding of the seal is shaky at best, so I don't understand entirely how this will end up. Do you understand? As his answer, a soft yellowish orange started to coat the girl's body. He quickly made a sound barrier and turned to Haku. I'm staying here. She said stubbornly. You already said that you'll probably collapse. Turning back to the girl, his hand started to glow a soft blue-white. Then let's get started. He gently placed one around the girl's neck in a gentle yet firm grip and laid the other on the girl's stomach seal to help give Nanabi more freedom to help her vessel. And, as he expected, the girl started to unconsciously scream and flail. He grunted as a fist connected with his chest, still not moving his hand form her neck. Nanabi, keep her still. Almost instantly, the flailing lessened. Haku rushed over to keep the girl's hands pinned above her head. Unfortunately, the screaming didn't lessen. For Naruto's sensitive ears it was torture. He was sure they'd be ringing for days. He moved his eyes to the seal and quickly skimmed it. Shifting his hand a little bit he started to sink his fingers in. Haku, who had expected blood and tearing, didn't expect for the fingers to seep into the girl's skin with no damage. In fact, it looked like the world around his tan fingers rippled like when you threw a pebble into a pond. Despite how painless it looked, the girl's screams increased tenfold, and the great flailing started again, and the Nabi's chakra increased to try and keep her vessel calm. Shifting his weight to the hand on the girl's stomach, Naruto was able to help reduce it a little, but he still wished Nanabi could just stop it altogether. Hold her down Haku. Naruto whispered, already feeling himself go slightly faint. Many people don't realize it, but seals were some of the most powerful ninja arts. And, if someone messes one up even the tiniest bit, not only will it be a danger hazard, but it'll take a lot out of the healer and remover. Now, where he pondered. Playing with a seal even if it was perfect was like playing with a house of cards. Bump it just right and it will all fall down. In this case, the girl would probably die and who knows what else. He grinned when his fingers touched just the right spot. Found it. Encircling his fingers around the seal, he pulled back in a flash of white light, grunting at how much it tried to hang on. Haku watched, amazed and blocking out the girl's screams, as her husband pulled it from the girl like it was tape on a wall. The seal floated in the air for a while before fading from existence. Naruto collapsed to his hands and knees, gasping for breath. Haku was immediately at his side. You'd think an ability from Kami would make you invincible. Nothing's invincible Haku. He breathed. To heal something I must have an understanding of it at least. I didn't understand that seal very well so it's natural this will happen. I'm going to sleep now, okay? She nodded as he closed his eyes and leaned against her shoulder. Good night. After Naruto closed his eyes, the girl began to glow once again. A pulse of powerful chakra and a bright light caused Haku to shut her eyes and look away. When it grew dark behind her eyelids she opened them and gasped. Before her was a woman of beauty. 
She had long golden hair tipped with orange, her bangs pulled back into a braid that flowed down the center of her hair. She wore a form-fitting blue kimono with golden beetle designs. She crawled over to the unconscious girl's side and smiled down at her with soft green eyes. Who are you? Haku asked reaching for senbin needles just in case. The woman smiled kindly at her. I'm Nanabi. Rage. Hey everyone, yeah, sorry it's a little shorter than the rest. I got my test back and I did okay in measures of passing hate tests well, review. Anyway, ever heard of the challenger? Well, he or she gives out challenges and I took three. These are them with bad summaries you'll just have to check them out. King of the Abyss. When Naruto died, he didn't go to heaven, hell, or the Shinigami's belly. He ended up in the deepest and most dangerous corners of the ghost zone, where the weakest ghosts are pariah's level. Millennia later, he's their king and bored. When he senses a rip in the zone, he goes to investigate. Watch out Amity Park, Naruto's coming. I haven't posted any chapters of this yet, but will in a few days. Fox of the Sea. When Naruto was very young he met the Kaiubi and ran away after becoming a half-demon. He's trained by many besides Kaiubi and grows strong enough to be the first SSS rank ninja in the bingo book. At 18 years old, he leaves the elemental nations and meets Luffy who's near the beginning of his journey. How will this change the story? Like King of the Abyss I haven't posted anything yet but will in a few days. The Lightning Prince. Besides the nations of air, water, earth and fire, there's a third nation that the Fire Nation couldn't even conquer during Sozin's Comet. The Lightning Empire. Bending lightning in a way that firebenders can only dream of, their culture and abilities are unknown to the rest of the world. Naruto, Prince of the Lightning Empire, is also the chosen of the powerful spirit Kaiubi. What were to happen if he were to meet the avatar who wasn't blessed with the ability of lightning? I have one chapter up and will update soon. For the Lightning Prince, someone already reviewed that there's a story with a similar concept. I don't know if there is, but if so all I can say is oops. I've already accepted the challenge and started writing so I won't abandon it, and I'll keep writing it. Staring down at Naruto, FK studied his every crevice and muscle. She just couldn't understand why he had saved her. She was a Jinchuriki, a monster in the eyes of others. No one bothered with her well-being, no one bothered to even look at her without glares of all kinds, giving her the stares that said they were better than her, it made her want to slaughter them all. When she had awoken and saw the raven-haired girl clutching an unconscious blonde, her first reaction was to attack. She went to kill the girl and boy, only to be stopped by a beautiful woman eyeing her disapprovingly. Before she could spit out a let go the woman spoke in a tone she was all too familiar with. Nanabi. At first she was skeptical that the woman before her was Nanabi, her demon mother figure in human form, but the woman proved it twice fold when she unleashed her chakra and told a memory that only the demon sealed inside of her would have known in which she could only stare in shock of before asking how it happened. Nanabi, herself, wasn't sure either. When the boy, Naruto, had unsealed the loyalty seal something her eyes widened at before focusing on the blonde boy, something had happened to the seal on her stomach. She was still sealed to FK, but only by a string. FK had immediately pulled up her shirt and saw that indeed 90% of the seal had vanished. Naruto was relocated to the bed she had been unconscious on, and she wanted to stay for a while. Haku, the woman, was apparently his wife and was very reluctant to leave her alone with her husband after her little display with attacking them. She assured her that she wouldn't attack her savior, it wasn't her ninja way. For some reason that seemed to spark something in Haku before she reluctantly nodded and left along with Nanabi, who had sent a very meaningful glace at her before disappearing behind the door. And here she was, staring at the person who had saved her life. She hated humans, hated them with a passion for all that they've done to her, and they hated her back. She didn't feel guilty about it because they hated her first. And it confused her to no end when she felt kinship with the blonde. She didn't understand it. He was a human. A lowly, disgusting, power-lusting, perverted, shallow creature that would no sooner use her as a weapon for his own wicked schemes. Was that what he was planning? Using her thankfulness to get her to do things. She snarled at the thought, her orange eyes glowing with a yellow hatred before she calmed down. She would not lose her composure and break a promise like a lowly human would. She was told he wouldn't wake up soon. Haku mentioned that he knew the consequences, that he knew he'd be unconscious for a while, but he still did it, still saved her. It made her feel warm inside, a foreign feeling for one such as herself. She stared at his peaceful face. His hard and handsome features were relaxed and calm, his chest slowly moving up and down with his even breath. One hand rested on the side of his body and the other atop his chest, showing that they were large and calloused from intense training. She reached out to feel before flinching at her movement and brought her hand back. The spiky sun bleached hair fell over his face and sprawled itself across the pillow, making his head look like the sun shining down on its moving planet. Tan skin had a healthy glow in the dim light, making his whisker scars pop out with an exotic and feral look. 
She wanted to touch them, stroke them to see if he purr like a cat. His eyelids were closed, covering his eyes. His eyelashes were dark and long, also helping in the covering of his eyes. She wanted to see their color. Surely one such as this would have unique eyes, eyes that she'd lose herself in. Shaking her head, she punched her forehead. What was she thinking? Was she seriously just fantasizing about a human she'd never met before? She must still be out of it. It was the only explanation. She'd never think about a human like that. She hated humans and he was just another right. She didn't like her doubt. She hated doubting as it was a weakness. She didn't have weaknesses, she swore she would never have one after the village and its people used her last ones against her. If he was turning out to be a weakness he must be eliminated, but, she promised. It was all so frustrating. Sighing and giving in to her instincts, she let her fingers slip around Naruto's rough hand and rubbed her thumb over his surprisingly soft skin. Yes, it was rough, but it had a soft tone to it. Was this what a man's hand was like? She'd never held one before, they all pushed her away. She remembered her first crush. He was a boy by the name of she couldn't even remember. She had confessed to him and he had adopted a disgusted look. Are you kidding me? I'd never touch such a disgusting creature let alone go out with you. Stay away from me, demon. Those words he had spat always struck her to the core for months after. The same thing happened with her other crush and she vowed to never love again after that. It always ended painful and violently when you were a Jinchuriki. But still, why was she starting to feel for him like she did to those other boys? Was it because he saved her? She couldn't understand why her body and emotions were doing this to her. She felt a tear forming in her eyes. Unrequited love was just as painful as the glares one received. She'd never fall in love again couldn't. With much hated reluctance, she let go of Naruto's hand only to look up and see crystalline blue eyes staring at her. Her heart nearly stopped. How is he? Urza asked, her normally stern eyes cracking into worry. Naruto had never shown such weakness to anyone in Fiori before, and it scared her. Haku smiled at the redeed. Fine, exhausted, but he's fine. Urza relaxed visibly. Who's the girl? She asked, eyeing the Nabi suspiciously. She never saw someone else come in, and she can't sense chakra as well as magic. The multicolor haired woman smiled gently at her. I'm the Nabi. It's a pleasure to meet you. The Nabi as in the seven tales that Naruto's told me about. Yes. Her eyes narrowed and she got ready to ex-equip before Haku placed a hand on her shoulder. It's alright. She's not going to harm us. If she was she'd have done it already since Naruto's unconscious. Where's Minato-sama? Whirlpool. Ahamit-sama. Out. Zabuza. Taking a walk in the woods. Well, lost again. She grumbled in her mind. Why couldn't that man ever learn to read a map? Urza nodded, interpreting the meaning of her words. She turned back to the demon and examined her from head to toe. She seemed harmless in this form, but she wasn't fooled. Even when suppressed the power that she herself could normally barely sense was overwhelming her. No matter what Haku said, she'd stay on guard. From what I've understood you Biju have been sealed away. Why are you out of your seal? I may be out, but I'm still connected to FK Chan in a small way. I'm not really sure what happened, but when the loyalty seal was removed, I found myself being forced out of the seal. We'd have to ask Naruto-sama when he wakes up. Sama. Haku's brow furrowed at the suffix. She could understand others calling him that, but not from a bijou of her status and power. He saved the life of my vessel. He has my respect. She said simply, a fond smile on her face and half-lidded eyes, as she remembered his efforts to save FK. He's a Jinchuriki too, right? Urza and Haku nodded. Her gentle smile widened. Then that's another reason why he has my respect. Being a Jinchuriki is not easy for anyone. You're different than the other bijou. She blushed a little. I'm known as a delinquent in the demon world. Demons that act like me usually get bullied, but because of my power I've avoided it. She shook her head. So, which one does he hold? Kaiubi. The Nabi's eyes widened. Kaiu-kun. Before she snickered. I should have guessed from the whisker scars. So why did she attack me and Naruto? The demon's bright face saddened greatly. As you know, Jinchuriki aren't treated the best in this world. Because of this Jinchuriki don't trust easily and some despise humans as a whole. My dear FK applies for both of those. When she sees a human she doesn't know her first thought is to attack. Trust is very important for Naruto. I had the feeling he never really did trust us until after he revealed he was a Jinchuriki to the village. Hers amused aloud and smiled. I still remember the face he made when we accepted him. Except in something Jinchuriki crave and can usually never have. Nanabi sighed. It's a sad thing really. Alright, I'm confused. Haku said. How on earth did you end up being sealed? You seem like you wouldn't harem a fly. Nanabi shrugged. Why else? She sat down gracefully onto the couch behind her. As time went on the other major ninja villages started to gain Jinchuriki. 
Takigakur feared that they'd be overlooked and wanted a weapon of their own. They tracked me down and sealed me into FK Chan. I've been watching over her ever since. I see her as my little sister that needs protection and comfort. The two girls smiled at her. It seems that some of the Bijuu become emotionally attached to their vessels. Kaiubi sees Naruto as his son, and Nanabi sees FK as her sister. It taught them to wonder how many other Bijuu become attached to their vessels, or if it was only just the two. So, Nanabi said with a wide grin. When are you due? You? It took the girls a moment to realize before they blushed. H how do you know? Urza sputtered, automatically going into the defense against her pride position she always adopts when she's embarrassed. Don't underestimate it demon. I can feel the chakra swirling around your uteruses and a new chakra signature forming in them as well. I could tell you were pregnant the moment I saw you. She beamed. So when are you two due and how was it? The girls turned even redder before a scream erupted through the house. FK pinned herself against the wall after her little vocal demonstration as she wearily watched as Naruto removed his hands from his ringing ears with a pained look on his face. She always knew she was loud and felt prideful inside that she could still accomplish her banshee shriek that always caught enemies off guard and got them out of their funk for a few seconds. He chuckled a little and spoke in a naturally raspy voice that made her blush. Well, you certainly have a pair of lungs on you. I'm Naruto Uzumaki Namikas by the way. Her blushing stopped, doing the polite thing and answering back. FK. In her mind, her wheels were turning. Where she hear the name Yuzumaki Namikas before besides Kashina Yuzumaki and Minato Namikas W. Wait. You're the Jinchuriki of the Kaiubi. He grinned. The one and the same. So that's why she felt a kinship towards him. He was a Jinchuriki like her. Hated, despised, glared at, spat at, their existence cursed and every word spoken to them. It was the first time she'd met another Jinchuriki, and if she was still in Taki, she'd have been ordered to being him back to become loyal to the village to make it more powerful. And why wasn't he mentioning about her holding his hand? Either way, she was glad he wasn't. Would you help me? The words fell from her mouth before she could even think them. Subconsciously she realized that to heal her and remove the seal he had to have known she was a Jinchuriki, but not before. Why would a Jinchuriki help a normal human? He blinked. You were hurt. Do I need another reason? She stared at him blankly, those words barely registering in her mind before the door slammed open to reveal Urza, Haku, and Nanabi. Naruto. Urza shouted before dashing over to him and clutching him. Are you harmed? Urza, I'm fine. He assured, gently removing himself from her iron chest, standing up and doing a complete 360 to show he had no injuries like he said. See? Urza and Haku relaxed before they turned to look at the source of the loud wail. Are you alright? Haku questioned. She raised her eyebrow, still not understanding why a human would be concerned for her before she nodded slightly. Nanabi walked over to her and placed a smooth hand on her shoulder, showing her she could trust these three. Not that she would, of course. Naruto she could sense he was like her, but the other two were still normal humans. Her trust wouldn't come easy. You woke up sooner than you said you would. Haku inquired. He robbed the back of his neck sheepishly. Yeah, well I thought it would be longer. I'm actually quite surprised I'm awake so soon maybe my body just got used to it perhaps. Haku glared at him before shaking her head. Questioning Naruto never did turn out the way one would expect. She turned to Nanabi and FK. Would you like some tea? Tsunami had dragged Izuna to the market so I'm afraid there's little here right now. Tea would be lovely. Nanabi commented with FK nodding. What about Inari? He's at school, Naruto. The blonde blushed at his careless inquiry. Right I knew that. I know you did. She rolled her eyes and headed out the room. I'll be right back. She's a nice girl. Nanabi said. Naruto nodded. She's an amazing woman. I'll go help her. Make tea? Urza questioned. Yes. You can't make tea. He grinned. But what ulterior motive could I possibly have? He asked innocently as he dashed out the room while Urza chuckled. Nanabi smiled and opened her mouth to speak, but was surprised to be beaten by FK, who looked both confused and angry. Why? Why do you show him concern and love? He's a Jinchuriki, he has a demon sealed inside of him. He's not normal. Why does he show you such emotions back as well? You're a normal human and normal humans abuse us I don't understand. Much to her ire, her voice sounded shaky and pitiful. She hated being so vulnerable. Urza looked at her with a completely serious expression. I can ask you a question of my own as an answer. Why do you hate every normal human like we're a plague? They abuse us. They call us demons and treat us like we're the lowest of the low in property. They. One gave birth to you. FK's eyes widened at this proclamation. That was true, but. Do you despise your own mother? No. Her mother was the only one to stand by her side throughout the years until she was killed when she was trying to protect her daughter from another beating. 
Not all humans are the same just like how not all demons are the same. Naruto knew this and reached out for others, knowing that someone would accept him. Someone wouldn't see him as the Kaiubi. Someone wouldn't despise him. He met us all through that belief. He's worked for it and found those who see him for who he is. He's not just the son of Kashina, the Red Death. He's not just the son of Minato Namikas, the Yellow Flash. He's not just the Kaiubi Jinchuriki. He's Naruto, Ryukage of Ryugakur and the most caring soul you'd ever meet. Being a Jinchuriki doesn't make you a monster your personality and beliefs do. But that, Urza turned away and left the room. Nanabi turned and looked at FK who had a look of shock on her face and stayed silent, knowing the green-haired girl needed a moment to herself. For FK, the wheels in her head were turning. The redeed had made a point, but she just couldn't quite grasp the concept. She sighed and leaned against the wall. She had some thinking to do. No Kashina. Minato said sternly. But I want to go see my baby. Kashina shouted. She had been pestering her husband about going to see her son before the Chunin exam started. However, he refused her which surprised her. Minato never refused her unless it was for a good reason. She just couldn't see the harm in going to see her once thought dead son. We can't. He's busy preparing for Kanoha's downfall. He has to ready his allies while not losing his training schedule, make alliances for when Ryukage is relocated here, he's just too busy. She pouted. Be but. He placed his hands onto her shoulders. You'll see him during the preliminaries when we and the other cages arrive. It'll be soon, Kushi-chan, be patient. She glared at him. She never liked to be patient, but sighed giving in. It won't be long right. He shook his head. Nope. You'll soon be able to embrace him in that backbreaking hug you always blessed me with when you were overjoyed. You can always write to him until then. He commented while his spine was overcome with phantom pains. She nodded. All right. She looked over at Luna who was sleeping next to Kumanato's baby dragon. So they'll still deliver letters even though they're this small. He nodded. Yep, well, that's what Naruto said and they are dragons for Kami's sake. They're tougher than a toad or a messenger bird. She silently agreed before grinning brilliantly. I'm going to write him now. She exclaimed as she shrugged off his hands and ran towards the nearest blank scroll and brush. Minato chuckled at her antics and smiled after her. He never realized how much he missed seeing his wife. He'd have to thank Naruto later for sending him here and awakening him. Naruto yawned as he stepped back into his room only to see FK still in there, sitting on his bed with a dazed look. He raised an eyebrow and walked over to her, standing a few feet in front of her with a curious expression. Something wrong, FK? He asked. She didn't move, however, she did thin her lips. She still couldn't understand it. Every time she was alone with him she felt like blushing and that a thousand uninvited butterflies invaded her stomach. Urza's words only prolonged that feeling. He was Urza your wife. He smiled and squatted before her. Yep, so is Haku. She let surprise fall onto her face. Both of them are. He nodded. Yep. There are six others as well who are my fiancés as well. Her mouth fell open. W. -a. He chuckled at her reaction. You're not the only one to be surprised. However, when I tell a man his gaping is usually followed by a lucky bastard here and there. Why? You see, before I found out my dad and mother were alive they left me a scroll. My father was supposed to have died sealing the Kaiubi into me, so I would have been the last of the Namikazes. My mother was also supposed to have been dead, so I would also have been the last of the Uzumakas. I was to rebuild the clan so I fell under the Kra, the Clan Restoration Act if you didn't know. My parents can't have children anymore due to age so it's my job. Of course, I'd only marry who I love. I hate men who just grab beautiful women off the street to satisfy their perverted desires. So you have a harem? Harem is a word I despise. I like the term big family. She looked at him carefully. Strong, caring, understanding, a jinchuriki he was perfect in a sense. It made her heart flutter. Could I be there's only one way to find out. She suddenly thought. Then she did something that shocked even her. She jumped up and kissed him. His eyes widened for a second, not knowing what was happening before he closed his eyes and kissed her back, slipping his arms around her back. His right hand found its place in her hair and he pulled her closer, filling the kiss more. FK felt filled in a way. She couldn't describe the happiness she felt, nor did she know why she was doing this. She'd only just met him for heaven's sake, but she just couldn't stop. They pulled away from each other, panting. Naruto looked at her with his silly grin. Well, that certainly was forward. She blushed. Outside the door, Haku and Urza grinned at each other. Well, looks like we got another person to share him with. I'm astonished that it's still growing. Haku shrugged. Well, you know the saying. The more the merrier. Naruto was happy. Why you ask? It was time for two things. His brides to return Bahamut had just left to retrieve them, and it was almost time to fetch his participants in the Chunin exams. He started chuckling. 
Oh, this was gonna be fun. He remembered telling his dad this. The two had chuckled so evilly and Nari and Tazuna fled the room the moment they entered. He snickered at the memory. Is it time? Urza asked. Naruto looked at her. Over the last week and a half she began so gain the bulge on her stomach, showing the little one inside was growing nice and strong. Due to this, she had changed her armor some. She still wore the metal on her chest, but it wound around the stomach, allowing a fishnet shirt to lay over a red one to make sure the baby and Urza were more comfortable. Soon. He answered, patting the seat next to him. His bride wandered over and curled up next to him. He found his hand slowly circling her bulge lovingly and she smiled, leaning her head against her husband's shoulder. I wonder who he or she will look like. He spoke. My eyes and your hair maybe. She contemplated, touching her stomach. What about names? I was thinking if it was a boy then Ryu, it means dragon in this world. If it's a girl then Kaida, it means little dragon. I think that's right. She smiled. I like that. Perfect for you being the dragon prince and all. He smiled back. That's why I thought of it. Simple yet perfect. A voice at the door said. The two turned to see Haku. Naruto held out his free arm and she curled up in it. Where's Ibuza? She opened her mouth then closed it. Follow the booms. She spoke just as a loud bang echoed throughout the forest. Lost again? Haku rolled her eyes. Oh, he doesn't get lost. Naruto chuckled. I guess not. The forest just messes with his sense of direction, yes? You know him so well. Do you remember what I told you? She nodded. You're taking me with you to the other world you now live in because not only am I with child, but I'm supposed to be dead. If Kanoha sees a supposedly dead person not only would it probably give us away, but make them even more suspicious of us. Urza said, shifting to rest her back more comfortably against the back of the couch. You're going to leave me in the Namika's compound. Haku continued Urza as staying to keep up appearances, and a disguised Zabuza will help with the invasion, with the four you chose to participate in the Chunin exams, the Akatsuki, and your brides. Urza is not allowed to fight because of the baby, but she's allowed to help somewhat. Correct. I hope you don't find that. Oh, I completely understand. Plus, I don't really feel like fighting with my baby at risk. Naruto smiled at her. I'm glad. So, who are you brining here? Urza asked. Naruto grinned. You'll just have to wait and see. He shivered when he felt a dark aura form behind him. He turned and saw Nanabi and FK who was glaring at Urza and Haku. She had gotten better in being around humans, but for some reason she seemed to hate Urza and Haku the most. Though others understood why, Naruto didn't. FK, want to join us? She huffed. No way. Go on sweetie. Nanabi encouraged. Not with those two. I want him alone. She snapped at the demon in a whisper. Oh. My little girl's growing up so fast. She already wants to be become a woman. The Bijuu said with her face turning red at the images running through her mind. And Nanabi. FK sputtered, her face even redder than the demon's. Now that you mention it, you might love it. He seems like he has a good body, and from what Urza and Haku have told me he's also. Nanabi. Calm yourself sweetie. If you love him give yourself to him. It's what teenage boys think about anyways. FK's blush greeted as she huffed and turned away from the loving demon. She stomped towards a chair and slammed herself into it and looked away, pouting in a way. The others watched with confused expressions before looking to Nanabi who shrugged. Suddenly, he perked up with a smile. Something wrong? Nothing wrong, something good. He said happily as he released the two girls and stood up. FK, Nanabi. Wanna meet the other brides? Instantly, Nanabi nodded with a large smile on her face, and FK scowled at the thought of sharing. But of course, you lucky bastard. The demon teased. Naruto rolled his eyes before looking at the two girls on the couch. Come here, Haku. After our greeting, we're heading straight to the other world. The girl nodded and stood up, waving goodbye to Urza, and the three headed out the door. A few seconds later, seven figures appeared in a flash of light and magical symbols. His brides and Bahamut. Naruto couldn't help but smile when he felt both the chakra and magical levels of his brides. The Angel Six were now stronger than ever before. They radiated the power of their element causing Naruto to smile before looking at Bahamut, who was now sporting a few bruises. He raised an eyebrow. Noticing this, Bahamut simply nudged his head in the direction of the females, and Naruto nodded in understanding. They would be quite mad at him for what they had to go through. Yo, hot stuff. Anko said enthusiastically, waving her hand. Can I see what's under those pants of yours now? Naruto blushed causing Haku to chuckle at him and FK to glare. Before he could speak, the purple-haired girl was slapped on the back of the head by both Ino and Hana. You um, how was the training? Naruto asked, trying to force his blush down. The girls glared at him for a moment before smiling. Horrid. They said together. Naruto's sweat dropped. Sorry about that. Bahamut insisted. 
the girls glared at the already bruised up dragon in human form that looked away proudly, skillfully avoiding their eyes with a strange grace. They looked back at Naruto, and that's when they saw FK glaring at them. It took a moment for them to realize her jealousy and smirked. Naruto, confused for a second at why those look appeared, looked to his side and raised his eyebrows in understanding before turning a dazzling smile at the girls. Ladies, meet my Nanabi and FK. FK and Nanabi, meet my fiancés. I was right. Nanabi spoke, playfully punching Naruto in the arm, while FK's glare intensified and latched herself onto Naruto's arm. Nanabi's smirk widened at this as if to prove his point. You're one lucky bastard. Jirei would cry if he discovered this. Iro Senen would probably worship me as a god as well. Iro Senen. Nanabi muttered, having heard of the perverted sage as the enemy of woman before laughing. Perfect name for the pervert. Naruto chuckled and gently pulled himself free from FK before he walked over to his other brides, before kissing each lightly on the lips, causing their faces to light up. I have to leave for the day, but I'll return soon, probably later today. Get comfortable, princesses. Hi, Naruto-kun. They muttered as if in a trance. Haku-chan. Naruto said, holding out a hand to her. She smiled and took it. Bahamut. Said Dragon King nodded and held out a hand. Naruto took it and just like how the brides appeared, the three vanished. They appeared in a fancy living room coated in fine colors and expensive furniture. Once her dizzy vision cleared Haku's mouth dropped open. Forgetting about the group, she wandered around. Her eyes skimmed the walls, looking at the pictures of the Yande and Kishina. She stopped at one. Minato and Kishina were cuddling together and looking lovingly down at a blonde baby wrapped in Kishina's arms. The baby was without whisker marks, but she could still tell it was Naruto. No one had the same shade of blue for eyes that he did. That's the only picture of the three of us. Naruto spoke, walking next to her. Before I found out they lived, I'd always talk to the picture when I needed advice, as if it had suddenly come to life and embraced me in parental love. Silly, right. But I'm glad they're alive. Haku looked at him and embraced him. She knew what it was like to feel alone and hated. She understood completely. The two pulled away when Bahamut coughed, causing them to blush slightly, but the fingers of their hands remained intertwined. I shall go wander and spread my wings. Do what you need to do and we'll meet back here. All right. Yes, father. Naruto said and Haku nodded. Bahamut vanished out the door. So, Haku began. What shall we do first? Well, I was thinking of informing the Akatsuki first. Well, they're called the guardians of the dragon now but all the same. Yes, you told me of that. I have wanted to meet them. They were once the terror of the shinobi world after all. She said, heading for the door. Oh no, we're not going by street. He spoke, almost frantically. She raised an eyebrow at him. Why? The fangirls. He shuddered. I have more than Sasuke bastard and they're all over the world here. If we leave, we'll be running from rabid wolves out for rape everywhere we go. They'll chase after you being my wife and run after me for me. He shuddered again. She paled slightly before looking at him in sympathy while plotting to murder them. Maybe she and the Angel Six could come up with something cruel and unusual to scare them off him. Come here. He said, taking her into his arms. Hold on. He spoke as black and golden flames surrounded him. They appeared before a large building with a Japanese-style dragon painted to swirl around the double doors. As Haku stumbled from the sudden feeling, Naruto held her firmly in his arms as support. When she saw the building, her eyes widened somewhat. But Haku began. This is the home of the Akatsuki. Believe it or not, they take their job very seriously, especially Haiden always going on about something Jashin wants him to do or something. Maybe it's because I've met his god and am on a first-name basis with him. I don't really understand him truthfully. He mused before opening the doors. Follow me. It took Haku a moment to process that information. He was on a first-name basis with the blood god. She shrugged it off, after all, he's hitched with the three goddesses. Once inside, Haku examined the setting. It was like a traditional mansion back in the elemental nations, styled somewhat like Gato's, but less ritzy and more quaint and homey. She believed she could learn to love it here. Suddenly, they heard a crash. Naruto smiled and lifted a finger to place on his lips, shushed her. The two crept over to the kitchen area where shouting was heard. They peeked in and saw the four remaining members of the former Akatsuki shouting at each other in their uniforms. The guardians of the dragon had uniforms styled like the Akatsuki robes to make the former members more comfortable. The robes were now white with vibrant gold and red dragons and patterns swirling around the cloaks. All in all, it made them glow. Damn it, kiss him, I fucking know that you're the fucker that ate my last fucking banana sundae. Hayden shouted. I did not. Stop blaming me for things I didn't do. Naruto held in a chuckle. It was discovered that Hayden really liked a treat here in Fiori called a banana sundae. 
Due to this, the civilians who were more than happy to serve Naruto's personal guard put banana sundae on every menu in Ryudakar, much to Hayden's delight. Why do you think it was Kisum, Un? Dadara asked. It could have been me or Itachi, though it wasn't me, Un. I know it was fucking Kisum because of the damn banana stain on his shirt. Kisum seemed startled and looked down and saw the yellow stain. He raised an eyebrow before scowling. That's from my vanilla pudding you jackass. It's from my fucking sundae and you know it. Itachi, what do you think, Un? Itachi didn't look up from his tea. He simply took another sip before grunting, showing he didn't really care about such a pointless argument. Naruto chuckled, catching their attention. Well, it certainly is as lively as when I left, isn't it? Naruto-sama. Shouted Hayden with passion, speeding over to him and bowing his head. It's wonderful to see you again, Naruto-sama. In her voice, Hayden. Naruto said, his ears ringing. Eyes louder than the pink banshee. Kwaikai Ubi. Whatever. Sorry, Naruto-sama. Welcome back, Un. Itachi turned to face him, smirked, and said welcome home. Hey, brat. How's that world treating you? Hello to you too, Sushi. A tick mark appeared on Kisum's forehead. He hated being called that, but Naruto was his cage, what could he do? Brat, when are we gonna have the bloodshed? Naruto smirked at the enthusiasm of the fish man. Soon. I came here to retrieve you and gather my participants in the Chunin exams. Chunin exams? Why would you want to participate in them, un? Yes, Naruto-sama is too great to participate in a meager event as such. Hayden declared. Not me, Naruto said. Some of fairy tale will. I'm also going to test some from the academy to see how well you did in training them. Why? To mess with them, yes. Itachi spoke in his monotone voice. You know me so well, Ida-chan. Itachi's brow twitched and Naruto grinned almost evilly. He had picked up that nickname from Yami and immediately took a liking to it, much to the Ichiha's displeasure. During the conversation, Hayden had noticed Haku and kept his eyes on her. Hey, he spoke, finally voicing his thoughts. Who's this bitch? Naruto glared at Hayden for a moment before smiling. Hayden, Itachi, Kisum, Dadara, meet my second wife, who's pregnant, I might add Haku. Hayden's face immediately fell. Naruto-sama, please forgive this lowly servant of Jashin for insulting your beautiful bride. He shouted out, falling to his hands and knees. Naruto and the other guardians looked mildly amused while Haku bit her lip to keep from chuckling. Forgiven. Naruto spoke. Now, pack up. We leave soon. Ah. Just so you know, I have seven more brides back in the other world. Itachi smirked. Good luck. Adara almost squealed. That means there'll be a lot of mini Narutos running around. He shouted out in joy. The room sweat dropped at the long-haired blonde before Naruto turned to Haku. Shall we go and fetch the participants? I can't wait for you to meet Fairy Tail. They're quite fun. Psychotic. Insane. Crazy. Idiots. The guardians kindly said. Naruto huffed. They're just energetic is all. He spoke, turning to Haku and taking her into his arms. Let's go. And they vanished in fire. The two appeared before a large intricate guild-type building with the Fairy Tail symbol on it. Haku raised an eyebrow at its design. Welcome to Fairy Tail. My other guard. You have a lot of guards, Naruto. You don't even need them. Naruto chuckled at the compliment. They insisted. Who was I to say no to such lively people? She rolled her eyes. No is just not in your dictionary. He looked at her with mock hurt. I've said no before. When? A while ago. Name and date. Let's go in, shall we? She rolled her eyes again as her husband avoided the question. He had her stand away from the doors, much to her confusion, and he stood off to the side as well. The moment the doors opened the large vase flew out and shattered onto the ground, followed by a chair. Here you know Hoko. Echoed from inside. Ice make. Lance. Cried out, followed by a large explosion. Naruto shook his head. Those two he muttered in amusement. Cut that out you fools. An older voice yelled followed by manly squeaks. Still as lively as ever. Muttered Kaiubi. Naruto smiled. They always will be. Naruto took Haku's hand and led her into the guild, and her eyes widened. Everywhere she looked, there was only one thing. Chaos. Chairs and tables were flying everywhere, and magic as well. From what Naruto had told her before, magic was different and didn't need hand signs or chakra. She had to say, she was impressed, even if she knew that magic wasn't as destructive as jutsu. She decided it would probably be a nice experience to learn some magic for herself. Suddenly, a blur flew past them and crashed into one of the only standing tables. A man in only his underwear stood up, rubbing his head as a red blur crashed next to him. The two looked at each other, scowled, then tackled each other. Men used their fists. Someone in the fighting crowd shouted. Naruto started laughing, catching everyone's attention. 
Smiles found themselves on almost every face as the fighting stopped. Naruto-sama Master Naruto. Echoed throughout the guild. Yo. Naruto, my boy. Makarov spoke, holding up his beer keg. Welcome home. Yo, old geezer, I see you haven't keeled over yet. He waved. The old master laughed. With these fools I'd worry too much if I just died. Nah. I still have years left in me. Naruto grinned. Good to see you old man. He said. The Naruto, Makarov was like the third. Not a replacement, but a shorter twin of the geezer. He had immediately taken a liking to the old master when they first met. Naruto. I. Suddenly, a person with pink hair and a flying blue cap were in front of the Ryukage. Hello Natsu. Naruto spoke. Happy. He nodded towards the winged cat. Naruto, guess what? I can do the tree walking now. I have chakra control. Naruto smiled, proud of his former student. Good job, Natsu. What about Jutsu? I excel in fire jutsu though I only know two I'm getting there. Ha. I got tree walking before you. Brag gray. Liar. I got it before you. Did not. I'm guessing you excel in ice-based jutsu, correct? Naruto said, breaking up the fight to be. Gray nodded. Of course. Natsu scoffed. He only knows two as well. Hey. Naruto smiled. Well, Haku here is an expert in ice jutsu. She could probably help you a lot. Haku? All eyes went to the beautiful woman standing next to Naruto. She smiled warmly at them. Who's she? Everyone, meet my second wife. And, like Urza, she carries my child. Two teenage girls, one with blonde hair and one with a silvery color, squealed happily and jumped towards her. Congratulations. The two shouted out. I'm Lucy. And I'm Arahan. Naruto smiled at the three girls and then spotted Gajiel. Hoi, Ironhead. Said Iron Dragon Slayer looked at his cage, slightly irritated one might add. Natsu and Grey can now do the tree walking exercise. What about you? Yeah. Got it before both of them. The two looked like they were ready to retort before they fell silent, slightly pouted, and turned away, showing the whole guild, who was laughing at them by now, that he was indeed speaking the truth. As if to change the subject, Natsu turned to Naruto. So, has Kanoha gotten their well-deserved judgment yet? I, Happy shouted out. Not yet, I Naruto paused when he saw a blue-haired girl and a cat. He knelt down and smiled at her. Hello, who are you? W. Wendy she spoke shyly. Naruto noticed a white female Happy. You're a dragon slayer, yes. Wendy blushed and nodded. She had heard of the blonde cage, everyone had, and everyone had seen his picture at least once. But, in real life, he really did look like a blonde god. He was the most handsome creature Wendy had ever seen. Even Cheryl, the cat, raised an eyebrow, impressed by the Raikage's looks. Where'd you come from? He asked. See Kate Shelter. He raised an eyebrow. Ah, so it's finally happened. Her eyes widened while Cheryl looked at him in surprise. You knew? The cat asked. Naruto nodded. I met the old guy once. His essence wasn't that of the living. He finally moved on, yes. Still in shock, all she could do was nod. While you were away, we fraught a dark guild, one, and since her guild no longer existed, we Lucy began but trailed off. Naruto smiled again and held out his hand. Welcome to my personal guard, the guild fairy tale, Wendy. Her eyes widened for a moment before Cheryl pushed her slightly. She gulped and took his hand and shook it. P please take care of me. She spoke. Naruto ruffled her hair, making her giggle slightly. You like fairy tale. Makarov approached. Sorry for the interruption, but you said that you haven't yet destroyed Kanoha. Why is that? Well, I'm gonna play with them first. Naruto answered simply, causing smiles to form on the guild members' faces. There's something coming up called the Chunin exam where Jenin who pass advanced to the level of Chunin. I'm entering six people into it just to mess with them before judgment after the tournament. Three from here and three from the academy. Immediately, hands flew in the air, volunteering themselves for the exam. Naruto chuckled slightly. I already have the three picked out. Natsu. Yasha. He exclaimed, lighting on fire. Gray. All right. Gray, your clothes. Kana spoke, causing said nearly naked teen to gasp and look down. And Gajiel. The Iron Dragon Slayer smirked. Happy. I. You can't come. Huh. Both Happy and Natsu exclaimed. In the elemental nations, there's no animal such as yourself, and seeing one could cause chaos. Only animal summons talk, and if they found a non-summon talking the nations would fight themselves in competition too well. W what? Happy nervously stuttered. I sector experiment on the unknown species to discover how it was made, how it works, and if its species can be beneficial. Until Ryugakur transports there, you must stay here. Happy and Cheryl had looks of horror on their faces before they shivered. Happy looked down, nodding. He didn't want to get dissected. 
Besides, Naruto began again. I need someone I trust to show Wendy and Cheryl around Ryugaker. Happy, I need you to do this for me. Naruto winked. The cat's face lit up. Well, alright. It won't be that long I guess. Natsu smiled. Good luck, Happy. I. Now, the four I named meet me at my compound as soon as you're ready. And Lucy, can you please escort Haku-chan there as well while I fetch the last members? Sure. Which team will it be by the way? Naruto shook his head. A surprise. I'll also be fetching someone else before we leave. He won't be coming with us but will become an official resident of Ryukage. Again. He added in his mind. And this is an order from your cage. His face and voice became grave and cold. Don't attack him or you'll face my wrath. The room shivered and nodded. Naruto's happy face returned. Wonderful. Now, I must go. Bye. He said, vanishing in flames. I wish I could do that. Natsu said. Don't we all? Gray said. Bajil smirked. Relax, we'll learn Shunshin eventually. How do you know what it's called? I actually read the scrolls he gave us. Naruto wandered into training ground one. It was a chunk of land in a dangerous part of the forest surrounding Ryugakur. There were natural traps and hazards as far as the experienced eye could see. Travelers have been lost many times to this dangerous area, so Naruto had decided to fence off, off and make it a training ground for graduated academy students. It was a dangerous area so Naruto had it be the training ground for the top graduates. Hearing voices, he turned and headed into the forest to see two girls arguing with each other and a boy sitting on a fallen log, shaking his palmed head as if this happened every hour of every day. They looked as old as Naruto, around 15 or so. Naruto grinned. Just who he was looking for. Squad 1. Christian Taiga, the one sitting on the log, was one of the specially trained students. Urza had seen his potential and trained him as her student while he was still in the academy. He was on the short side for his age, around 4'9", but made up for it in speed. He had short black hair and wise brown eyes. He wore a black t-shirt and karate pants with a ninja sandals as well. On his wrists were two metal bands used for his magic and the Ryugaku headband was on his forehead. He was also the oldest of the squad being 15. Christian's magic was for high-level defense with the iron rings wrapped around his hands. He's also built for speed and power, the muscle of the group, and also the voice of reason when things get out of hand in the team. Since their official sensei, Itachi, is absent most of the time he's mostly the team leader. Due to his power he's been nicknamed the Iron Demon as one time he took on 10 other squads by himself and won. He was the rookie of the year. One of the two girls arguing was Daniel Morgafinella, mostly called Morga by others. She was a 14-year-old girl at the height of 4'8". She had dark red hair that reached her shoulders and emerald green eyes. She wore a white muscle shirt under a black fire-resistant unbuttoned vest and white loose pants with ninja sandals on her feet. Her ninja headband was strapped onto her left arm. She looks up to Natsu like an older brother and a teacher. Her magic was fire-based. Her magic was powerful, not as powerful as a dragon slayer like Natsu, but all the same destructive. Besides specializing in devastating fire jutsus her magic was to turn her hair into a never-ending supply of unquenchable flames that would do her every bidding. If she could imagine it, the flames could form into it. Due to this her flames grow more intensely with her anger and gets the best of her many times. In the squad, she's the spirit of it, always enthusiastic. Her nickname is the Red Medusa, since her hair is her magic like Medusa's snakes for hair. The other arguing girl was Jeannie Tundrex, 14 years old and at the height of 4'8". She has long black hair reaching the small of her back and icy sapphire eyes. She wore a blue t-shirt under a black jacket and blue pants. Her Raikage headband is strapped loose around her neck. Like Morga and Natsu, she sees Grey as an older brother and a teacher to go to at all hours. Her magic was ice-based. Though similar to Grey Fullbusters, it's not the same. Her ice magic is based on destruction and golems. She's fascinated by the rare ice-based jutsus and can come up with plans faster than most people. She's the mind of the team. She and Morga usually get into fights with Christian stopping them many times. Her nickname was the Frozen Angel. Itachi, like what was said before, was the official sensei of the squad since the Akatsuki were the only ninja around here to teach. After instructing them and going on a few C-ranked missions, he left them alone to do their own thing, only checking in on them once in a while. Naruto didn't believe in D-ranked missions. They were just to please civilians who were too lazy to water their gardens and fetch their mail. Rather, he has them go on C-ranked missions and have teamwork building exercises during the mission and during training. Despite what it looks like on the outside, Squad 1 has incredible teamwork when it comes down to it. Squad 1 I assume? He said, causing three heads to look to him. When they saw who had addressed them they jumped up and knelt down before the Ryukage. Naruto-sama. They echoed. He shook his head and gestured for them to stand. 
I'm not one for that kind of thing, you know that. He gently scolded. We know, sir, but that doesn't mean we have to listen. Christian said. Yeah. We're just showing our leader respect. Morgan chimed in. What would you know about respect? Jeannie teased coldly. I don't even think you know the meaning of the word. Bitch. Now, now. Naruto said. I actually have a mission for your squad. They perked up at that. He knew that they hadn't had a mission in a while, as most of the ones coming in recently were for the guild or were too high ranking for them yet. What can we do for you? As you know I'm taking down my old home and I want to play with them first. There's something called the Chunin exams which will be held here in a few years when we get more ninja. But, I'm going to have you three participate in it. Do you want us to win, yes? Christian asked with a smirk, cracking his knuckles. Morga snapped her neck from side to side. Just say the word, boss. Respect. Genie hissed quietly. A foxy grin formed onto Naruto's lips. Then kick their asses to next century. Laxus was walking down a dirt road, a sack swung over his shoulder. He was glad he hadn't heard of anything troubling lately, nothing out of the ordinary. He was sad, though, because he couldn't report to his cage who he still secretly worked for. It made him feel like he had a purpose now that he was no longer part of Fairy Tail. True, almost all of Fiori knew that their lovable, most powerful and handsome teenage leader that had the magic council under his thumb had gone to seek vengeance on his old village. He remembered hearing of what Kanoha did to Naruto, and he was enraged. No one in Fiori or even a demon-attacked village would treat someone who risks their life to hold back a demon from attacking like such. Honestly, even they knew that if he really was a demon Naruto would have killed them all for such treatment, yet he stayed loyal until his sensei, well, can't really call him that, Kakashi's betrayal. He sighed. He really wanted to help. He jumped back when flames formed before him and took a fighting stance, ready for whatever came. He was shocked, startled in fact, when it formed into Naruto. A smile formed onto his face. Naruto-sama. Laxus. The blonde spoke. I have a proposition for you. His eyes widened. A proposition. Would you like to become a dragon nin? His eyes widened before he began laughing with glee before it faded. But I'm no ninja. I'm a mage. After Kanoha's fall, we can fix that. I'll assign you a teacher. But, I must warn you, you won't get any special treatment. You're a criminal and can no longer be a mage of fairy tale and will undoubtedly be watched closely by others, but I can pull a few strings. I may be too trusting, but I can see your loyalty and determination. Would you like this, Laxus? Tears of joy formed in Laxus's eyes. He quickly wiped them away and showed the cage a pure, happy smile. I would. Wonderful. Now, Naruto grinned at the man and held out a hand. Let's go to the others. Laxus took it without a second thought. Thank you, he muttered. Naruto looked over and saw a single tear that Laxus tried so hard to hide. He smiled. You're welcome. When Naruto returned, Natsu, Grey, and Gajil weren't very happy with Laxus being there. The three boys were more than vocal when they attacked Laxus. After giving the three a beating they'd never forget much to the amusement of the former Akatsuki members and squad one Naruto had bent down with an ominous smile and said attacking a dragon ninja is a serious felony. I would hate to have to punish you three. And, fearing whatever punishment Naruto had in store for them, they shut their mouths and tried, and a strain of tried, to be kind to Laxus who didn't seem offended by them. After he apologized on his hands and knees to the shocked four, they reluctantly forgave him. After introducing Haku to Laxus, they sat down and ate her cooking. The men kept going on and on about how Naruto was such a lucky bastard getting such a pretty and talented girl. After calling her a weak woman, Haku trapped Gajil in her ice mirrors and beat him to a pulp without receiving a single injury. The infamous ice princess of Ryugakur came to be. Later that night, Laxus left to go apologize to his grandfather with the encouragement of the fairy tale members who'd already forgiven him and considered him a comrade once again. Naruto had watched a man wander off into the night with thought swimming through his mind. Soon, they returned to the elemental nations. And thus judgment began. The Tetsu and Izumo sighed. The former of the two was leaning his head on his hand, dozing off every second or two. Izumo, however, was leaning back in his chair, fast asleep. Why are Kanoha's gate guards fast asleep one might ask? Well, with the day shifts and the nightly meetings with the resistance, the lack of sleep catches up to you quickly. Even ninjas needed sleep. The Tetsu stifled a yawn and scrunched up his nose as a headache was starting to appear. He'd been getting a lot of those recently. His eyes flittered shut before chuckling caused him to look up. Never thought you two ever got tired. Seeing who spoke, Kitetsu grinned widely and elbowed Izumo, causing the man to fall out of his chair. Grumbling, the man curled up and opened his mouth to yell at his friend when said friend jerked his head to face a whiskered teen. Izumo smiled as well. Little buddy. Izumo said. Welcome back. Naruto grinned and pulled a hood over his head to hide his face. 
Next to him was a beautiful red head that was obviously pregnant if the bulge in her stomach said anything, and on his other wide was an imposing and intimidating man who was glaring down at them, as if judging their very place in the food chain. It made the two shiver. Next to that man was a green-haired beauty who was staring at them like they were ants that didn't deserve approval, while an even more beautiful woman stood slightly behind her while smiling at them. Behind them were four figures dressed in silver gold and red, their cloth swirling with the most detailed of dragons. And behind them were six women, masked and dressed in slightly skimpy yet highly effective kinoichi cloths. Welcome back, Naruto. Or, should I say, Naruto-sama. Naruto smiled at them, knowing instantly that these two were in the resistance. See you too soon. He said, walking by with the others. Itetsu chuckled. Well, won't this be fun? Izumo grinned. Oh, it'll be fun for those on his side, hell for the others. Got that camera I asked you to get. With a wicked gleam in his eyes, Kitetsu pulled out an expensive camera. I did. Good, now we can capture the moment when all the bullshit this village put us through slaps them in the face. Naruto examined Kanoha. Not much had changed over the past three years. The only difference was people were looking at them cautiously and curiously, obviously not knowing who Naruto was. He knew the glaring would return if anyone ever figured out who he was. He saw that Ichiraku Raymond looked a little bigger than it used to be and smiled, glad that the family of two were doing well even in his absence. He'd have to visit them later, but for now he had a mission to do. Turning towards the council room, he grinned as he heard a meeting was taking place with his sensitive hearing. Ready? He asked his disguised brides, guardians, his wife, FK, Nanabi, and Bahamut. The Dragon King grinned. As I've been for three years. Aiden waved his scythe around. I say we destroy them all right now for harming Naruto-sama. Indoor voice, Aiden. We don't want people knowing it's Naruto-kun yet. Tenten reprimanded. Aiden pouted behind his mask. Hi. Naruto grinned, remembering when the Akatsuki met his brides. It was funny as hell. Hyden insulting them, them beating him within an inch of his immortal life, him being jumpy around them for the rest of the day, heck, he even hid behind Naruto when Anko cracked her knuckles at him. Now, luckily, he's returned to normal just still scarce around the Angel Six. She's right. I wanna mess with them. Remember that, Hyden. He saluted. Hi, Naruto-sama. FK? He asked the only person who didn't seem to have a response. She frowned, staring at the large doors in front of her, bad memories finding their way into her mind. He took in a deep breath and nodded. If they're anything like the council and Takigakur I want you to promise me something. He raised an eyebrow. What? Leave some for me to slaughter. He chuckled. Of course my lady. Tsunaid was pulling at her hair once again. The civilian council was shouting for the immediate death of Naruto the moment he steps into the village again. She was nibbling at her lower lip that was threatening to bleed to keep herself from shouting at them and worsening the argument. Soom was once again banging her head onto the table before her, while the other clan heads, excluding Shikaku Nara who looked to be asleep, were trying to keep their cool and failing, as irritation flowed off of them in waves. He's embarrassed us enough. Lily Hirono shouted, earning a green yells back. It's his fault we've plummeted this far. Look at us, we're nearing a depression. If we don't get at least some allies during the exams we'll need to resort to war. War would cost more money than we have. Snapped Hiyashi, the normally calm man finally losing it to the idiotic blathering of the civilians. We emptied the Namaka's accounts. Offered Hamura. Not like anybody is using them and there's enough to buy an army stored in there. You can't do that. Tsum shouted, stopping the banging of her forehead and glaring at the one who suggested such an act. It was practically thievery. We can and we will. Kahara announced. We need money to keep our village fed and strong. War will help keep our pride and. The fist slammed against wood. Bullshit. The eyes turned to see a shocking sight. A very pissed off Nara clan head, giving off a glare worse than an Achea, all laziness and sleepiness vanished. This is not a matter of pitiable pride. He snapped. Pride isn't worth the lives of the hundreds of soldiers it had cost for a war against a hidden village. Pride can be renewed, lives cannot. He growled out. Taking money that is not yours will only show others how far you've fallen. If this really is a matter of pride as you say, you wouldn't touch that money. Hell, you wouldn't have made a living hell out of Naruto's life. Did you think his life a game? Who could hurt Naruto the most was their prizes handed out secretly. I wouldn't doubt it. The moment you laid a single hand on that child your pride, heck, lives were forfeit. I hope you all rot in hell when you die. The civilians couldn't retaliate, hell, they couldn't even speak. Anara just shouted at them. Anara. Tsunade nodded approvingly while Inoichi and Chaoza nodded proudly at their former teammate. The other clan heads merely smirked or grinned, glad that the civilians finally shut up. Suddenly, the doors to the council room opened, well, more like slammed open. 
13 people stepped in, all but 5 masked, and the one leading the way covered his with his hood of a very yandame like cape. Who are you? Demanded a councilwoman. Come, come. Do you really need to know? Besides, his tone iced over, causing the civilians to shiver in fear and Shinobi to shiver in anticipation. We are not yours to demand from. Arrogant dogs. He looked up at Soom with a sweet tone again. No offense, Soom san None taken. She said with slight amusement. All the shinobi in the room could tell he was powerful and way out of their league at that. But, being civilians and not being able to sense power, they ended up doing the stupid thing. How dare you? We are the Honorable Council of Kanahagakur. Lily Haruno shouted. Who are you to speak like that to us? She was completely and totally ignored as he turned to Tsunade, much to the Haruno's annoyance and the clan head's mirth. Even the Anbu in the shadows who were tensed to attack if needed were holding back snickers. Lady Tsunade, still as beautiful as always. She found herself blush for a moment before it faded. Well, thank you. May I know your name? I am Tsunade Senju, current Hokage of Kanahagakur. Thank you for asking kindly, Lady Tsunade, or should I say, Tsunade Bachan. Eyes widened. It can't be. She whispered. His hood fell down, making lots of women blush. I am Naruto Uzumaki Namikaze, Raikage of Ryugakur. And I'm here to enter my ninja in the exams. Shocked silence filled the room as they stared at the much older, much hotter Naruto. Tsum licked her lips at the alpha-like aura he emitted. Oh, Hana was one lucky bitch. How she wished her husband turned out like this boy. Tsunade broke the silence. Of course, and, Naruto. She looked at him with a warm smile. Welcome back. Can't say it's good to be back, but whatever. He spoke, shrugging. I'm entering six people. She tossed him a form. Fill that out and deliver it to me when you're finished. Thank you, Bachan. See you later. Naruto Sama Hiashi began as he stood. Don't you dare call that abomination Sama. A councilman shouted, soon being silenced by a blade, more specifically a scythe, through his throat. Gasps and screams echoed from the civilians as their friend fell down dead. Tsunade Sama. Arrest him this instant. Naruto looked around confused. What? Why? I didn't see anything. Tsunade smirked. Neither did I probably too much to drink. Tsunade Sama. Complained the council. Silence. She snapped, turning to Naruto with a smile. I hope to see you around, brat. You got it, Bachan. Before turning to Hiashi. You had a question for me? He nodded. If you don't mind, who are those behind you? He smiled. Ah. Well, this beautiful flower is Urza, my wife. The men who were drooling at her growled at him until they were silenced by glares. This is FK and Nana, he gestured to the two girls, using a shortened version of Nanabi's name to keep the panic down. And next to me is Bahamut, the Dragon King. This caused flinches. The ladies are my angels. He stressed, causing smirks. And then these four are my guardians. Did you say the King of the Dragons? Tsum asked. You doubt me woman. She shook her head. Forgive me, but I don't see a dragon standing before me but a human. He smirked. Can a chameleon blend in with the environment? Amura stood up. I propose that Bahamut Sama teaches Sasuke Chiha all he knows. I second that. Third. Overruled. Naruto shouted, gaining cries of displeasure. If you've forgotten, I am no longer of this village, and Bahamut never was. You cannot command my people around like they're your own. Try and command my people, and I'll make you regret it, even in the afterlife. Besides, Bahamut began. I will ever only train Naruto. No one else. But the Achiha needs power. I believe Kami-chan once told you. There's a huge difference between want and need. Good day. He spoke, walking out. Oh, before I go, I will not, under any circumstances, allow you to treat my people like scum. Glares we can handle, words and actions that are unappreciated are a different story that will not be tolerated. And with that, the door slammed shut. Naruto collapsed in Saratobi's old mansion. Tsunade had lent it to him for him and his guests to live in during the exams. He had to admit, the old man liked to live in style. Of course, it was nothing like the Namika's compound that he was sure was decorated by both his mother and the female villagers of Ryugakur. He sighed into the pillow his face was buried in and rolled over on the couch. I get so pissed off just looking at the council's faces. He grumbled out. How dare they yell at Naruto-sama. I was barely keeping in my voice. Hayden complained. Yes, Dadara began. I knew the council was arrogant, but not that arrogant, un. Just like every other council. FK muttered, sighing as Nanabi placed a hand on her shoulder in a comforting manner, before she turned to look at Naruto with a frown on her face. She too didn't like the way they treated the boy. And wait to slice them up. Kissum hissed. Though the brat might be disrespectful to him at times with all the nicknames he was still his cage and was a man to be admired. He couldn't stand how those people treated him. Ahamit growled. 
And they dared demand something from me, the king of the dragons. Pitiful. I call dibs on the pink bitch. As I her daughter. Naruto said. I thought you liked her. Ino said in a confused tone as she sat down next to his lying form and started to massage his shoulders. He groaned as his muscles started to loosen before he snorted. Liked her? I never did. When people thought the Kaiubi brat had at least some feelings, the hatred diminished a little. Kami knows why I chose her. It was the worst mistake of my entire life. Damari snorted. I could have told you that. When are the fairy tale mages and Team One going to arrive? Hinata asked. A few hours or so is my guess. Then again, you can never really know with them. He chuckled. Urza nodded. I'd say that's about right. I told Natsu and Grey threatened. Those that knew her corrected mentally. To be here around that time. They should be close to arriving. Naruto. Three powerful voices called out. Before he could speak Ino was pushed away from him and he was glomped by three of the most beautiful women you'd ever see. Those from Ryugakur who already knew who they were just shook their head as if this happened often. The Angel Six, FK and Nanabi, on the other hand, were completely confused. Naruto, who are? Ah, sorry he spoke, trying to escape and breathe. They are Kami, Tozi, and Yami. The three goddesses and my fiancés for the future. Their mouths dropped open. The three goddesses. They were about to question him before they stopped and simply shook their heads. Questioning Naruto would only lead to headaches and unnecessary awestruck. Never question him and your life will end up fine. What brings the goddesses here this time? Kissam asked casually. After multiple heart attacks from witnessing them popping up time and time again, he finally got used to it. We have a message for Naruto. Plus, we wanted to see him. Tozi spoke, hugging his right arm. Message, un. Yep. Yami exclaimed. A request from Tsukuyomi and Amaterasu. One chan and Aneki. Naruto spoke of the big sister-like goddesses. Hami nodded. They regret giving the Ichiha their powers and wish to end the line and start again with Itachi. This caused said Ichiha's eyes to widen. Itachi was never arrogant, selfish, or power-hungry. He didn't take the easy way out and copied everything, he gained it all through hard work. You must finish this line and begin again. You wish for Sasuke to die? Tenten asked, catching on. Wait, their bloodline was given to them by two goddesses. Tamari asked. They thought that abomination named Madara was an honest man. Yes, he was honest at first, but he became what Sasuke is now, but much worse. We would have taken care of it ourselves, but we've already interfered with life enough as it is with what we did three years ago. And to answer your first question, either kill him or remove his bloodline. Who can do that? Anko asked. It's impossible to remove bloodlines, right? Hana inquired. I mean, it's never been done before. I can't. Many eyes flew to Naruto who shifted awkwardly at the sudden attention. Uh, well, it's a gift of my bloodline. Infinity. It can null the effects of all bloodlines and even permanently take them away. That's its special ability besides the abilities of the Sharingan, Byakugan, and Rinnegan. They stared in awe at the blonde boy before him. Yami snapped her fingers after her eyes lingered over Hayden. Ah. Almost forgot. She looked at a confused Naruto. Jashin wishes to have tea and another spar with you after this is over. He misses his Itado. Naruto smiled while Hayden screamed Jashin-sama. As loud as humanly possible with a large smile on his face. Tell him his Itado will visit him as soon as possible. Hell, tell that blood god that I'll deliver a cup of the ever-hated Danzo's blood to him. Yami smirked criminally. Will do. Jashin will love that. Dasan sama Quite Hayden. Anko snapped, making him shrink a little. Yes ma'am. The boys of the Rookie 12, now called the Rookie 8 since the disappearance of Naruto and the girls, were talking happily. Naruto had returned and was ready to start a war that they were determined to help in. Their senseis smiled at their enthusiasm and started talking about jutsu and tactics that it work well in war. Though they doubted it'd last long with Naruto around, it's better to be safe than sorry. I wonder what Naruto looks like now. Chouji suddenly stated with his mouth full of chips. The looker. Shino muttered, gaining all eyes on him. Gurunai nodded, gaining raised eyebrows and Kanoha's ice queen. I believe so as well. Since he's Minato's son, and the fact that he's almost an exact replica of him, I'd say he's hot. Soon confirmed that for me. The rookies looked jealous for a moment. They even got the alpha woman of the Inuzukas to drool before they smiled Shino smirked with only two words in their minds. Lucky bastard. Yo. All looked towards the sound and surprise, surprise. It was Kakashi and his team seven. All eyes narrowed as they approached. Sakura with a daydreaming look while staring at Sasuke who was glaring and brooding with an arrogant and prideful stance. Kakashi had his nose in the dreaded orange book. What are you three doing here? Hissed Kiba. You're not welcome here. Niji continued. Sasuke coughed. Of course we are. 
Sakura nodded enthusiastically. Yeah. Sasu-kun is welcome wherever he goes. They growled at the pink-haired girl, even Lee. After he found out what Sakura was really like, he dropped his, quote, unyouthful crush on the pink monster that knows no youth. Bakashi, spat guy. Bakashi looked up. He could never understand why guy suddenly hated him and never challenged him anymore. Only gave him very unguy-like glares. All he did was try to rid the world of a demon. Everyone else regarded him as a hero now except for a select few. He didn't understand. The eye smiled. Hello guy. Leave. Asuma spoke, walking off with the other Jounin, and formed a small group, glaring over at the three from time to time. We want to spar. Sasuke said, seemingly ignoring Asuma's demand. We have better things to do than spar with you. Niji said. Dealing with you is so troublesome. Shikamaru spoke. We have to meet someone. Who? They can wait. Yeah, they can wait until your spar with Sasu Kunin done. Screeched Sakura. Well, who we're meeting is a cage. I don't think he'd appreciate us being held back by a mere genin. Kiba teased mockingly. Sasu growled. Everyone in the rookie nine was either Chunin or Jounin while he and Sakura were still genin. It made him sick. He was in Achiha, the elite, he deserved to be Jounin, not them. I'm in Achiha, the cage will understand now fight me. He demanded, getting into fighting position. Dibble laughed with Chaoji while Niji smirked. Shikamaru turned to the Achiha and said. Not this cage. He'd be annoyed, and an annoyed cage is troublesome to deal with. Yes, keeping someone of his stature waiting is most unyouthful. Lee said. Who is this cage? Kakashi asked, curious. Lee smiled a full wat smile. He's your worst enemy, a new youthful cage. One who couldn't care less about the Achiha. Shino added monotonously. Raising an eyebrow, Kakashi said. A new cage as in a cage of a new village. Nods. Who is it? Shikamaru smirked. You're screwed, Kakashi. Why? Tiba grinned. It's the cage of Ryugakur, Naruto Uzumaki Namakas. Apprentice of the Dragon King, and immortal in favor of the gods. The faces of the three were priceless and made the rookies wish they had cameras. The dobe is a cage. Impossible. Sasuke scoffed. Yeah, Naruto Baka can't be a cage if Sasuke Kun isn't. Funny joke. Please, who's the cage? Kakashi I grinned. A joke? You think I'm a joke, Kakabaka? Kakashi paled. That voice. It was deeper and calmer than before, but it was unmistakable. And, by the surprised smiles on the faces of the others, he knew he was indeed, Hashikamaru said, screwed. He turned and saw the last person he ever thought he'd see again. Naruto. Without even acknowledging his old sensei, he walked around him with a man and three women at his side and approached the rookie eight. Hey, guys. Naruto damn, you got hot. Kiba exclaimed in envy. He paused when he realized something he said he added, and I mean that in a non-gay way. Naruto chuckled. Thanks. It's good to see you guys. Shikamaru patted his back. It's troublesome to say, but welcome back. Tauji had put his chips away the moment Naruto was spotted. Who are they? Chaoji asked, looking at the mysterious pregnant beauty. Naruto smiled and put an arm around her as his waist. My wife. He said, wrapping his other arm around FK's waist who blushed. My girl. Silence. Lucky bastard. Kiba shouted brotherly. Yash. Your youth shines brightly Naruto. Let you aspire sometime so I may be as youthful as you someday. These shouts caused the senseis to turn around and saw Naruto and a pregnant woman. Instantly knowing, Kurinai squealed thinking about dressing up a mini Naruto up every day. She started mumbling about cute costumes, causing the other senseis to eye her wearily and take a step away. Naruto. Boy of ever-burning youth. Welcome home. Guy shouted, throwing his hands up in the air. Naruto turned and smiled. Hello, Guy sensei It's good to see you. Naruto. I challenge you to a duel. Guy exclaimed, causing a raised eyebrow. You are my new eternal rival. If I cannot win, I shall walk around Kanoha 200 times on my hands. Naruto chuckled. All right, as soon as I finish some business, we'll duel. Yash. Who is this? Asuma asked. And him. He looked at the imposing man. Urza smirked. Urza. She answered, leaning against Naruto. S-class mage of fairy tale. S-class mage? She would be ranked around A-class here. Naruto spoke, gaining nods of thanks. And these are FK, Nana, and this is Bahamut. I am the king of the dragons. Naruto's father, though his real father and I have disagreements at that. Wait, Minato-sensei is alive. Kakashi exclaimed. He was ignored. Minato-sama lives. Kurinai asked, shocked. Yeah. Yami decided she didn't want his soul, so she just put him in a coma, only I could awaken him from. He's awake, he turned to look at Kakashi. And very pissed at you. Then he looked away from his now very pale sensei. He's coming during the exam sometime. 
Right now, he's traveling to meet up with Kashina Kasan. Tired of being ignored, Sasuke walked up to the infamous and powerful Dragon King and stood proudly. Train me. He demanded. Excuse me? Train me. I am an Acheha, an elite. You should be honored to train me. Ahmet stared for a moment before he chuckled. Then, he laughed. What a bastard. Urza exclaimed, causing Sakura to scream profanities at her before she and FK silenced the pink-haired monkey with a glare, instantly causing the others to like her. Nanabi frowned, not really hearing the conversation as much as she should. She was inwardly cursing herself as she stared at Naruto's arms that were still around Urza and FK. She had mentally kicked herself when she had felt a stab of jealousy when the incident happened. She was a demon lord, she couldn't let suck emotions get a hold of her so easily. I would never train someone like you. Go brood over in a corner or something. I never planned on training anyone until I met Naruto. He is and will be forevermore the only exception besides a child if I ever have one. Growling, Sasuke stomped over to Naruto. Fight me. Oh way, duck ass. Pissed, Sasuke threw a powerful punch. Naruto merely held out a finger and twisted his arm around, tossing the Ichiha high into the sky. I said, go away. Sasuke landed feet away, creating a small crater. Sasuke-kun. Sakura screeched. How are the troublesome angels? Shikamaru asked. Trained by elemental sprites, they're much stronger and scarier than ever. Here in masks. They nodded. Well, I must leave. I shall speak to you later. Shikamaru, I hear you're a judge. The Nara nodded lazily. Judge Fair, don't listen to the council. Whatever they threaten to take away, it'll be returned. I know. I will. Izumo and Kitetsu were more or less than the word, giddy. Their little buddy had just returned, and they were already planning the fall of this place, and who they wanted to knock first. There were many on their list so far. Many and most included those who hurt Naruto. Akashi, they knew, was reserved for Naruto and Naruto alone well, not unless Tsunade gets to him first. She's still pissed after these three years and hasn't given him any missions higher than D-ranked ones. Izumo raised an eyebrow as he saw something in the distance. Hey Kitetsu. Yeah? What's that? He spoke, pointing past the open gates to six figures nearing. I don't know. He answered, quickly taking notice of the strange style of clothing. Then, their eyes caught something and they smirked, sitting back down and letting them pass without an inspection. On each person was something specific, something that they couldn't help but feel more excited about. Ryugaker headbands. Naruto's forces had arrived. Naruto stared at the group of six standing before him. Natsu, Grey, Gajiel, Christian, Morga, and Jini. He couldn't help but smirk at the thought of the kind of destruction they could cause during the Chunin exams. He nearly shivered in anticipation, his imagination coming up with all sorts of expressions the people of Konoha will wear when his forces constantly beat theirs. He didn't doubt that the random selection of opponents would have Sasuke face one of the six, probably the one they thought was the weakest, Aka, Genie or Morga. Oh, he couldn't wait to see their faces when that Ichiha is knocked onto his ass time and time again. Remember, he said. The Konoha Council can't make you do anything. You're part of Ryugakur, not Konoha and are therefore under my command only. Natsu huffed. Like we'd listen to those backstabbing bastards anyways. Yeah. Morga agreed. We'd sooner join a dark guild than listen to those idiots. It's not gonna happen. For once I have to agree with the flaming idiot. Jeannie said with a smile. Morga turned to her, her eyes glaring with hatred, and her hair flickered to fire for a single moment before Christian put a hand on her shoulder, squeezing it in warning. No fighting. Calm down. He glared, his eyes hardening in a way only Urza could do. Kid can do it almost as well as Urza he can. Kayubi commented, mildly impressed with the kid. That's completely true. I wonder what else Urza taught him, I can't wait to find out. The other five participants shivered at that glare, it never meant anything good, especially if it was on Urza the Titania. And, since Christian was her student they didn't want to know what happened to those who came across the other end of that glare, even if they were stronger than him at the moment. Naruto shook his head at their antics and smiled, glad that they got along well. Continuing on, he said, gaining their attention. During the preliminaries, Tsunade is asked if we can use the angels against some of the participants, if they get too many or an uneven number. She's promised me that you personally won't get to fight them, but I want you to watch. I want you to learn and assess what they can do. They are, after all, the future of Ryugakur in a sense. I want to know what you think. The six nodded, understanding. They are his people and he won't marry or be involved with anyone the people see as unfit to lead. They doubted that they'd disagree with any of their Raikage's choices, but they'd humor him not that they'd say no to him on any occasion, but they can let him think otherwise. Are you ready to, ah, how would Kissim say it? Are you ready for a glorious bloodbath? Wonderful words Kit, couldn't have put it better myself. You are going to let me take control for a while and wreak havoc as well, right? 
You aren't cruel enough to keep me locked in here with blood flying in all directions, right? Burrito smirked. You have nothing to worry about, Kaiubi. Whatever you're planning, Kit, I'm sure I'm going to like it. Oh, you love it. I know something that will make us both happy. The six from Fiori grinned and nodded, their blood boiling up for a good challenge and to deliver Kanoha's judgment. Make them wish they never met us. Yes. They screamed, besides the level-headed Gajiel and Christian who simply smiled at the times to come. The six raced out the door, heading off for final practice. They had one more day, tomorrow was the start of the Chunin exams. They wanted to be at the top of their game and embarrass Kanoha so bad they'll cry. The Nabi who was walking in at the time barely dodged the oncoming traffic as they dashed through the small doorway. She shook her head before looking at the amused Naruto, who was watching them leave like a parent. I wonder what that delinquent wants with you now. Shush Kaiubi, she's not that bad. By mortal standards you are correct. My demon standards she's as good as they come which is the opposite of what demons aim for. Such a delinquent. The Nabi-chan, can I help you with something? Naruto asked, ignoring Kaiubi for the time being. She bit her lower lip. And no, it's nothing. Never mind. She suddenly said, turning to leave. Nanabi. He narrowed his eyes. She stopped and flinched at the tone of his voice. What is it? She sighed. I'm confused. He raised a golden eyebrow. About what? About you. He blinked, pointing to himself. Me? She nodded and he contracted a confused look. Why? What have I done to warrant your confusion? Ugh, I don't know. Whenever I'm near you my heart beats, whenever you're giving attention to another woman I get jealous. I've never felt this way before and I'm confused. I don't understand what's wrong with me. She shouted, pulling at her hair in frustration. What? Naruto's eyes widened before chuckling. Well, I didn't expect that. Turn her down. Turn her down right now. Lanabi, nothing's wrong with you. She stared at him in confusion. So I'm not sick. No, you're not sick. I'm surprised you of all people don't understand your symptoms. I don't, tell me please. She begged, hating how desperate she sounded. Don't tell her. Let her suffer. He shook his head. This is something you must realize yourself, Nanabi-chan. It's not as hard as you think it is. You'll figure it out soon. He grinned and winked at her. And when you do don't hesitate to tell me. Not what I had in mind, Kit. Tell you? She muttered as he started to walk past her. T tell you what? Hey, wait. I don't understand. You will, trust me. He looked over his shoulder and smiled. Don't worry, you'll understand soon. She stomped her foot as he disappeared behind the door. She crossed her arms and huffed. She may be a demon, but she's not all-knowing. Living as long as her doesn't mean you become omniscient, quite the opposite. You become uncaring about what's happening around you because many times it has happened before. She growled. Maybe some books will show her what's wrong with her, maybe a movie as well. She could always ask one of the girls, but that would be admitting that she couldn't understand and Naruto would lose faith in her. For some reason that horrified her to no end. Dear Kami she needed to figure out what was wrong with her quickly or she swears she'll become as insane as a chibi. Anzo smiled happily. His future weapon was finally back in Kanoha. Finally, his destiny will be fulfilled. He'll rule over all the elemental nations and the other world. He'd become a god and rule over all things living with his weapon of mass destruction as his beck and call, the fear of both him and his weapon keeping people from rebelling from his rule. His plan was perfect. Let Naruto have a few days of freedom, let him cherish his last few days of free will. Soon, however, he'd be nothing but Danzo's puppet, nothing but his loyal dog with no reason to live but to serve his master. Jinchurikus weren't meant to be free anyway. Their purpose was to be weapons, it was their only purpose. Why else would they be created? For the safety of humanity. To seal off the demon from ever being used. Then why were the seals constructed so that the Jinchuriki can harvest and use the powers of the demon? The only answer had to be so that they could be used as a weapon for their village. Lord Danzo, a rude Anbu bowed as he entered the room, not looking his master, who was sitting on a stone throne, in the eye. We are all in position. When shall you have us attack? Patience, my pawn, patience. Danzo said calmly. He could use phrases like pawn to his root because they knew that that's what they were. Nothing more than a pawn on a chessboard. Danzo was their king, their ever-moving queen would be his future weapon who could move anywhere on the board with an unlimited amount of spaces, and it'll move only at the king's command. We shall attack after the preliminaries. If I may be allowed to ask why then Lord Danzo? It'll give them time to relax, in a time where it's least expected. Arachimaru had the right idea attacking during the Chunin exams when it's least expected. Then and only then will we move in to capture my piece, my weapon. Sir? You dare doubt me? Danzo's single visible eye narrowed at his subordinate. No. The root Anbu said, not able to show fear as he lacked it like all his root brethren. 
I'm simply curious as to how you shall control the demon. Anzo grinned and rubbed his covered eye with his good hand. Oh, then he rested it on his covered arm. I have something in mind. Naruto walked into Ichiraku Raymon with his hood up, smiling at the nostalgia that filled him. He immediately spied Tuchi and Am, and the smile on his lips grew wider. These were some of the people who took care of him, came up with ridiculous reasons to give him free Raymond. these were the people who fed him when he was on the streets, when no one else would even though they knew he was the Kaiubi Jinchuriki. He noticed, however, that they were looking sadder than normal yet happier in a way. It was hard to describe that look of sorrow with a hint of hope glinting in them. He sat down on one of the chairs. Excuse me, can I have two Mizo Raymond, please? A.M. looked up in hope, but it was quickly lost when she saw she didn't know who it was. She smiled but it didn't reach her eyes. Sure. Thank you. He said as the two got to work. So what's with all the fuss about around here? Surely it's not only for the Chunin exams. Gucci sighed. No, it's because our end was prophesied by Kami. It's supposed to happen soon. Dear God, by Kami himself. It's a her. A.M. said, still loving the fact that one of the most powerful beings to ever exist in the universe was a female. Really? That's interesting. So how's this prophecy destruction supposed to play out because I want to be far away when it happens? Looks like my vacation was just cut short. Ayami huffed. I don't see any reason why you'd want to vacation here of all places anyway. It's supposed to be done by a hyperball of energy. Tucci chuckled, remembering that blonde child that would appear in their stand nearly every day. He was betrayed by the village. Ah. That Yuzumaki kid. I've heard of him during my travels, caused a bunch of problems for Konoha he did. Much deserved problems I assure you. A.M. said bitterly, glaring at a villager who was walking in but, taking the message, left. Yes, from what I've heard this downfall if far from delayed. It's not his fault. Tucci said, placing the two bowls in front of his customer. A.M. nodded with a ghost of a smile forming on her lips. He was too kind for his own good. He always had faith in this rotten to the core village when anyone else would have tried to destroy it years ago. He'd a good boy whose rage towards this place is well deserved. Naruto chuckled after swallowing a bite. How he missed this place. Sounds like you have faith in him. She glared. Of course I have faith in my little brother. Oh. So you're related. Not by blood even though I wish he was. He's part of the family no matter who his parents are. Tucci said. Naruto smiled. Thanks for that, old man. Tucci blinked. Are you? Bingo, old man. Naruto congratulated, pulling his hood down, loving the fact that their faces lit up. You've gotten old and am more beautiful than ever. Naruto. She shouted, pulling him into a bone-crushing hug over the counter, nearly spilling his ramen. Why haven't you come to visit sooner? He laughed, pulling away from the woman's iron grip. I had cage things to take care of otherwise I'd have been here first thing when I arrived. Being a cage is much harder than I ever thought it'd be. He sighed, exasperated at the thought of all the paperwork piling up at his desk during this little break. Well what did you think it was? A luxury. Did you never hear Saratobi Sama's cries of anguish at night because of the paperwork and having to deal with the council? A.M. huffed. The Ryugakar council isn't corrupted and it's the Ryukage who makes the final decisions. The council's only there to make suggestions and report problems and successes. He snorted. But, the paperwork is the bane of existence. It never goes away. He cried out in anguish, clutching his golden locks before starting to devour his ramen in hopes of forgetting the whole ordeal he'll have to deal with once this was over. The two shook their heads in sympathy. This is why I'm not a cage. Tucci said. Oh yay, you were a shinobi at one time, weren't you old man? Naruto inquired. He nodded. I was a jounin until I got fed up with that lifestyle. When my wife died I knew it was time to retire and take care of this little rose right next to me. My job changed, but I'm still a protector. The father's main job is to protect and provide for his family. Naruto nodded in agreement before a sly smile formed onto his lips. So, A.M., I see that ring on your finger. When will the wedding bells be chiming? Her face lit up. F four M months. She muttered, tapping her fingers together in a way reminiscent of Hinata. Oh? So who's the lucky bachelor? Gucci chuckled as his daughter's face turned even redder. You'll be shocked. Try me. Naruto dared, taking in another mouthful of ramen. It's Aruka-kun. A.M. said. The noodles got caught in Naruto's throat and he started coughing, slamming his fist onto his chest to help get it down. A.M. reached around the counter in worry and tapped his back. After a minute Naruto turned to her with a completely lost look on his face. I Ruka sensei He shouted. She nodded. W when did this happen? What I don't understand. Gucci chuckled again, smiling at the thought of grandkids running around soon. Well, when you disappeared Aruka came by a lot to feel closer to you. 
he and AM got talking which led to their first date which led to another, and before you know it they're engaged. H how long ago? Five months ago. She said, blushing. AM Chan. A very familiar voice called out. Naruto turned to glare at the man who entered with a smile on his face. Ah. Naruto, you're back Aruka began, blinking when he saw that glare directed at him. Aruka. Naruto shouted, pointing an angry finger at his brother figure. How dare you deflower AM Chan. Be deflower. Aruka sputtered with a blush. Then Naruto. W we haven't. I'll kill you Aruka. No one touches my sister and gets away with it, even if it is you. He shouted, jumping up. Naruto. AM shouted with a blush, causing Naruto to look at her. We haven't done anything yet. He blinked for a moment before smiling. Oh, really? That's good then. Hi Aruka-sensei, good to see you again. Naruto, Aruka snapped fatherly. What have I told you about jumping to conclusions? Well excuse me, but how was I supposed to take you marrying AM? It's been three years so how was I to know you haven't done it yet? Aruka's face lit up. Naruto, this is not a public conversation. But you brought it up. Gucci sighed wistfully. Just like old times, right AM? She nodded with a smile, happily fingering the stone around her ring finger. Yep, I'm glad he's returned to us. Naruto pouted as he fell backwards onto his bed. Iruka had berated him for the past three hours before he could pull free from his brotherly grasp. He didn't understand how that man could go on for three goddamn hours, about why you couldn't talk about sex in public, even when no one was around. Thank God AM had mercy on him that day and distracted the scarred Chunin long enough for him to run away. Naruto. He sat up and saw Nanabi standing in his doorway. She was looking down at the floor and shifting nervously. Can I talk to you? He nodded and scooted over, tapping the spot beside him which she didn't hesitate to take. What is it? W well, I've been watching a lot of movies and reading books, trying to figure out what you were talking about before. And, after long consideration, a lot actually, I've determined her face flushed. Go on the Navi, say it. No. Don't say it. Ayashi gulped, grabbed his jacket collar, and pulled him into a shy yet fierce kiss, and pulled away as quickly. Naruto, surprised, simply blinked at her. I I love you. I think. He chuckled. You think? He asked, raising an amused golden eyebrow. I know how I feel about you, Nanabi-chan. I love you. Damn you kit. Shut up or I'll turn my midscape hot pink. Your evil kit so evil. She blushed at those words. No one's ever really said that to me. Not even your parents. He was surprised when she nodded. Demons don't normally express the word love to others, only when they're really close, and my parents never really cared for their children so we were on our own. Usually, Bijuu get attached to their vessels so in a way they love them, it's hard for a demon to explain. Damn straight. Don't worry about it, I understand enough. I was always curious about why Gara called the Ichibi mother all the time. I thought it was just me and FK who got their Bijuu attached to them. She smiled before her eyebrows creased in confusion. He called the Chibi mother. I find this funny too. Kaiubi chuckled. Find what funny, Kaiubi? Oh, you'll know in just a moment. He looked at Nanabi and nodded, still confused by the situation. But Ichibi is male. Naruto's eyes crossed in confusion before he started laughing. He couldn't wait to tell Gara. He always did love to make that stone-faced redeed flustered. After a few moments, Nanabi joined in on the laughter, her hand finding Naruto's and curling her fingers around his. He turned to look at her, and she had a shy smile. I really think, no, I know I love you I think. He chuckled again, grabbing her chin. That's good enough for me. And he kissed her. Do you think Nanabi finally confessed to Naruto-kun? Hinata asked quietly, sitting on Naruto's bed along with the other angels and FK, who were now maskless. It's completely obvious that she loves him. Maybe. You never know with her. She understands my emotions just fine, but hers not so much. FK shrugged, leaning against the headboard. Though she still wasn't comfortable around people the creatures she loathes with a passion for what they've done to her, she was starting to warm up to the angels per request from Naruto. Enko huffed. That girl needs to grow a backbone, seriously. She's a demon. Confessing her love should be easier than destroying a village. Or destroying a mountain, don't forget they can do that. Hana pointed out. Nanabi didn't do those things. She was known as the delinquent of the Bijuu because she was the nicest out of all of them. Then I wish her good luck. Ino said in sympathy, glad that she didn't have to confess and that Naruto found out himself. Confessing would have been torture full of blushes, stuttering and embarrassment for both ends. I'd think a Bijuu wouldn't be so shy. Tamari pondered, pursing her lips in thought. That's the thing, FK said, turning her head to look at her. Nanabi normally isn't shy at all. She's rather blunt. I don't know if it's because she's used to me or not, but she was like that the first time we met as well. So maybe it's just around boys. 
Tenton offered, putting in her opinion for the first time. Ha. Hana laughed. I don't think so. Did you notice the way she talks to the Hayden, Kissam, Dadara and Itachi? She's rather out there yet she still has this goody two-shoes aura. Anko smiled at the memory. Rather impressive really. It could be just around Naruto-kun. Hinata said, gaining the attention of the conversation. Naruto-kun made me faint a lot doing the slightest of things, and no one else did. She blushed to her example. Damari nodded. Yay, that's true. Maybe. Wait. Hana suddenly said, sticking her nose up and sniffing. A large smile appeared on her face. He's coming. Then Yuzuka senses I praise you. Anko cheered, pumping her fists into the air. Hey, are we really going to do this like this? Hinata blushed. Don't tell me you're going shy again. Tenten said. The high Uga frantically shook her head. And no, it's not that I'm just embarrassed. She looked down at herself, her face heating up. Don't worry, kid. Anko threw her arm around Hinata's shoulders. You got a nice body. And we don't. Hino joked. I'm not saying that. Shush, he's coming. And the door to the room started to open. Naruto had a smile on his face. Nanabi finally confessed to him. Never in his wildest dreams did he ever think that he could be so lucky with so many beautiful and wonderful girls. He always did have a habit with falling in love with multiple girls, but he never thought he'd be able to be with them all. Kami really does love him doesn't she? As he approached his door he started to get excited for some reason. A shiver ran down his spine, yet the air wasn't cold. He narrowed his eyes at the handle as if it was the thing causing these strange sensations. For some reason he wanted to open the door yet he didn't because there was a foreboding feeling coming from the other side. Ignoring it, he opened the door and his jaw dropped at what he saw. His angels and FK in their underwear sitting on his bed looking at him seductively. Hey, Naruto-kun. His mouth opened and closed like a fish, not knowing what to say to this. Wanna play? He doubted he'd get any sleep tonight and he didn't mind it. What if Naruto joins fairy tale Kanoha bashing and thanks for watching my video till the end. If you enjoy this content then do consider subscribing to my channel and leave a like if you guys need the next part comment down and thanks for watching the video and see you guys next video.